Chapter One of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Snowza, Houston, Texas, February 2013. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter One Malaga. During all these long and noisy debates between the opposite ambitions of politics and love, one of our characters, perhaps the one least deserving of neglect, was, however, very much neglected, very much forgotten, and exceedingly unhappy. In fact, D'Artagnan, D'Artagnan we say, for we must call him by his name to remind our readers of his existence, D'Artagnan, we repeat, had absolutely nothing whatever to do amidst these brilliant butterflies of fashion. After following the king during two whole days at Fontainebleau, and critically observing the various pastoral fancies and heroic comic transformations of his sovereign, the musketeer felt that he needed something more than this to satisfy the cravings of his nature. At every moment, assailed by people asking him, "'How do you think this costume suits me, Monsieur d'Artagnan?' He would reply to them in quiet, sarcastic tones. Why, I think you are quite as well-dressed as the best-dressed monkey to be found at the fair at Saint-Laurent. It was just such a compliment D'Artagnan would choose when he did not feel disposed to pay any other, and whether agreeable or not, the inquirer was obliged to be satisfied with it. Whenever anyone asked him, How do you intend to dress yourself this evening? He replied, I shall undress myself, at which the ladies all laughed, and a few of them blushed. But after a couple of days passed in this manner, the musketeer, perceiving that nothing serious was likely to arise which would concern him, and that the king had completely, or at least appeared to have completely forgotten Paris, saint mandé and Belle-Isle, that Monsieur Colbert's mind was occupied with illuminations and fireworks, that, for the next month at least, the ladies had plenty of glances to bestow, and also to receive in exchange, D'Artagnan asked the king for leave of absence for a matter of private business. At the moment D'Artagnan made his request, his majesty was on the point of going to bed, quite exhausted from dancing. "'You wish to leave me, Monsieur D'Artagnan?' inquired the king, with an air of astonishment. For Louis Fourteenth could never understand why any one who had the distinguished honor of being near him could wish to leave him. Sire, said D'Artagnan, I leave you simply because I am not of the slightest service to you in anything. Ah, if I could only hold the balancing pole while you were dancing, it would be a very different affair. But, my dear Monsieur D'Artagnan, said the king gravely, people dance without balancing poles. Ah, indeed, said the musketeer, continuing his imperceptible tone of irony. I had no idea such a thing was possible. You have not seen me dance, then? inquired the king. Yes, but I always thought dancers went from easy to difficult acrobatic feats. I was mistaken. All the more greater reason, therefore, that I should leave for a time. Sire, I repeat, you have no present occasion for my services. Besides, if your majesty should have any need of me, you would know where to find me. Very well, said the king, and he granted him leave of absence. We shall not look for D'Artagnan, therefore, at Fontainebleau, for to do so would be useless, but with the permission of our readers follow him to the Rue de Lombard, where he was located at the sign of the Pilon d'Or, in the house of our old friend Planchet. It was about eight o'clock in the evening, and the weather was exceedingly warm. There was only one window open, and that one belonging to a room on the entresol. A perfume of spices mingled with another perfume, less exotic, but more penetrating, namely, that which arose from the street, ascended to salute the nostrils of the musketeer. D'Artagnan, reclining in an immense straight-backed chair, with his legs not stretched out, but simply placed upon a stool, formed an angle of the most obtuse form that could possibly be seen. Both his arms were crossed over his head, his head reclining upon his left shoulder like Alexander the Great. His eyes, usually so quick and intelligent 
in their expression were now half-closed, and seemed fastened, as it were, upon a small corner of blue sky that was visible behind the opening of the chimneys. There was just enough blue, and no more, to fill one of the sacks of lentils or haricot, which formed the principal furniture of the shop on the ground floor. Thus extended at his ease, and sheltered in his place of observation behind the window, D'Artagnan seemed as if he had ceased to be a soldier, as if he were no longer an officer belonging to the palace, but was, in the contrary, a quiet, easy-going citizen in a state of stagnation between his dinner and supper, or between his supper and his bed, one of those strong, ossified brains which have no more room for a single idea. So fiercely does animal matter keep watch at the doors of intelligence, narrowly inspecting the contraband trade which might result from the introduction into the brain of a symptom of thought. We have already said night was closing in. The shops were being lighted, while the windows of the upper apartments were being closed, and the rhythmic steps of a patrol of soldiers forming the night watch could be heard retreating. D'Artagnan continued, however, to think of nothing except the blue corner of the sky. A few paces from him, completely in the shade, lying on his stomach upon a sack of Indian corn, was Planchet, with both arms under his chin and his eyes fixed on D'Artagnan, who was either thinking, dreaming, or sleeping, with his eyes open. Planchet had been watching him for a tolerably long time, and by a way of interruption, he began by exclaiming, Hm, hm! But D'Artagnan did not stir. Planchet then saw it was necessary to have recourse to more effectual means still, after a prolonged reflection on the subject, the most ingenious means that suggested itself to him under the present circumstances was to let himself roll off the sack onto the floor, murmuring at the same time against himself the word stupid. But, notwithstanding the noise produced by Planchet's fall, D'Artagnan, who had in the course of his existence heard many other and very different falls, did not appear to pay the least attention to the present one. Besides, an enormous cart laden with stones passing from the Rue saint Médéric absorbed in the noise of its wheels the noise of Planchet's tumble. And yet Planchet fancied that, in token of tacit approval, he saw him imperceptibly smile at the word stupid. This emboldened him to say, Are you asleep, Monsieur d'Artagnan? No, Planchet, I am not even asleep, replied the musketeer. I am in despair, said Planchet, to hear such a word as even. Well, and why not? Is it not a grammatical word, Monsieur Planchet? Of course, Monsieur d'Artagnan. Well? Well, then, the word distresses me beyond measure. Tell me why you are distressed, Planchet, said d'Artagnan. If you say that you are not even asleep, it is as much to say that you have not even the consolation of being able to sleep, or better still, it is precisely the same as telling me that you are getting bored to death. Planchet, you know that I am never bored, except today and the day before yesterday. Bah! Monsieur d'Artagnan, it is a week since you returned here from Fontainebleau. In other words, you have no longer your orders to issue or your men to review and maneuver. You need the sound of guns, drums, and all that din of confusion. I, who have myself carried a musket, can easily believe that. Planchet replied d'Artagnan, I assure you that I am not bored in the least in the world. In that case, what are you doing lying there as if you were dead? My dear Planchet, there was once upon a time, at the seas of La Rochelle, when I was there, when you were there, when we both were there, a certain Arab, who was celebrated for the manner in which he adjusted Couvertin, he was a clever fellow, although of a very odd complexion, which was the same color as your olives. Well, this Arab, whenever he had done eating or working, used to sit down to rest himself, as I am resting myself now, and smoked, I cannot tell you what sort of magical leaves, in a large amber-mouthed tube, and if any officers happening to pass reproached him for being always asleep, he used to quietly reply, Better to sit down than to stand up? to lie down than to sit down, to be dead than to lie down. 
He was an acutely melancholy Arab, and I remember him perfectly well, from the color of his skin and the style of his conversation. He used to cut off the heads of Protestants with the most singular gusto. Precisely, and then he used to embalm them when they were worth the trouble, and when he was thus engaged with his herbs and plants around him, he looked like a basket-maker making baskets. You are quite right, Planchet, he did. Oh, I can remember things very well at times. I have no doubt of it. But what do you think of his mode of reasoning? I think it is good in one sense, but very stupid in another. Expound your meaning, Monsieur Planchet. Well, Monsieur, in point of fact, then, better to sit down than to stand up is plain enough, especially when one may be fatigued. And Planchet smiled in a roguish way. As for better to be lying down, let that pass. But for the last proposition, that is, better to be dead than alive, it is, in my opinion, very absurd, my own undoubted preference being for my bed, and if you are not of my opinion, it is simply, as I have already had the honor of telling you, because you are boring yourself to death. Planchet, do you know Monsieur de La Fontaine, the chemist at the corner of the Rue saint médéric no, the writer of fables. Oh, Maître Corbeau! Exactly. Well, then, I am like his hair. He has got a hair also, then? He has all sorts of animals. Well, what does his hair do, then? Monsieur La Fontaine's hair thinks. Ah, ah! Planchet, I am like that hair. I am thinking. What are you thinking, you say? said Planchet uneasily. You are thinking thinking, you say, said Planchet uneasily. Yes, your house is dull enough to drive people to think. You will admit that, I hope. And yet, monsieur, you have a look out upon the street. Yes, and wonderfully interesting that is, of course. But it is no less true, monsieur, that if you were living at the back of the house, you would bore yourself. I mean, you would think more than ever. Upon my word, Planchet, I hardly know that. Still, said the grocer, if your reflections are at all like those which led you to restore King Charles the Second, and Planchet finished with a little laugh that was not without its meaning. Ah, Planchet, my friend, returned D'Artagnan, you are getting ambitious. Is there no other king to be restored, Monsieur D'Artagnan? No second monk to be packed up like a salted hog in a deal box? No, my dear Planchet. All the kings are seated on their respective thrones, less comfortably so, perhaps, than I am upon this chair, but in all events there they are, and D'Artagnan sighed deeply. Monsieur D'Artagnan, said Planchet, you are making me very uneasy. You are very good, Planchet. I begin to suspect something. What is it? Monsieur D'Artagnan, you are getting thin. Oh, said D'Artagnan, striking his chest, which sounded like an empty curiosity. It is impossible, Planchet. Ah, said Planchet, slightly overcome, if you were to get thin in my house. Well, I should do something rash. What would you do? Tell me. I should look out for the man who was the cause of all your anxieties. Ah, according to your account, I am anxious now. Yes, you are anxious. And you are getting thin, visibly getting thin, Malaga. If you go on getting thin in this way, I will take my sword in my hand and go straight to Monsieur d'Arblay and have it out with him. What? said Monsieur d'Artagnan, starting in his chair. What's that you say? And what has Monsieur d'Arblay's name got to do with your groceries? Just as you please. Get angry if you like, or call me names if you prefer it. But the deuce is in it. I know what I know. D'Artagnan had, during this second outburst of Planchet's, so placed himself as not to lose a single look on his face. That is, he sat with both his hands resting on both his knees, and his head stretched out toward the grocer. Come, explain yourself, he said, and tell me how you could possibly utter such a blasphemy. Monsieur d'Arblay, your old master, my friend, an ecclesiastic, a musketeer turned bishop? What do you mean to say you would raise your sword against him, Planchet? I could raise my sword against my own father when I see you in such a state as you are now. Monsieur d'Arblay, a gentleman, 
It is all the same to me whether he's a gentleman or not. He gives you the blue devils, and that is all I know, and the blue devils make people get thin. Malaga, I have no notion of Monsieur d'Artagnan leaving my house thinner than when he entered it. How does he give me the blue devils, as you call it? Come, explain, explain. You have had the nightmare during the last three nights. I? Yes, you. And in your nightmare you called out several times, Aramis, deceitful Aramis. Ah, uh, I said that, did I? murmured D'Artagnan uneasily. Yes, those very words, upon my honor. Well, what else? You know the saying, Planchet, dreams go by contraries. Not so, for every time during the last three days, when you were out, you have not once failed to ask me, on your return, have you seen Monsieur d'Herblay, or else have you received any letters for me from Monsieur d'Herblay? Well, it is very natural I should take an interest in my old friend, said D'Artagnan. Of course, but not to such an extent as to get thin on that account. Planchet, I'll get fatter. I give you my word of honor, I will. Very well, monsieur, I accept it. For I know that when you give your word of honor, it is sacred. I will not dream of Aramis any more, and I will never ask you again if there are any letters from Monsieur de Arblay, but on condition that you explain one thing to me. What is it, monsieur? I am a great observer, and just now you made use of a very singular oath, which is unusual for you. You mean Malaga, I suppose? Precisely. It is the oath I have used ever since I have been a grocer. Very proper, too. It is the name of a dried grape or raisin, I believe. It is my most ferocious oath. When I have once said Malaga, I am a man no longer. Still, I never knew you to use that oath before. Very likely not, monsieur. I had a present made me of it, said Planchet, and as he pronounced these words, he winked his eye with a cunning expression, which thoroughly awakened D'Artagnan's attention. Come, come, monsieur Planchet. Why, I am not like you, monsieur, said Planchet. I don't pass my life in thinking. You do wrong, then. I meant in boring myself to death. We have but a very short time to live. Why not make the best of it? You are an Epicurean philosopher, I begin to think, Planchet. Why not? My hand is still as steady as ever. I can write, and I can weigh out my sugar and spices. My foot is firm. I can dance and walk about. My stomach has its teeth still, for I eat and digest very well. My heart is not quite hardened. Well, monsieur? Well, what, Planchet? Why, you see, said the grocer, rubbing his hands together. D'Artagnan crossed one leg over the other, and said, Planchet, my friend, I am unnerved with extreme surprise, for you are revealing yourself to me under a perfectly new light. Planchet, flattered to the highest degree by this remark, continued to rub his hands very hard together. Ah, ah, he said, because I happen to be slow, you think me perhaps a positive fool. Very good, Planchet, very well reasoned. Follow my idea, monsieur, if you please. I said to myself, continued Planchet, that without enjoyment... There is no happiness on this earth. Quite true what you say, Planchet, interrupted D'Artagnan. At all events, if we cannot obtain pleasure, for pleasure is not so common a thing, after all, let us at least get consolation of some kind or another. And so you console yourself? Exactly so. Tell me how you console yourself. I put on a buckler for the purpose of confronting ennui. I place my time at the direction of patience, and on the very eve of feeling I am going to get bored, I amuse myself. And you don't find any difficulty in that? None. And you found it out quite by yourself? Oh, quite so. It is miraculous. What do you say? I say that your philosophy is not to be matched in the Christian or pagan world in modern days or in antiquity. You think so? Follow my example, then. It is a very tempting one. Do as I do. I could not wish for anything better, but all minds are not of the same stamp, and it might possibly happen that if I were required to amuse myself in the manner that you do, I should bore myself horribly. Bah! At least try first. Well, 
tell me what to do. Have you observed that I leave home occasionally? Yes. In any particular way? Periodically. That is the very thing. You have noticed it, then. My dear Planchet, you must understand that when people see each other every day, and one of those two absents himself, the other misses him. Do you not feel the want of my society when I am in the country? Prodigiously, that is to say, I feel like a body without a soul. That being understood, then. Proceed. What are the periods when I absent myself? On the fifteenth and thirtieth of every month, and I remain away? Sometimes two, sometimes three, and sometimes four days at a time. Have you ever given it a thought why I was absent? Oh, to look after your debts, I suppose. And when I returned, how did you think I looked, as far as my face was concerned? Exceedingly self-satisfied. You admit, you say, that I always look satisfied, and what have you attributed my satisfaction to? That your business was going on very well, that your purchases of rice, prunes, raw sugar, dried apples, pears, and treacle were advantageous. You were always very picturesque in your notions and ideas, Planchet, and I was not in the slightest degree surprised that you had selected grocery as an occupation which is, of all trades, the most varied and the most pleasantest as far as the character is concerned, inasmuch as one handles so many natural and perfumed productions. Perfectly true, monsieur, but you are greatly mistaken. In what way? In thinking that I'd leave here every fortnight to collect my money or to make purchases. Ho, ho! How could you possibly have ever thought such a thing? Ho, ho, ho! And Planchet began to laugh in a manner that inspired D'Artagnan with very serious misgivings as to his sanity. I confess, said the musketeer, that I do not precisely catch your meaning. Very true, monsieur. Oh, what do you mean, very true? It must be true, since you say it, but pray be assured that it in no way lessens my opinion of you. Oh, that is lucky. No, you are a man of genius, and whenever the question happens to be of war, tactics, surprises, or good honest blows to be dealt with, why, kings are marionettes compared to you, but for the consolations of the mind, the proper care of the body, and agreeable things of the like. If one may say so, ah, uh, monsieur, don't talk to me about men of genius, they are nothing short of executioners. Good, said D'Artagnan, really fidgety with curiosity. Upon my word, you interest me to the highest degree. You feel already less bored than you did just now, do you not? I was not bored. Yet, since you have been talking to me, I feel more animated. Very good, then. It is not a bad beginning. I will cure you. Rely upon that. There is nothing I should like better. Will you let me try, then? Immediately, if you like. Very well. Have you any horses here? Yes, ten, twenty, thirty. Oh, there is no occasion for so many as that. Two will be quite sufficient. They are quite at your disposal, Planchet. Very good. Then I shall carry you off with me. When? Tomorrow. Where? Ah, uh, you are asking too much. You will admit, however, that it is important. I should know where I am going. Do you like the country? Only moderately, Planchet. Is it the case that you like town better? That is as may be. Very well, I am going to take you to a place half town and half country. Good. To a place where I am sure you will amuse yourself. Is it possible? Yes, and more wonderful still, to a place from which you have just returned, for the purpose only, it would seem, of getting bored here. Is it to Fontainebleau you are going, then? Exactly, to Fontainebleau. And in heaven's name, what are you going to do at Fontainebleau? Planchet answered D'Artagnan by a wink full of sly humor. You have some property there, you rascal? Oh, a very paltry affair. A little bit of a house, nothing more. I understand you. But it is tolerably enough, after all. I am going to Planchet's country seat, exclaimed D'Artagnan. Whenever you like. Did we not fix tomorrow? Let us say tomorrow, if you like, and then... Besides, tomorrow is the fourteenth, that is to say, the day before the one when I am afraid of getting bored, so we will look upon it as an understood thing. Agreed, by all means. You will lend me one of your horses? The best I have. No, I prefer the gentlest of all. 
I never was a very good rider, as you know, and in my grocery business I have got more awkward than ever. Besides, besides what? Why, added Planchet, I do not wish to fatigue myself. Why so, D'Artagnan ventured to ask. Because I should lose half the pleasure I expect to enjoy, replied Planchet, and thereupon he arose from the sack of Indian corn, stretching himself and making all of his bones crack one after the other with a sort of harmony. Planchet, Planchet, exclaimed D'Artagnan, I do declare that there is no Sybarite on the face of the globe who can for a moment be compared to you. Oh, Planchet, it is very clear that we have never yet eaten a ton of salt together. Why so, monsieur? Because even now I can scarcely say I know you, said D'Artagnan, and because, in point of fact, I returned to the opinion which, for a moment, I had formed of you that day at Boulogne, when you strangled, or did so as nearly as possible, Monsieur de Ward's valet, Lubin, in plain language, Planchet, that you are a man of great resources. Planchet began to laugh with a laugh full of self-conceit, bade the musketeer good night, and went down to his back shop, which he used as a bedroom. D'Artagnan resumed his original position upon the chair, and his brow, which had been unruffled for a moment, became more pensive than ever. He had already forgotten the whims and dreams of Planchet. Yes, said he, taking up again the thread of his thoughts, which had been broken by the whimsical conversation in which we have just permitted our readers to participate. Yes, yes, those three points include everything. First, to ascertain what Basmeux wanted with Aramis— secondly to learn why aramis does not let me hear from him and thirdly to ascertain where porthos is the whole mystery lies in these three points since therefore continued d'artagnan our friends tell us nothing we must have recourse to our own poor intelligence i must do what i can mordu or rather malaga as planchet would say end of chapter one Chapter 2 of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Griffiths. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 2 A Letter from Monsieur Bassemeau. D'Artagnan, faithful to his plan, went the very next morning to pay a visit to Monsieur de Bassemeaux. It was cleaning up or tidying day at the Bastille. The cannons were furbished up, the staircases scraped and cleaned, and the jailers seemed to be carefully engaged in polishing the very keys. As for the soldiers belonging to the garrison, they were walking about in different courtyards under the pretense that they were clean enough. The governor, Bassemeaux, received d'Artagnan with more than ordinary politeness, but he behaved towards him with so marked a reserve of manner that all d'Artagnan's tact and cleverness could not get a syllable out of him. The more he kept himself within bounds, the more d'Artagnan's suspicion increased. The latter even fancied he remarked that the governor was acting under the influence of a recent recommendation. Bassimo had not been at the Palais Royal with D'Artagnan, the same cold and impenetrable man which the latter now found in the Bassimo of the Bastille. When D'Artagnan wished to make him talk about the urgent money matters which had brought Bassimo in search of D'Artagnan, and had rendered him expansive, notwithstanding what had passed on that evening, Bassimo pretended that he had some orders to give in the prison, and left D'Artagnan so long alone waiting for him, that our musketeer, feeling sure that he should not get another syllable out of him, left the Bastille without waiting until Bassimo returned from his inspection. But D'Artagnan's suspicions were aroused, and when once that was the case, D'Artagnan could not sleep or remain quiet for a moment. He was among men what the cat is among quadrupeds, 
the emblem of anxiety and impatience at the same moment. A restless cat can no more remain the same place than a silk thread wafted idly to and fro with every breath of air. A cat on the watch is as motionless as death stationed at its place of observation, and neither hunger nor thirst can draw it from its meditations. D'Artagnan, who was burning with impatience, suddenly threw aside the feeling, like a cloak which he felt too heavy on his shoulders, and said to himself that that which they were concealing from him was the very thing it was important he should know. And consequently, he reasoned that Basimo would not fail to put Aramis on his guard if Aramis had given him any particular recommendation. And this was, in fact, the very thing that happened. Basimo had hardly had time to return from the donjon than D'Artagnan placed himself in ambuscade close to the Rue de Petit Musque, so as to see everyone who might leave the gates of the Bastille. After he had spent an hour on the lookout from the golden portcullis, under the penthouse of which he could keep himself a little in the shade, D'Artagnan observed a soldier leave the Bastille. This was, indeed, the surest indication he could possibly have wished for, as every jailer or warder has certain days and even certain hours for leaving the Bastille, since all are alike prohibited from having either wives or lodgings in the castle and can accordingly leave without exciting any curiosity. But a soldier once in barracks is kept there for four and twenty hours when on duty, and no one knew this better than D'Artagnan. The guardsman in question, therefore, was not likely to leave his regimentals except on an express and urgent order. The soldier, we were saying, left the Bastille at a slow and lounging pace, like a happy mortal, in fact, who, instead of mounting sentry before a wearisome guardhouse, or upon a bastion no less wearisome, has the good luck to get a little liberty, in addition to a walk, both pleasures being luckily reckoned as part of his time on duty. He bent his steps towards the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, enjoying the fresh air and the warmth of the sun, and looking at all the pretty faces he passed. D'Artagnan followed him at a distance. He had not yet arranged his ideas as what was to be done. I must, first of all, he thought, see the fellow's face. A man seen is a man judged. D'Artagnan increased his pace, and, which was not very difficult, by the by, soon got in advance of the soldier. Not only did he observe that his face showed a tolerable amount of intelligence and resolution, but he noticed also that his nose was a little red. He has a weakness for brandy, I see, said D'Artagnan to himself. At the same moment that he remarked his red nose, he saw that the soldier had a white paper in his belt. Good, he has a letter, added D'Artagnan. The only difficulty was to get hold of the letter. But a common soldier would, of course, be only too delighted at having been selected by M. de Bassemeau as a special messenger, and would not be likely to sell his message. As D'Artagnan was biting his nails, the soldier continued to advance more and more into the Faubourg Saint-Antoine. He is certainly going to saint mand he said to himself and I shall not be able to learn what the letter contains. It was enough to drive him wild. If I were in uniform, said D'Artagnan to himself, I would have this fellow seized, and his letter with him. I could easily get assistance at the very first guardhouse. But the devil take me if I mention my name in an affair of this kind. If I were to treat him to something to drink... His suspicions would be roused. Besides, he might drink me drunk. Mordieu, my wits seem to have left me, said D'Artagnan. It is all over with me. Yet, supposing I were to attack this poor devil, make him draw his sword, 
and kill him for the sake of his letter. No harm in that if it were a question of a letter from a queen to a nobleman, or a letter from a cardinal to a queen. But what miserable intrigues are those of Messieurs Aramis and Fouquet with Monsieur Colbert? A man's life for that? No, no, indeed, not even ten crowns. As he philosophized in this manner, biting first his nails and then his moustaches, he perceived a group of archers and a commissary of the police engaged in carrying away a man of very gentlemanly exterior who was struggling with all his might against them. The archers had torn his clothes and were dragging him roughly away. He begged they would lead him along more respectfully, asserting that he was a gentleman and a soldier, and observing our soldier walking in the street, he called out, Help, comrade! The soldier walked on with the same step towards the man who had called out to him, followed by the crowd. An idea suddenly occurred to D'Artagnan. It was his first one, and we shall find it was not a bad one either. During the time the gentleman was relating to the soldier that he had just been seized in a house as a thief, when the truth was he was only there as a lover, and while the soldier was pitying him and offering him consolation and advice with that gravity which a French soldier has always ready whenever his vanity or his esprit de corps is concerned. D'Artagnan glided behind the soldier, who was closely hemmed in by the crowd, and with a rapid sweep, like a sabre slash, snatched the letter from his belt. As at this moment the gentleman with the torn clothes was pulling about the soldier, to show how the commissary of police had pulled him about, D'Artagnan effected his pillage of the letter without the slightest interference. He stationed himself about ten paces distant, behind the pillar of an adjoining house, and read on the address, to Monsieur de Vallon, at Monsieur Fouquet's, saint monde Good, he said, and then he unsealed, without tearing the letter, drew out the paper, which was folded in four from the inside, which contained only these words. Dear Monsieur de Vallon, will you be good enough to tell Monsieur d'Herblay that he has been to the Bastille and has been making inquiries? Your devoted de Bassimo. Very good. All right, exclaimed D'Artagnan. It is clear enough now. Porthos is engaged in it. Being now satisfied of what he wished to know, Mordieu, thought the musketeer, what is to be done with that poor devil of a soldier? That hot-headed cunning fellow de Bassimo will make him pay dearly for my trick. If he returns without the letter... What will they do to him? Besides, I don't want the letter. When the egg has been sucked, what is the good of the shell? D'Artagnan perceived that the commissary and the archers had succeeded in convincing the soldier, and went on their way with the prisoner, the latter being still surrounded by the crowd, and continuing his complaints. D'Artagnan advanced into the very middle of the crowd, let the letter fall, without anyone having observed him, and then retreated rapidly. The soldier resumed his route towards saint his mind occupied with the gentleman who had implored his protection. Suddenly he thought of his letter, and looking at his belt, saw that it was no longer there. D'Artagnan derived no little satisfaction from his sudden terrified cry. The poor soldier, in the greatest anguish of mind, looked round him on every side, and at last, about twenty paces behind him, he perceived the lucky envelope. He pounced on it like a falcon on its prey. The envelope was certainly a little dirty and rather crumpled, but at all events the letter itself was found. D'Artagnan observed that the broken seal attracted the soldier's attention a good deal, but he finished apparently by consoling himself and returned the letter to his belt. "'Go on,' said D'Artagnan. "'I have plenty of time before me, so you may precede me. "'It appears that Aramis is not in Paris, 
since Basimo writes to Porthos. Dear Porthos, how delighted I shall be to see him again, and to have some conversation with him, said the Gascon. And regulating his pace, according to that of the Chapter 3 of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Griffiths. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 3. In which the reader will be delighted to find that Porthos has lost none of his muscularity. D'Artagnan had, according to his usual style, calculated that every hour is worth sixty minutes, and every minute worth sixty seconds. Thanks to this perfectly exact calculation of minutes and seconds, he reached the superintendent's door at the very moment the soldier was leaving it with his belt empty. D'Artagnan presented himself at the door which a porter, with a profusely embroidered livery, held half opened for him. D'Artagnan would very much have liked to enter without giving his name, but this was impossible, and so he gave it. Notwithstanding this concession, which ought to have removed every difficulty in the way, at least D'Artagnan thought so, the concierge hesitated. However, at the second repetition of the title, Captain of the King's Guards, the concierge, without quite leaving the passage clear for him, ceased to bar it completely. D'Artagnan understood that orders of the most positive character had been given. He decided, therefore, to tell a falsehood. A circumstance, moreover, which did not seriously affect his peace of mind, when he saw that beyond the falsehood, the safety of the state itself, or even purely and simply his own individual personal interest, might be at stake. He moreover added to the declarations he had already made that the soldier sent to Monsieur de Vallon was his own messenger, and that the only object that letter had in view was to announce his intended arrival. From that moment, no one opposed D'Artagnan's entrance any further, and he entered accordingly. A valet wished to accompany him, but he answered that it was useless to take that trouble on his account, inasmuch as he knew perfectly well where Monsieur du Vallon was. There was nothing, of course, to say to a man so thoroughly and completely informed on all points, and D'Artagnan was permitted, therefore, to do as he liked. The terraces, the magnificent apartments, the gardens, were all reviewed and narrowly inspected by the musketeer. He walked for a quarter of an hour in this more than royal residence, which included as many wonders as articles of furniture, and as many servants as there were columns and doors. Decidedly, he said to himself, this mansion has no other limits than the pillars of the habitable world. Is it probable Porthos has taken it into his head to go back to Pierrefonds without even leaving Monsieur Fouquet's house? He finally reached a remote part of the chateau, enclosed by a stone wall, which was covered with a profusion of thick plants, luxuriant in blossoms as large and solid as fruit. At equal distances on the top of this wall, were placed various statues in timid or mysterious attitudes. These were vestals, hidden beneath the long Greek peplum, with its thick, sinuous folds, agile nymphs, covered with their marble veils, and guarding the palace with their fugitive glances. A statue of Hermes, with his finger on his lips, one of Iris, with extended wings, another of night, sprinkled all over with poppies, dominated the gardens and outbuildings, which could be seen through the trees. 
all these statues threw in white relief their profiles upon the dark ground of the tall cypresses which darted their sombre summits towards the sky around these cypresses were entwined climbing roses whose flowering rings were fastened to every fork of the branches and spread over the lower boughs and the various statues showers of flowers of the rarest fragrance these enchantments seemed to the musketeer the result of the greatest efforts of the human mind he felt in a dreamy almost poetical frame of mind the idea that porthos was living in so perfect an eden gave him a higher idea of porthos showing how tremendously true it is that even the very highest orders of minds are not quite exempt from the influence of surroundings d'artagnan found the door and on or rather in the door a kind of spring which he detected having touched it the door flew open d'artagnan entered closed the door behind him and advanced into a pavilion built in a circular form in which no other sound could be heard but cascades and the songs of birds at the door of the pavilion he met a lackey it is here i believe said d'artagnan without hesitation that monsieur le baron du vallon is staying yes monsieur answered the lackey have the goodness to tell him that monsieur le chevalier d'artagnan captain of the king's musketeers is waiting to see him d'artagnan was introduced into the salon and had not long to remain in expectation a well-remembered step shook the floor of the adjoining room a door opened or rather flew open and porthos appeared and threw himself into his friend's arms with a sort of embarrassment which did not ill become him you here he exclaimed and you replied d'artagnan ah you sly fellow yes said porthos with a somewhat embarrassed smile yes you see i am staying in m fouquet's house at which you are not a little surprised i suppose not at all why should you not be one of m fouquet's friends m fouquet has a very large number particularly among clever men porthos had the modesty not to take the compliment to himself besides he added you saw me at belle isle a greater reason for my believing you to be one of m fouquet's friends the fact is i am acquainted with him said porthos with a certain embarrassment of manner ah friend porthos said d'artagnan how treacherously you have behaved towards me in what way exclaimed porthos what you complete so admirable a work as the fortifications of belle isle and you did not tell me of it porthos colored nay more than that continued d'artagnan you saw me out yonder you know i am in the king's service and yet you could not guess that the king jealously desirous of learning the name of the man whose abilities had wrought a work of which he heard the most wonderful account you could not guess i say that the king sent me to learn who this man was what the king sent you to learn of course but don't let us speak of that any more not speak of it said porthos on the contrary we will speak of it and so the king knew that we were fortifying belle isle of course does not the king know everything but he did not know who was fortifying it no he only suspected from what he had been told of the nature of the works that it was some celebrated soldier or another the devil said porthos if i had only known that you would not have run away from van as you did perhaps no 
What did you say when you couldn't find me? My dear fellow, I reflected. Ah, indeed, you reflect, do you? Well, and what did that reflection lead to? It led me to guess the whole truth. Come then, tell me, what did you guess after all? said Porthos, settling himself into an armchair and assuming the airs of a sphinx. I guessed, in the first place, that you were fortifying Belle Isle. There was no great difficulty in that, for you saw me at work. Wait a minute. I also guessed something else, that you were fortifying Belle Isle by Monsieur Fouquet's orders. Mm, that's true. But even that is not all. Whenever I feel myself in trim for guessing, I do not stop on my road, and so I guess that M. Fouquet wished to preserve the most absolute secrecy respecting those fortifications. I believe that was his intention, in fact, said Porthos. Yes, but do you know why he wished to keep it secret? In order that it should not become known, perhaps, said Porthos. That was his principal reason. But his wish was subservient to a bit of generosity. In fact, said Porthos, I have heard it said that Monsieur Fouquet was a very generous man. To a bit of generosity he wished to exhibit towards the king. Oh, oh. You seem surprised at that. Yes. And you didn't guess? No. Well, I know it then. You are a wizard. Not at all, I assure you. How do you know it then? By a very simple means. I heard Monsieur Fouquet himself say so to the king. Say what to the king? That he fortified Belle Isle on His Majesty's account and that he had made him a present of Belle Isle. And you heard Monsieur Fouquet say that to the king? In those very words, he even added, Belle Isle has been fortified by an engineer, one of my friends, a man of a great deal of merit, whom I shall ask your majesty's permission to present to you. What is his name? said the king. The Baron du Vallon, Monsieur Fouquet replied. Very well, returned His Majesty. You will present him to me. The King said that? Upon the word of D'Artagnan. Oh, oh, said Porthos. Why have I not been presented then? Have they not spoken to you about this presentation? Yes, certainly. But I am always kept waiting for it. Be easy. It will be sure to come. Hm, hm, grumbled Porthos, which D'Artagnan pretended not to hear. And, changing the conversation, he said, You seem to be living in a very solitary place here, my dear fellow. I always preferred retirement. I am of a melancholy disposition, replied Porthos, with a sigh. Really, that is odd, said D'Artagnan. I never remarked that before. It is only since I have taken to reading, said Porthos, with a thoughtful air. But the labours of the mind have not affected the health of the body, I trust? Not in the slightest degree. Your strength is as great as ever? Too great, my friend, too great. Ah, I had heard that for a short time after your arrival, that I could hardly move a limb, I suppose? How was it, said D'Artagnan, smiling, and why was it you could not move? 
Porthos, perceiving that he had made a mistake, wished to correct it. Yes, I came from Belle Isle upon very hard horses, he said, and that fatigued me. I'm no longer astonished, then, since I, who followed you, found seven or eight lying dead on the road. I am very heavy, you know, said Porthos, so that you were bruised all over. My marrow melted. That made me very ill. Poor Porthos! But how did Aramis act toward you under those circumstances? Very well indeed. He had me attended to by M. Fouquet's own doctor. But just imagine, at the end of a week I could not breathe any longer. What do you mean? The room was too small. I had absorbed every atom of air. Indeed. I was told so, at least. And so I was removed into another apartment. Where you were able to breathe, I hope and trust. Yes, more freely. But no exercise nothing to do. The doctor pretended that I was not to stir. I, on the contrary, felt that I was stronger than ever. That was the cause of a very serious accident. What accident? Fancy, my dear fellow, that I revolted against the directions of that ass of a doctor and I resolved to go out, whether it suited him or not. And, consequently, I told the valet who waited on me to bring me my clothes. You were quite naked, then? Oh, no, on the contrary, I had a magnificent dressing gown to wear. The lackey obeyed. I dressed myself in my own clothes, which had become too large for me. But a strange circumstance had happened. My feet had become too large. Yes, I quite understand. And my boots too small. You mean your feet were still swollen? Exactly. You have hit it. Pardieu! And is that the accident you were going to tell me about? Oh, yes. I did not make the same reflection you have done. I said to myself, Since my feet have entered my boots ten times, there is no reason why they should not go in the eleventh. Allow me to tell you, my dear Porthos, that on this occasion you failed in your logic. In short, then, they placed me opposite to a part of the room which was partitioned. I tried to get my boot on. I pulled it with my hands. I pushed with all the strength of the muscles of my leg, making the most unheard-of efforts. Then, suddenly, the two tags of my boot remained in my hands, and my foot struck out like a ballista. How learned you are in fortification, dear Porthos. My foot darted out like a ballista and came against the partition, which it broke in. I really thought that, like Samson, I had demolished the temple. And the number of pictures, the quantity of china, vases of flowers, carpets and window panes that fell down were really wonderful indeed without reckoning that on the other side of the partition was a small table laden with porcelain which you knocked over which i dashed to the other side of the room said porthos laughing 
"'Upon my word, it is, as you say, astonishing,' replied D'Artagnan, beginning to laugh also, whereupon Porthos laughed louder than ever. "'I broke,' said Porthos, in a voice half choked from his increasing mirth, "'more than three thousand francs worth of china! Ha, ha, ha!' "'Good,' said D'Artagnan. I smashed more than four thousand francs worth of glass. Ho, 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 ho. Excellent. Without counting a luster, which fell on my head and was broken into a thousand pieces. Ha, ha, ha. Upon your head, said D'Artagnan, holding his side. On top. But your head was broken, I suppose. No, since I tell you, on the contrary, my dear fellow, that it was the luster which was broken, like glass, which, in point of fact, it was. Ah, the luster was glass, you say. Venetian glass, a perfect curiosity, quite matchless indeed, and weighed two hundred pounds. "'And it fell upon your head?' "'Upon my head. "'Just imagine a globe of crystal gilded all over, "'the lower part beautifully encrusted, "'perfumes burning at the top "'with jets from which flames issued when they were lighted. "'I quite understand, "'but they were not lighted at the time, I suppose.' Happily not, or I should have been grilled prematurely. And you were only knocked down flat instead? Not at all. How not at all? Why, the luster fell on my skull. It appears that we have upon the top of our heads an exceedingly thick crust. Who told you that, Porthos? The doctor, a sort of dome which would bear Notre Dame. Bah! Yes, it seems that our skulls are made in that manner. Speak for yourself, my dear fellow. It is your own skull that is made in that manner, and not the skulls of other people. Well, that may be so, said Porthos conceitedly. So much, however, was that the case, in my instance, that no sooner did the luster fall upon the dome which we have at the top of our head, than there was a report like a cannon, the crystal was broken to pieces, and I fell, covered from head to foot, with blood, poor Porthos. Not at all, with perfumes which smelt like rich creams. It was delicious, but the odour was too strong, and I felt quite giddy from it. Perhaps you have experienced it sometimes yourself, D'Artagnan. Yes, in inhaling the scent of the lily of the valley, so that, my poor friend, you were knocked over by the shock and overpowered by the perfumes? Yes, but what is very remarkable, for the doctor told me he had never seen anything like it. You had a bump on your head, I suppose, interrupted D'Artagnan. I had five. Why five? I will tell you. The luster had, at its lower extremity, five gilt ornaments, excessively sharp. Oh, well, these five ornaments penetrated my hair, which, as you see, I wear very thick. Fortunately so. And they made a mark on my skin. But just notice the singularity of it. These things seem really only to happen to me. Instead of making indentations, they made 
bumps. The doctor could never succeed in explaining that to me satisfactorily. Well then, I will explain it to you. You will do me a great service if you will, said Porthos, winking his eyes, which, with him, was a sign of the profoundest attention. Since you've been employing your brain in studies of an exalted character, in important calculations and so on, the head has gained a certain advantage, so that your head is now too full of science. Do you think so? I am sure of it. The result is that, instead of allowing any foreign matter to penetrate the interior of the head, your bony box or skull, which is already too full, avails itself of the openings which are made in allowing this excess to escape. Ah, said Porthos, to whom this explanation appeared clearer than that of the doctor. The five protuberances caused by the five ornaments of the luster must certainly have been scientific globules, brought to the surface by the force of circumstances. In fact, said Porthos, the real truth is that I felt far worse outside my head than inside. I will even confess that when I put my hat upon my head, clapping it on my head with that graceful energy which we gentlemen of the sword possess, if my fist was not very gently applied, I experienced the most painful sensations. I quite believe you, Porthos. Therefore, my friend, said the giant, Monsieur Fouquet decided, seeing how slightly built the house was, to give me another lodging, and so they brought me here. It is the private park, I think, is it not? Yes. Where the rendezvous are made. That park, indeed, which is so celebrated in some of those mysterious stories about the superintendent. I don't know. I have had no rendezvous, or heard mysterious stories myself, but they have authorized me to exercise my muscles, and I take advantage of the permission by rooting up some of the trees. What for? To keep my hand in, and also to take some birds' nests. I find it more convenient than climbing. You are as pastoral as Tersis, my dear Porthos. Yes, I like the small eggs. I like them very much better than larger ones. You have no idea how delicate an omelette is if made of four or five hundred eggs of linnets, chaffinches, starlings, blackbirds, and thrushes. But five hundred eggs is perfectly monstrous. A salad bowl will hold them easily enough, said Porthos. D'Artagnan looked at Porthos admiringly for full five minutes as if he had seen him for the first time, while Porthos spread his chest out joyously and proudly. They remained in this state several minutes, Porthos smiling, and D'Artagnan looking at him. D'Artagnan was evidently trying to give the conversation a new turn. "'Do you amuse yourself much here, Porthos?' he asked at last, very likely after he had found out what he was searching for. Not always. I can imagine that. But when you get thoroughly bored, by and by, what do you intend to do? Oh, I shall not be here for any length of time. Aramis is waiting until the last bump on my head disappears, in order to present me to the king, who, I am told, cannot endure the sight of a bump. Aramis is still in Paris, then? No. Whereabouts is he, then? At Fontainebleau. Alone? With Monsieur Fouquet? Very good. But 
Do you happen to know one thing? No. Tell it me, and then I shall know. Well, then, I think Aramis is forgetting you. Do you really think so? Yes, for at Fontainebleau yonder, you must know, they are laughing, dancing, banqueting, and drawing the corks of Monsieur de Mazarin's wine in fine style. Are you aware they have a ballet every evening there? The deuce they have! I assure you that your dear Aramis is forgetting you. Well, that is not at all unlikely, and I have myself thought so sometimes. Unless he is playing you a trick, the sly fellow. Oh! You know that Aramis is as sly as a fox. Yes, but to play me a trick? Listen, in the first place, he puts you under a sort of sequestration. He sequestrates me. Do you mean to say I am sequestrated? I think so. I wish you would have the goodness to prove that to me. Nothing easier. Do you ever go out? Never. Do you ever ride on horseback? Never. Are your friends allowed to come and see you? Never. Very well, then. Never to go out, never to ride on horseback, never to be allowed to see your friends. That is called being sequestrated. But why should Aramis sequestrate me? inquired Porthos. Come, said D'Artagnan. Be frank, Porthos. As gold. It was Aramis who drew the plan of the fortifications at Belle Isle, was it not? Porthos coloured as he said, Yes. But that was all he did. Exactly. And my own opinion is that it was no very great affair after all. That is mine too. Very good. I am delighted we are of the same opinion. He never even came to Belle Isle, said Porthos. There now, you see. It was I who went to Vannes, as you may have seen. Say, rather, as I did see. Well, that is precisely the state of the case, my dear Porthos. Aramis, who only drew the plans, wishes to pass himself off as the engineer, whilst you who stone by stone built the wall, the citadel, and the bastions, he wishes to reduce to the rank of a mere builder. By builder, you mean mason, perhaps? Mason, the very word. Plasterer, in fact. Hodman. Exactly. Oh, Oh, my dear Aramis, you seem to think you are only five and twenty years of age still. Yes, and that is not all, for he believes you are fifty. I should have amazingly liked to have seen him at work. Yes, indeed. A fellow who has got the gout... Yes. Who has lost three of his teeth? Four. While I look at mine. And Porthos, opening his large mouth very wide, displayed two rows of teeth, not quite as white as snow, but even, hard and sound as ivory. You can hardly believe, Porthos, said D'Artagnan. What a fancy the king has for good teeth. Yours decide me. I will present you to the king myself. You? Why not? Do you think I have less credit at court than Aramis? Oh, no. Do you think I have the slightest pretensions upon the fortifications at Belle Isle? 
Certainly not. It is your own interest alone which would induce me to do it. I don't doubt it in the least. Well, I am the intimate friend of the king, and a proof of that is that whenever there is anything disagreeable to tell him, it is I who have to do it. But, dear D'Artagnan, if you present me, well, Aramis will be angry. With me? No, with me. Bah! Whether he or I present you, since you are to be presented, what does it matter? They were going to get me some clothes made. Your own are splendid. Oh, those I had ordered were far more beautiful. Take care. The king likes simplicity. In that case, I will be simple. But what will Monsieur Fouquet say when he learns that I have left? Are you a prisoner, then, on parole? No, not quite that. But I promised him I would not leave without letting him know. Wait a minute, we shall return to that presently. Have you anything to do here? I? Nothing. Nothing of any importance, at least. Unless, indeed, you are our Mrs. Representative for something of importance. By no means. What I tell you, pray understand that, is out of interest for you. I suppose, for instance, that you are commissioned to send messages and letters to him? Ah, letters, yes. I send certain letters to him. Where? To Fontainebleau. Have you any letters, then? But... Nay, let me speak. Have you any letters, I say? I have just received one for him. Interesting? I suppose so. You do not read them, then? I am not at all curious, said Porthos, as he drew out of his pocket the soldier's letter, which Porthos had not read, but D'Artagnan had. Do you know what to do with it? said D'Artagnan. Of course. Do as I always do. Send it to him. Not so. Why not? Keep it, then. Did they not tell you that this letter was important? Very important. Well, you must take it yourself to Fontainebleau. To Aramis? Yes. Very good. And since the king is there, you will profit by that. I shall profit by the opportunity to present you to the king. Ah, D'Artagnan, there is no one like you for expedience. Therefore, instead of forwarding to our friend any messages, which may or may not be faithfully delivered, we will ourselves be the bearers of the letter. I had never even thought of that, and yet it is simple enough. And therefore, because it is urgent, Porthos, we ought to set off at once. In fact, said Porthos, the sooner we set off, the less chance there is of Aramis's letter being delayed. Porthos, your reasoning is always accurate, and in your case, Logic seems to serve as an auxiliary to the imagination. Do you think so? said Porthos. It is the result of your hard reading, replied D'Artagnan. So, come along, let us be off. But, said Porthos, my promise to Monsieur Fouquet, which? Not to leave Saint-Mande without telling him of it. Ah, Porthos, said D'Artagnan. How very young you still are. In what way? You are going to Fontainebleau, are you not, where you will find Monsieur Fouquet? Yes. 
Probably in the king's palace? Yes, repeated Porthos, with an air full of majesty. Well, you will accost him with these words. Monsieur Fouquet, I have the honour to inform you that I have just left Saint-Mont. And, said Porthos, with the same majestic mien, seeing me at Fontainebleau at the king's, Monsieur Fouquet will not be able to tell me I am not speaking the truth. My dear Porthos, I was just on the point of opening my lips to make the same remark, but you anticipate me in everything. Oh, Porthos, how fortunately you are gifted. Years have made not the slightest impression on you. Not over much, certainly. Then there is nothing more to say? I think not. All your scruples are removed? Quite so. In that case, I shall carry you off with me. Exactly. And I will go and get my horse saddled. You have horses here, then? I have five. You had them sent from Pierre Fons, I suppose? No. Monsieur Fouquet gave them to me. My dear Porthos, we shall not want five horses for two persons. Besides, I have already three in Paris, which would make eight, and that will be too many. It would not be too many if I had some of my servants here. But, alas, I have not got them. Do you regret them, then? I regret Mousqueton. I miss Mousqueton. What a good-hearted fellow you are, Porthos, said D'Artagnan. But the best thing you can do is to leave your horses here, as you have left Mousqueton out yonder. Why so? Because, by and by, it might turn out a very good thing if Monsieur Fouquet had never given you anything at all. I don't understand you, said Porthos. It is not necessary you should understand. But yet, I will explain to you later, Porthos. I'll wager it is some piece of policy or other and of the most subtle character, returned D'Artagnan. Porthos nodded his head at this word policy. Then, after a moment's reflection, he added, I confess, D'Artagnan, that I am no politician. I know that well. Oh, no one knows what you told me yourself, you the bravest of the brave. What did I tell you, Porthos? That every man has his day. You told me so, and I have experienced it myself. There are certain days when one feels less pleasure than others in exposing oneself to a bullet or a sword thrust. Exactly my own idea. And mine too, although... I can hardly believe in blows or thrusts that kill outright. The deuce! And yet you have killed a few in your time. Yes, but I have never been killed. Your reason is a very good one. Therefore, I do not believe I shall ever die from a thrust of a sword or a gunshot. In that case, then, you are afraid of nothing. Ah, water, perhaps? Oh, I swim like an otter. Of a quartan fever, then? I have never had one yet, and I don't believe I ever shall. But there is one thing I will admit, and Porthos dropped his voice. What is that? asked D'Artagnan, adopting the same tone of voice as Porthos. I must confess, repeated Porthos, that I am horribly afraid of politics. Ah, bah, exclaimed D'Artagnan. Upon my word, it's true, said Porthos in a stentorian voice. 
I have seen His Eminence Monsieur le Cardinal de Richelieu, and His Eminence Monsieur le Cardinal de Mazarin. The one was a red politician, the other a black politician. I never felt very much more satisfied with the one than with the other. The first struck off the heads of Monsieur de Marillac, Monsieur de Thou, Monsieur de Saint Mars, Monsieur Chalet, Monsieur de Bouteville, and Monsieur de Montmorency. The second got a whole crowd of frondeurs cut in pieces, and we belonged to them. On the contrary, we did not belong to them, said D'Artagnan. Oh, indeed, yes, for if I unsheathed my sword for the cardinal, I struck it for the king. My good Porthos! Well, I have done. My dread of politics is such that if there is any question of politics in the matter, I should greatly prefer to return to Pierre Fonds. You would be quite right if that were the case. But with me, my dear Porthos, no politics at all. That is quite clear. You've labored hard in fortifying Belle Isle. The king wished to know the name of the clever engineer under whose directions the works were carried out. You are modest, as all men of true genius are. Perhaps Aramis wishes to put you under a bushel. But I happen to seize hold of you. I make it known who you are. I produce you. The king rewards you. And that is the only policy I have to do with. And the only one I will have to do with either, said Porthos, holding out his hand to D'Artagnan. But D'Artagnan knew Porthos's grasp. He knew that once imprisoned within the baron's five fingers, no hand ever left it without being half crushed. He therefore held out not his hand, but his fist, and Porthos did not even perceive the difference. The servants talked a little with each other in an undertone, and whispered a few words, which D'Artagnan understood, but which he took very good care not to let Porthos understand. Our friend, he said to himself, was really and truly Aramis's prisoner. Chapter 4 of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Snowza, Houston, Texas, March 2013. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 4 The Rat and the Cheese. D'Artagnan and Porthos returned on foot as D'Artagnan had set out. When D'Artagnan, as he entered the shop of the Pilon d'Or, announced to Planchet that Monsieur de Vallon would be one of the privileged travelers, and as the plume in Porthos's hat made the wooden candle suspended over the front jingle together, a melancholy presentiment seemed to eclipse the delight Planchet had promised himself for the morrow. But the grocer had a heart of gold, ever mindful of the good old times, a trait that carries youth into old age. So, Planchet, notwithstanding a sort of internal shiver, checked as soon as experienced, received Porthos with respect mingled with the tenderest cordiality. Porthos, who was a little cold and stiff in his manners at first, on account of the social difference existing at that period between a baron and a grocer, soon began to soften when he perceived so much good feeling and so many kind attentions in Planchet. He was particularly touched by the liberty which was permitted him to plunge his great palms into boxes of dried fruits and preserves, into sacks of nuts and almonds, and into the drawers full of sweetmeats, so that, notwithstanding Planchet's pressing invitations to go upstairs to the entresol, he chose as his favorite seat during the evening which he had to spend at Planchet's house, the shop itself, where his fingers could always fish up whatever his nose detected the delicious figs from Provence, filberts from the forest, 
Tours plums were subjects of his uninterrupted attention for five consecutive hours. His teeth, like millstones, cracked heaps of nuts, the shells of which were scattered all over the floor, where they were trampled by every one who went in and out of the shop. Porthos pulled from the stalk with his lips at one mouthful bunches of the rich muscatel raisins with their beautiful bloom, half a pound of which passed in one gulp from his mouth to his stomach. In one of the corners of the shop, Planchet's assistants huddled together, looking at each other without venturing to open their lips. They did not know who Porthos was, for they had never seen him before. The race of those titans who had worn the curios of Hugh Capet, Philip Augustus, and Francis I had already begun to disappear. They could hardly help thinking he might be the ogre of a fairy tale who was going to turn the whole contents of Planchet's shop into his insatiable stomach, and that, too, without in the slightest degree displacing the barrels and chests that were in it. Cracking, munching, chewing, nibbling, sucking, and swallowing, Porthos occasionally said to the grocer, "'You do a very good business here, friend Planchet. "'He will very soon have none at all to do if this sort of thing continues,' grumbled the foreman, who had Planchet's word that he should be his successor. In the midst of his despair, he approached Porthos, who blocked up the whole of the passage leading from the back shop to the shop itself. He hoped that Porthos would rise, and that this movement would distract his devouring ideas. "'What do you want, my man?' asked Porthos affably. "'I should like to pass you, monsieur, if it is not troubling you too much.' "'Very well,' said Porthos. "'It does not trouble me in the least.' At the same moment he took hold of the young fellow by the waistband, lifted him off the ground, and placed him very gently on the other side, smiling all the while with the same affable expression. As soon as Porthos had placed him on the ground, the lad's legs so shook under him that he fell back upon some sacks of corks, but noticing the giant's gentleness of manner, he ventured again and said, "'Ah, monsieur, pray be careful!' "'What about?' inquired Porthos. "'You are positively putting a fiery furnace into your body. "'How is that, my good fellow? "'All those things are very heating to the system. "'Which? "'Raisins, nuts, and almonds. "'Yes, but if raisins, nuts, and almonds are heating, "'there's no doubt at all of it, monsieur. "'Honey is very cooling,' said Porthos. "'Stretched out his hand towards a small barrel of honey which was open, "'and he plunged the scoop with which the wants of the customers were supplied into it, and swallowed a good half-pound at one gulp. "'I must trouble you for some water now, my man,' said Porthos. "'In a pail, monsieur?' asked the lad simply. "'No, in a water-bottle. That will be quite enough.' And raising the bottle to his mouth, as a trumpeter does his trumpet, he emptied the bottle in a single draught. Planchet was agitated in every fibre of propriety and self-esteem. However, a worthy representative of the hospitality which had prevailed in early days, he feigned to be talking very earnestly with D'Artagnan, and incessantly repeated, "'Ah, monsieur, what a happiness! What an honor! "'What time shall we have supper, Planchet?' inquired Porthos. "'I feel hungry!' The foreman clasped his hands together. The two others got under the counters, fearing Porthos might have a taste for human flesh. "'We shall only take a sort of a snack here,' said D'Artagnan, and when we get to Planchet's country seat, we'll have supper. Ah, ah, we are going to your country house, Planchet, said Porthos. So much the better. You overwhelm me, Monsieur le Baron. The Monsieur le Baron had a great effect upon the men, who detected a personage of the highest quality in an appetite of that kind. This title, too, reassured them. They had never heard that an ogre was ever called Monsieur le Baron. "'I will take a few biscuits to eat on the road,' said Porthos carelessly, and he emptied a whole jar of aniseed biscuits into a huge pocket of his doublet. "'My shop is saved!' exclaimed Planchet. "'Yes, as the cheese was,' whispered the foreman. "'What cheese?' "'The Dutch cheese, inside which a rat had made his way, and we found only the rind left.' Planchet looked around his shop, and observing the different articles which had escaped Porthos's teeth— he found the comparison somewhat exaggerated. The foreman, who remarked what was passing in his master's mind, said, "'Take care, he has not gone yet.' 
"'Have you any fruit here?' said Porthos, as he went upstairs to the entresol, where it had just been announced that some refreshment was prepared. "'Alas!' thought the grocer, addressing a look at D'Artagnan full of entreaty, which the latter half understood. As soon as they had finished eating, they set off. It was late when the three riders, who had left Paris about six in the evening, arrived at Fontainebleau. The journey passed very agreeably. Porthos took a fancy to Planchet's society, because the latter was very respectful in his manners, and seemed delighted to talk to him about his meadows, his woods, and his rabbit warrens. Porthos had all the taste and pride of a landed proprietor. When D'Artagnan saw his two companions in earnest conversation, he took the opposite side of the road, and, letting his bridle drop on his horse's neck, separated himself from the whole world, as he had done from Porthos and from Planchet. The moon shone softly through the foliage of the forest. The breezes of the open country rose deliciously perfumed to the horse's nostrils, and they snorted and pranced along delightedly. Porthos and Planchet began to talk about hay crops. Planchet admitted to Porthos that in the advanced years of his life he had certainly neglected agricultural pursuits for commerce, but that his childhood had been passed in Picardy, in the beautiful meadows where the grass grew as high as the knees, and where he had played under the green apple trees covered with red-cheeked fruit, he went on to say that he had solemnly promised himself that as soon as he should have made his fortune he would return to nature and end his days as he had begun them, as near as he possibly could to the earth itself, where all men must sleep at last. Eh, eh, said Porthos, in that case, my dear Monsieur Planchet, your retirement is not far distant. How so? Why, you seem to be in the way of making your fortune very soon. Well, we're getting on pretty well, I must admit, replied Planchet. Come, tell me what is the extent of your ambition, and what is the amount you intend to retire upon. There is one circumstance, monsieur, said Planchet, without answering the question, which occasions me a good deal of anxiety. What is it? inquired Porthos, looking all round him, as if in search of the circumstance that annoyed Planchet, and desirous of freeing him from it. Why, formerly, said the grocer, you used to call me Planchet quite short, and you would have spoken to me then in a much more familiar manner than you do now. "'Certainly, certainly, I should have said so formerly,' replied the good-natured Porthos, with an embarrassment full of delicacy. "'But formerly—' "'Formerly I was Monsieur d'Artagnan's lackey.' "'Is not that what you mean?' "'Well, if I am not quite his lackey, I am as much as ever I was his devoted servant, and more than that, since that time I have had the honor of being in partnership with him.' "'Oh, oh!' said Porthos. "'What, has D'Artagnan gone into the grocery business?' "'No, no,' said D'Artagnan, whom these words had drawn out of his reverie, and who entered into the conversation with that readiness and rapidity which distinguished every operation of his mind and body. It was not D'Artagnan who entered into the grocery business, but Planchet who entered into a political affair with me. "'Yes,' said Planchet, with mingled pride and satisfaction. "'Retransacted a little business which brought me in a hundred thousand francs, and Monsieur d'Artagnan two hundred thousand. "'Oh, oh!' said Porthos, with admiration. "'So that, Monsieur le Baron,' continued the grocer, "'I again beg you to be kind enough to call me Planchet, as you used to do, and to speak to me as familiarly as in old times. You cannot possibly imagine the pleasure it would give me.' "'If that be the case, my dear Planchet,' "'I will do so, certainly,' replied Porthos, and, as he was quite close to Planchet, he raised his hand as if to strike him on the shoulder in token of friendly cordiality, but a fortunate movement of the horse made him miss his aim, so that his hand fell on the crupper of Planchet's horse instead, which made the animal's legs almost give way. D'Artagnan burst out laughing as he said, "'Take care, Planchet, for if Porthos begins to like you too much, he will caress you, and if he caresses you, he will knock you flat as a pancake. Porthos is still as strong as ever, you know. Oh, said Planchet, Mousqueton is not dead, and yet Monsieur le Baron is very fond of him. Certainly, said Porthos, with a sigh, which made all three horses rear, and I was only saying this very morning to D'Artagnan how much I regretted him. But tell me, Planchet. Thank you, Monsieur le Baron. Thank you. "'Good lad, good lad. How many acres of park have you got?' 
of park yes we will reckon up on the meadows presently and the woods afterwards whereabouts monsieur at your chateau oh monsieur le baron i have neither chateau nor park nor meadows nor woods what have you got then inquired porthos and why do you call it a country seat i did not call it a country seat monsieur le baron replied planchet somewhat humiliated but a country box ah ah i understand you are modest no monsieur le baron i speak the plain truth i have room for a couple of friends that's all but in that case whereabouts do your friends walk in the first place they can walk about the king's forest which is very beautiful yes i know the forest will be fine said porthos nearly as beautiful as my forest at Bailly. planchet opened his eyes very wide you have a forest of the same kind as the forest at fontainebleau monsieur le baron he stammered out yes i have two indeed but the one at Bailly is my favorite why so asked planchet because i don't know where it ends and also because it is full of poachers how can the poachers make the forest so agreeable to you because they hunt my game and i hunt them which in these peaceful times is for me a sufficiently pleasing picture of war on a small scale they had reached this turn of conversation when planchet looking up perceived the houses at the commencement of fontainebleau the lofty outlines of which stood out strongly against the misty visage of the heavens whilst rising above the compact and irregularly formed mass of buildings the pointed roofs of the chateau were clearly visible the slates of which glistened beneath the light of the moon like the scales of an immense fish. Chapter 5 of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Snoza, Houston, Texas, April 2013. Louise de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 5. Planchet's Country House. The cavaliers looked up and saw that what Planchet had announced to them was true. Ten minutes afterwards they were in the street called the Rue de Leon on the opposite side of the hostelry of the Beaupéon. A high hedge of bushy elders, hawthorn and wild hops formed an impenetrable fence behind which rose a white house with a high-tiled roof. Two of the windows, which were quite dark, looked upon the street. Between the two, a small door with a porch supported by a couple of pillars formed the entrance to the house. The door was gained by a step raised a little from the ground. Planchet got off his horse, as if he intended to knock at the door, but, on second thoughts, he took hold of his horse by the bridle and led it about thirty paces further on, his two companions following him. He then advanced about another thirty paces until he arrived at the door of a cart-house lighted by an iron grating and, lifting up a wooden latch, pushed open one of the folding doors. He entered first, leading his horse after him by the bridle, into a small courtyard where an odor met them which revealed their close vicinity to a stable. "'That smells all right,' said Porthos, loudly getting off his horse and I almost begin to think that I am near my own cows at Pierrefond. I have only one cow, Planchet hastened to say modestly, and I have thirty, said Porthos, or rather, I don't exactly know how many I have. When the two cavaliers had entered, Planchet fastened the door behind them. In the meantime, D'Artagnan, who had dismounted with his usual agility, inhaled the fresh-perfumed air with the delight a Parisian feels at this sight of green fields and fresh foliage, plucked a piece of honeysuckle with one hand and a sweet briar with the other. Porthos clawed hold of some peas which were twined round poles stuck into the ground and ate, or rather browsed upon them, shells and all, and Planchet was busily engaged trying to wake up an old, infirm peasant who was fast asleep in a shed lying on a bed of moss and dressed in an old stable suit of clothes. The peasant, recognizing Planchet, called him the master, to the grocer's great satisfaction. "'Stable the horses well, old fellow, and you shall have something good for yourself,' said Planchet. "'Yes, yes, fine animals there are, too,' said the peasant. "'Oh, they shall have as much as they like.' "'Gently, gently, my man,' said D'Artagnan. 
We are getting on a little too fast. A few oats and a good bed. Nothing more. Some bran and water for my horse, said Porthos, for it is very warm, I think. Don't be afraid, gentlemen, replied Planchet. Daddy Celestin is an old gendarme, and he fought at Ivory. He knows all about horses, so come into the house. And he led the way along a well-sheltered walk, which crossed a kitchen garden, then a small paddock, and came out into a little garden behind the house, the principal front of which, as we have already noticed, faced the street. As they approached, they could see, through two open windows on the ground floor which led into the sitting-room, the interior of Planchet's residence. This room, softly lighted by a lamp placed upon a table, seemed, from the end of the garden, like a smiling image of repose, comfort, and happiness. In every direction where the rays of light fell, whether upon a piece of old china, or upon an article of furniture shining from excessive neatness, or upon the weapons hanging against the wall, the soft light was softly reflected, and its rays seemed to linger everywhere upon something or another agreeable to the eye. The lamp which lighted the room, whilst the foliage of jasmine and climbing roses hung in masses from the window frames, splendidly illuminated a damask tablecloth as white as snow. The table was laid for two persons. Amber-colored wine sparkled in a long cut glass bottle, and a large jug of blue china with a silver lid was filled with foaming cider. Near the table, in a high-backed armchair, reclined fast asleep, a woman of about thirty years of age, her face the very picture of health and freshness. Upon her knees lay a large cat with her paws folded under her, and her eyes half-closed, purring in that significant manner which, according to feline habits, indicates perfect contentment. The two friends paused before the window in complete amazement, while Planchet, perceiving their astonishment, was in no little degree secretly delighted at it. "'Ah, Planchet, you rascal!' said D'Artagnan. "'I now understand your absences.' "'Oh, oh, there is some white linen,' said Porthos, in his turn, in a voice of thunder. At the sound of his gigantic voice the cat took flight, the housekeeper woke up with a start, and Planchet, assuming a gracious air, introduced his two companions into the room where the table was already laid. "'Permit me, my dear,' he said, "'to present to you Monsieur le Chevalier d'Artagnan, my patron.' D'Artagnan took the lady's hand in his in the most courteous manner, and with precisely the same chivalrous air as he would have taken Madame's. Monsieur le Baron du Vallon de Brossu de Pierrefonds, added Planchet. Porthos bowed with a reverence which Anne of Austria would have approved of. It was then Planchet's turn, and he unhesitatingly embraced the lady in question, not, however, until he had made a sign as if requesting D'Artagnan and Porthos's permission, a permission, as a matter of course, frankly conceded. D'Artagnan complimented Planchet and said, "'You are indeed a man who knows how to make life agreeable.' "'Life, monsieur,' said Planchet, laughing, "'is capital, which a man ought to invest as sensibly as he possibly can.' "'And you get very good interest upon yours,' said Porthos, with a burst of laughter like a peal of thunder." Planchet turned to his housekeeper. "'You have before you,' he said to her, "'the two gentlemen who influenced the greatest, gayest, grandest portion of my life. I have spoken to you of both of them very frequently.' "'And about two others as well,' said the lady, with a very decided Flemish accent. "'Madame is Dutch?' inquired D'Artagnan. Porthos curled his moustache, the circumstance, which was not lost upon D'Artagnan, who noticed everything. "'I am from Antwerp,' said the lady.' "'And her name is Madame Grecher, said Planchet. "'You should not call her Madame,' said D'Artagnan. "'Why not?' asked Planchet. "'Because it would make her seem older every time you call her so. "'Well, I call her Truchen. "'And a very pretty name, too,' said Porthos. Truchen said Planchet, "'came to me from Flanders with her virtue and two thousand florines. "'She ran away from a brute of a husband who was in the habit of beating her.' Being myself a Picard born, I was always very fond of the artesian women, and it is only a step from Artois and Flanders. She came crying bitterly to her godfather, my predecessor at the Rue des Lombards. She placed her two thousand florins in my establishment, which I have turned into a very good account, and which have brought her in ten thousand. Bravo, Planchet! She is free and well off. She has a cow, a maidservant, and old Celestine at her orders. She mends my linen, knits my winter stockings. 
She only sees me every fortnight, and seems to make herself in all things tolerably happy. I am indeed, gentlemen, I am very happy and comfortable, said Truchen with perfect ingenuousness. Porthos began to curl the other side of his mustache. The deuce, thought D'Artagnan, can Porthos have any intentions in that quarter? In the meantime, Truchen had set her cook to work and had laid the table for two more and covered it with every possible delicacy that can convert a light supper into a substantial meal, a meal into a regular feast. Fresh butter, salt beef, anchovies, tourni, a shopful of planchets, commodities, fowls, vegetables, salad, fish from the pond and the river, game from the forest, all the produce, in fact, of the province. Moreover, Planchet returned from the cellar laden with ten bottles of wine, the glass of which could hardly be seen for the thick coating of dust which covered them. Porthos's heart began to expand as he said, I am hungry, and he sat himself beside Madame Truchen, whom he looked at in the most killing manner. D'Artagnan seated himself on the other side of her, while Planchet, discreetly and full of delight, took his seat opposite. Do not trouble yourselves, he said, if Truchen should leave the table now and then during supper, for she will have to look after your bedrooms. In fact, the housekeeper made her escape quite frequently, and they could hear on the first floor above them the creaking of the wooden bedsteads and the rolling of the casters on the floor. While this was going on, the three men, Porthos especially, ate and drank gloriously. It was wonderful to see them. The ten full bottles were ten empty ones by the time Truchen returned with the cheese. D'Artagnan still preserved his dignity and self-possession, but Porthos had lost a portion of his, and the mirth soon began to grow somewhat uproarious. D'Artagnan recommended a new descent into the cellar, and, as Planchet no longer walked with the steadiness of a well-trained foot-soldier, the captain of the musketeers proposed to accompany him. They set off, humming songs wild enough to frighten anybody who might be listening. Truchen remained behind at the table with Porthos while the two wine-bibbers were looking behind the firewood for what they wanted, a sharp report was heard like the impact of a pair of lips on a lady's cheek. Porthos fancies himself at La Rochelle, thought D'Artagnan, as they returned freighted with bottles. Planchet was singing so loudly that he was incapable of noticing anything. D'Artagnan, whom nothing ever escaped, remarked how much redder Truchin's left cheek was than her right. Porthos was sitting on Truchin's left, and was curling with his both hands both sides of his mustache at once, and Truchin was looking at him with a most bewitching smile. The sparkling white of Anjou very soon produced a remarkable effect upon the three companions. D'Artagnan had hardly enough strength left to take a candlestick to light Planchet up his own staircase. Planchet was pulling Porthos along, who was following Truchin, who was herself jovial enough. It was D'Artagnan who found out the rooms and the beds. Porthos threw himself onto the one destined for him, after his friend had undressed him. D'Artagnan got into his own bed, saying to himself, Mordieu, I had made up my mind never to touch that light-colored wine, which brings my early camp days back again. Fie! Fie! If my musketeers were only to see their captain in such a state! And drawing the curtains of his bed, he added, Fortunately enough, though, they will not see me. The country is very amusing, said Porthos, stretching out his legs, which passed through the wooden footboard and made a tr Chapter 6 of Louise de la Valliere this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Snoza, Houston, Texas, April 2013. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 6. Showing What Could Be Seen from Planchet's House. The next morning found the three heroes sleeping soundly. Truchen had closed the outside blinds to keep the first rays of the sun from the leaden-lidded eyes of her guests, like a kind, good housekeeper. It was still perfectly dark, then, beneath Porthos's curtains and under Planchet's canopy, when D'Artagnan, awakened by an indiscreet ray of light which made its way through a peak hole in the shutters, jumped hastily out of bed as if he wished to be the first at a forlorn hope. 
He took by assault Porthos's room, which was next to his own. The worthy Porthos was sleeping with a noise like distant thunder. In the dim obscurity of the room, his gigantic frame was preeminently displayed, and his swollen fist hung down outside the bed upon the carpet. D'Artagnan awoke Porthos, who rubbed his eyes in a tolerably good humor. In the meantime, Planchet was dressing himself, and met at their bedroom doors his two guests, who were still somewhat unsteady from their previous evening's entertainment. Although it was very early yet, the whole household was already up. The cook was mercilessly slaughtering in the poultry yard. Celestine was gathering white cherries in the garden. Porthos brisk and lively as ever, held out his hand to Planchet's, and D'Artagnan requested permission to embrace Madame Truchin. The latter, to show that she bore no ill-will, approached Porthos, upon whom she conferred the same favor. Porthos embraced Madame Truchin, heaving an enormous sigh. Planchet took both of his friends by the hand. "'I am going to show you over the house,' he said." When we arrived last night, it was dark as an oven, and we were unable to see anything, but in broad daylight everything looks different, and you will be satisfied, I hope. If we begin by the view you have here, said D'Artagnan, that charms me beyond anything, I have always lived in royal mansions, you know. Then royal personages have tolerably sound ideas upon the selection of good points of view. I am a great stickler for a good view myself, said Porthos. At my chateau at Pierrefonds, I have had four avenues laid out, and at the end of each is a landscape of an altogether different character from the others. You shall see my prospect, said Planchet, and he led his two guests to a window. Ah, said D'Artagnan, this is the Rue de Léon. Yes, I have two windows on this side, a paltry, insignificant view, for there was always that bustling and noisy inn which is a very disagreeable neighbor. I had four windows here, but I bricked up two. Let us go on, said D'Artagnan. They entered a corridor leading to the bedrooms, and Planchet pushed open the outside blinds. Hello, what is that out yonder, said Planchet. The forest, said Planchet. It is the horizon, a thick line of green, which is yellow in the spring, green in the summer, red in the autumn, and white in the winter. Ah, very well, but it is like a curtain which prevents one seeing a greater distance. Yes, said Planchet, still one can see, and at all events, everything that intervenes. Ah, the open country, said Porthos, but what is that I see out there, crosses and stones? That is the cemetery, exclaimed D'Artagnan. Precisely, said Planchet, I assure you that it is very curious. Hardly a day passes that someone is not buried there, for Fontainebleau is by no means an inconsiderable place. Sometimes we see young girls clothed in white carrying banners, at others some of the town council, or rich citizens with chaucers and all the parish authorities, and then, too, we see some of the officers of the king's household. I should not like that, said Porthos. There is not much amusement in it at all events, said D'Artagnan. I assure you, it encourages religious thoughts, replied Planchet. Oh, I don't deny that. But, continued Planchet, we must all die one day or another, and I once met with a maxim somewhere which I have remembered, and the thought of death is a thought that will do us all good. I am far from saying the contrary, said Porthos. But, objected D'Artagnan, the thought of green fields, flowers, rivers— Blue horizons, extensive and boundless plains, is not likely to do us good. If I had any, I should be far from rejecting them, said Planchet, but possessing only this little cemetery, full of flowers, so moss-grown, shady, and quiet, I am contented with it, and I think of those who live in town, on the Rue des Lombards, for instance, and who have to listen to the rumbling of a couple of thousand vehicles every day, and to the soulless tramp, tramp, tramp of a hundred and fifty thousand foot passengers— but living, said Porthos, living, remember that. That is exactly the reason, said Planchet timidly, why I feel it does me good to contemplate a few dead. Upon my word, said D'Artagnan, that fellow Planchet is a born philosopher as well as a grocer. Monsieur, said Planchet, I am one of those good-humoured sort of men whom heaven created for the purpose of living a certain span of days, and of considering all good that they meet with during their transitory stay on earth. D'Artagnan sat close to the window, 
and as there seemed to be something substantial in Planchet's philosophy, he mused it over. "'Ah, ah, Sir Planchet, if I am not mistaken, we are going to have a representation now, for I think I heard something like chanting.' "'Yes,' said D'Artagnan, "'I hear singing, too.' "'Oh, it is only a burial of a very poor description,' said Planchet disdainfully. "'The officiating priest, the beadle, and the one Chorster boy, nothing more. "'You observe, monsieur, that the defunct lady or gentleman could not have been of very high rank.' "'No, no one seems to be following the coffin.' "'Yes,' said Porthos, "'I see a man.' "'You are right, a man wrapped in a cloak,' said D'Artagnan. "'It is not worth looking at,' said Planchet. "'I find it interesting,' said D'Artagnan, leaning on the window-sill. "'Come, come, you are beginning to take a fancy to this already,' said Planchet delightedly. "'It is exactly my own case. I was so melancholy at first that I could do nothing but make the sign of the cross all day, and the chants were like so many nails being driven into my head. But now they lull me to sleep, and no bird I have ever seen or heard can sing better than those which are met with in this cemetery.' Well, said Porthos, this is beginning to get a little dull for me, and I prefer going downstairs. Planchet, with one bound, was beside his guest, whom he offered to lead into the garden. What, said Porthos to D'Artagnan, as he turned round, are you going to remain here? Yes, I will join you presently. Well, Monsieur D'Artagnan is right, after all, said Planchet. Are they not beginning to bury yet? Not yet. Ah, yes, the grave digger is waiting until the cords are fastened round the bier. But, see, a woman has just entered the cemetery at the other end. Yes, yes, my dear Planchet, said D'Artagnan quickly. Leave me, leave me, I feel I am beginning already to be much comforted by my meditations, so do not interrupt me. Planchet left, and D'Artagnan remained, devouring with his eager gaze from behind the half-closed blinds what was taking place before him. The two bearers of the corpse had unfastened the straps by which they carried the litter, and were letting their burden glide gently into the open grave. At a few paces distant, a man with a cloak wrapped around him, the only spectator of this melancholy scene, was leaning with his back against a large cypress tree, and kept his face and person entirely concealed from the grave diggers and the priests. The corpse was buried within five minutes. The grave having been filled up, the priests turned away, and the grave digger, having addressed a few words to them, followed them as they moved away. The man in the mantle bowed as they passed him, and put a piece of gold in the grave digger's hand. Mardu, murmured D'Artagnan, it is Aramis himself. Aramis, in fact, remained alone, on that side at least, for hardly had he turned his head when a woman's footsteps and the rustling of her dress were heard on the path close to him. He immediately turned around, took off his hat with the most ceremonious respect. He led the lady under the shelter of some walnut and lime trees, which overshadowed a magnificent tomb. "'Ah, who would have thought it?' said D'Artagnan. "'The Bishop of Vannes at a rendezvous? He is still the same Abbe Aramis as he was at nuis le sec "'Yes,' he added, after a pause, "'but it is in a cemetery. The rendezvous is sacred.' but he almost laughed. The conversation lasted for fully half an hour. D'Artagnan could not see the lady's face, for she kept her back turned toward him, but he saw perfectly well by the erect attitude of both the speakers, by their gestures, by the measured and careful manner which they had glanced at each other, either by way of attack or defense, that they must be conversing about any other subject than of love. At the end of the conversation, the lady rose and bowed profoundly to Aramis. Oh, oh, said D'Artagnan, this rendezvous finishes like one of very tender nature, though. The cavalier kneels at the beginning, the young lady by and by gets tamed down, and then it is she who has to supplicate. Who is this lady? I would give anything to ascertain. It seemed impossible, however, for Aramis was the first to leave, and the lady carefully concealed her head and face, and then immediately departed. D'Artagnan could hold out no longer. He ran to the window which looked along the Rue de Léon and saw Aramis entering the inn. The lady was proceeding in quite the opposite direction, it seemed, in fact, to be about to rejoin the equipage consisting of two horses and a carriage, which he could see standing close to the borders of the forest. She was walking slowly with her head bent down, absorbed in the deepest meditation. Mardu, Mardu, I must and will learn who that woman is, said the musketeer again, and then, without further deliberation, he set off in pursuit of her, 
As he was going alone, he tried to think how he could possibly contrive to make her raise her veil. She is not young, he said, and is a woman of high rank in society. I ought to know that figure and peculiar style of walk. As he ran, the sound of his spurs and of his boots upon the hard ground of the street made a strange jingling noise, a fortunate circumstance in itself, which he was far from reckoning upon. The noise disturbed the lady. She seemed to fancy she was being either followed or pursued, which is indeed the case, and turned round. D'Artagnan started as if he had received a charge of small shot into his legs, and turning suddenly round as if he were going back the same way as he come, he murmured, Madame de Chevreuse? D'Artagnan would not go home until he had learnt everything. He asked Celestine to inquire of the gravedigger whose body it was that they had buried that morning. A poor Franciscan mendicant friar replied the latter, who had not even a dog to love him in this world, and to accompany him to his last resting place. If that were really the case, thought D'Artagnan, we should not have found Aramis present at the funeral. The Bishop of Vannes is not precise. Chapter Seven of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Seven. How Porthos, Truchen, and Planchet parted with each other on friendly terms thanks to d'artagnan there was good living in planchet's house porthos broke a ladder and two cherry trees stripped the raspberry bushes and was only unable to succeed in reaching the strawberry beds on account as he said of his belt truchen who had become quite sociable with the giant said that it was not the belt so much as his corporation and porthos in a state of the highest delight embraced truchen who gathered him a pailful of the strawberries and made him eat them out of her hands d'artagnan who arrived in the midst of these little innocent flirtations scolded porthos for his indolence and silently pitied planchet porthos breakfasted with a very good appetite and when he had finished he said looking at truchen i could make myself very happy here truchen smiled at his remark and so did planchet but not without embarrassment. D'Artagnan then addressed Porthos. You must not let the delights of Capua make you forget the real object of our journey to Fontainebleau. My presentation to the king? Certainly. I am going to take a turn in the town to get everything ready for that. Do not think of leaving the house, I beg. Oh, no, exclaimed Porthos. Planchet looked at D'Artagnan nervously. Will you be away long? he inquired. No, my friend, and this very evening I will release you from two troublesome guests. Oh, Monsieur d'Artagnan, can you say? No, no, you are a noble-hearted fellow, but your house is very small. Such a house, with half a dozen acres of land, would be fit for a king and make him very happy too. But you were not born a great lord. No more was Monsieur Porthos, murmured Planchet. But he has become so, my good fellow. His income has been a hundred thousand francs a year for the last twenty years, and for the last fifty years Porthos has been the owner of a couple of fists and a backbone, which are not to be matched throughout the whole realm of France. Porthos is a man of the very greatest consequence compared to you, and, well, I need say no more, for I know you are an intelligent fellow. No, no, monsieur, explain what you mean. Look at your orchard, how stripped it is, how empty your larder, your bedstead broken, your cellar almost exhausted. Look, too, at Madame Truchen. Oh, my goodness gracious, said Planchet. Madame Truchen is an excellent person, continued D'Artagnan, but keep her for yourself, do you understand? And he slapped him on the shoulder. Planchet at this moment perceived Porthos and Truchen sitting close together in an arbor. Truchen, with a grace of manner, peculiarly flemish 
was making a pair of earrings for Porthos out of a double cherry, while Porthos was laughing as amorously as Samson in the company of Delilah. Planchet pressed D'Artagnan's hand and ran towards the door. We must do Porthos the justice to say that he did not move as they approached, and, very likely, did not think he was doing any harm. Nor, indeed, did Truchen move, either, which rather put Planchet out. But he, too, had been so accustomed to see fashionable folk in his shop that he found no difficulty in putting a good countenance on what seemed disagreeable or rude. Planchet seized Porthos by the arm and proposed to go and look at the horses, but Porthos pretended he was tired. Planchet then suggested that the Baron du Vallon should taste some noyau of his own manufacturer, which was not to be equalled anywhere, an offer the Baron immediately accepted, and in this way Planchet managed to engage his enemy's attention during the whole day, by dint of sacrificing his cellar in preference to his amour propre. Two hours afterwards D'Artagnan returned. "'Everything is arranged,' he said. "'I saw His Majesty at the very moment he was setting off for the chase. "'The King expects us this evening.' "'The King expects me?' cried Porthos, drawing himself up. "'It is a sad thing to have to confess, "'but a man's heart is like an ocean billow, "'for from that very moment Porthos ceased to look at Madame Truchen "'in that touching manner which had so softened her heart.' Planchet encouraged these ambitious leanings as best as he could, or rather gave exaggerated accounts of all the splendours of the last reign, its battles, sieges, and grand court ceremonies. He spoke of the luxurious display which the English made, the prizes the three brave companions carried off, and how D'Artagnan, who at the beginning had been the humblest of the four, finished by becoming the leader. He fired Porthos with a general feeling of enthusiasm, by reminding him of his early youth now passed away. He boasted as much as he could of the moral life his great lord had led, and how religiously he respected the ties of friendship. He was eloquent and skilful in his choice of subjects. He tickled Porthos, frightened Truchen, and made D'Artagnan think. At six o'clock the musketeer ordered the horses to be brought round, and told Porthos to get ready. He thanked Planchet for his kind hospitality, whispered a few words about a post he might succeed in obtaining for him at court, which immediately raised Planchet in Truchen's estimation, where the poor grocer, so good, so generous, so devoted, had become much lowered ever since the appearance and comparison with him of the two great gentlemen. Such, however, is a woman's nature. They are anxious to possess what they have not got, and disdain it as soon as it is acquired. After having rendered this service to his friend Planchet, D'Artagnan said in a low tone of voice to Porthos, "'That is a very beautiful ring you have on your finger.' "'It is worth three hundred pistoles,' said Porthos. "'Madame Truchen will remember you better if you leave her that ring,' replied D'Artagnan, a suggestion which Porthos seemed to hesitate to adopt." "'You think it is not beautiful enough, perhaps?' said the musketeer. "'I understand your feelings. "'A great lord such as you would not think of accepting the hospitality of an old servant "'without paying him most handsomely for it. "'But I am sure that Planchet is too good-hearted a fellow "'to remember that you have an income of a hundred thousand francs a year.' "'I have more than half a mind,' said Porthos, flattered by the remark, "'to make Madame Truchon a present of my little farm at Brassieux. It has twelve acres. It is too much, my good Porthos, too much just at present. Keep it for a future occasion. He then took the ring off Porthos's finger, and approaching Truchen, said to her, Madame, Monsieur le Baron hardly knows how to entreat you, out of your regard for him, to accept this little thing. Monsieur du Vallon is one of the most generous and discreet men of my acquaintance. He wished to offer you a farm that he has at Brassieux, but I dissuaded him from it. Oh, said Truchen, looking eagerly at the diamond. Monsieur le Baron, exclaimed Planchet, quite overcome. My good friend, stammered out Porthos, delighted at having been so well represented by D'Artagnan. These several exclamations, uttered at the same moment, made quite a pathetic winding up of a day which might have finished in a very ridiculous manner. 
but d'artagnan was there and on every occasion wheresoever d'artagnan exercised any control matters ended only just in the very way he wished and willed there were general embracings truchen whom the baron's munificence had restored to her proper position very timidly and blushing all the while presented her forehead to the great lord with whom she had been on such very pretty terms the evening before planchet himself was overcome by a feeling of genuine humility still in the same generosity of disposition porthos would have emptied his pockets into the hands of the cook and of celestine but d'artagnan stopped him no he said it is now my turn and he gave one pistole to the woman and two to the man and the benedictions which were showered down upon them would have rejoiced the heart of harpagon himself and have rendered even him a prodigal d'artagnan made planchet lead them to the chateau and introduce porthos in chapter eight of louisa de la valiere this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 8. The Presentation of Porthos at Court. At seven o'clock the same evening, the king gave an audience to an ambassador from the United Provinces in the Grand Reception Room. The audience lasted a quarter of an hour, his majesty afterwards received those who had been recently presented together with a few ladies who paid their respects first in one corner of the salon concealed behind a column porthos and d'artagnan were conversing together waiting until their turn arrived have you heard the news inquired the musketeer of his friend no well look then porthos raised himself on tiptoe and saw monsieur fouquet in full court dress leading aramis toward the king aramis said porthos presented to the king by monsieur fouquet ah ejaculated porthos for having fortified belle isle continued d'artagnan and i you oh you as i have already had the honor of telling you are the good-natured kind-hearted porthos and so they begged you to take care of saint mon a little ah repeated porthos but happily i was there said d'artagnan and presently it will be my turn at this moment fouquet addressed the king sire he said i have a favor to solicit of your majesty monsieur d'herblay is not ambitious but he knows when he can be of service your majesty needs a representative at rome who would be able to exercise a powerful influence there may i request a cardinal's hat for monsieur d'herblay the king started i do not often solicit anything of your majesty said fouquet that is a reason certainly replied the king who always expressed any hesitation he might have in that manner and to which remark there was nothing to say in reply fouquet and aramis looked at each other the king resumed monsieur de blay can serve us equally well in france an archbishopric for instance sire objected fouquet with a grace of manner peculiarly his own your majesty overwhelms monsieur d'herblay the archbishopric may in your majesty's extreme kindness be conferred in addition to the hat the one does not exclude the other the king admired the readiness which he displayed and smiled saying d'artagnan himself could not have answered better he had no sooner pronounced the name than d'artagnan appeared did your majesty call me he said aramis and fouquet drew back a step as if they were about to retire will your majesty allow me said d'artagnan quickly as he led forward porthos to present to your majesty monsieur le baron du vallon 
one of the bravest gentlemen of France. As soon as Aramis saw Porthos, he turned as pale as death, while Fouquet clenched his hands under his ruffles. D'Artagnan smiled blandly at both of them, while Porthos bowed, visibly overcome before the royal presence. Porthos here? murmured Fouquet in Aramis's ear. Hush! Deep treachery at work, hissed the latter. Sire, said D'Artagnan, it is more than six years ago I ought to have presented Monsieur du Vallon to your majesty. But certain men resemble stars. They move not one inch unless their satellites accompany them. The Pleiades are never disunited, and that is the reason I have selected, for the purpose of presenting him to you, the very moment when you would see Monsieur d'Herblay by his side. Aramis almost lost countenance. He looked at D'Artagnan with a proud, haughty air, as though willing to accept the defiance the latter seemed to throw down. "'Ah, these gentlemen are good friends, then,' said the king. "'Excellent friends, sire. The one can answer for the other. Ask Monsieur de Vannes now in what manner Belle Isle was fortified.' Fouquet moved back a step. Belle Isle, said Aramis coldly, was fortified by that gentleman, and he indicated Porthos with his hand, who bowed a second time. Louis could not withhold his admiration, though at the same time his suspicions were aroused. Yes, said D'Artagnan, but ask Monsieur le Baron whose assistance he had in carrying the works out. Aramis's, said Porthos frankly, and he pointed to the bishop. What the deuce does all this mean? thought the bishop. And what sort of a termination are we to expect to this comedy? What? exclaimed the king. Is the cardinal's, I mean this bishop's, name Aramis? His nom de guerre, said D'Artagnan. My nickname, said Aramis. A truce to modesty, exclaimed D'Artagnan. Beneath the priest's robe, sire, is concealed the most brilliant officer, a gentleman of the most unparalleled intrepidity, and the wisest theologian in your kingdom. Louis raised his head. And an engineer also, it appears, he said, admiring Aramis's calm, imperturbable self-possession. An engineer for a particular purpose, sire, said the latter. My companion in the musketeers, sire, said D'Artagnan, with great warmth of manner, the man who has more than a hundred times aided your father's ministers by his advice. Monsieur d'Herblay, in a word, who, with Monsieur du Vallon, myself, and Monsieur le Comte de la Ferre, who is known to your majesty, formed that quartet which was a good deal talked about during the late king's reign, and during your majesty's minority. And who fortified Belle Isle, the king repeated in a significant tone. Aramis advanced and bowed, in order to serve the son as I served the father. D'Artagnan looked very narrowly at Aramis while he uttered these words, which displayed so much true respect, so much warm devotion, such entire frankness and sincerity, that even he, D'Artagnan, the eternal doubter, he, the almost infallible in judgment, was deceived by it. A man who lies cannot speak in such a tone as that, he said. Louis was overcome by it. In that case, he said to Fouquet, who anxiously awaited the result of this proof, the cardinal's hat is promised. Monsieur d'Herblay, I pledge you my honor that the first promotion shall be yours. Thank Monsieur Fouquet for it. Colbert overheard these words, they stung him to the quick, and he left the salon abruptly. "'And you, Monsieur de Vallon,' said the king, "'what have you to ask? I am truly pleased to have it in my power to acknowledge the services of those who were faithful to my father.' "'Sire,' began Porthos, but he was unable to proceed with what he was going to say. "'Sire,' exclaimed D'Artagnan, this worthy gentleman is utterly overpowered by your majesty's presence he who so valiantly sustained the looks and the fire of a thousand foes but knowing what his thoughts are i who am more accustomed to gaze upon the sun 
can translate them. He needs nothing, absolutely nothing. His sole desire is to have the happiness of gazing upon your majesty for a quarter of an hour. You shall sup with me this evening, said the king, saluting Porthos with a gracious smile. Porthos became crimson from delight and pride. The king dismissed him, and D'Artagnan pushed him into the adjoining apartment after he had embraced him warmly. Sit next to me at table, said Porthos in his ear. Yes, my friend. Aramis is annoyed with me, I think. Aramis has never liked you so much as he does now. Fancy, it was I who was the means of his getting the cardinal's hat. Of course, said Porthos. By the by, does the king like his guests to eat much at his table? It is a compliment to himself if you do, said D'Artagnan. Chapter 9 of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 9 Explanations. Aramis cleverly managed to effect a diversion for the purpose of finding D'Artagnan and Porthos. He came up to the latter, behind one of the columns, and, as he pressed his hand, said, So you have escaped from my prison. Do not scold him, said D'Artagnan. It was I, dear Aramis, who set him free. Ah, my friend, replied Aramis, looking at Porthos, could you not have waited with a little more patience? D'Artagnan came to the assistance of Porthos, who already began to breathe hard, in sore perplexity. You see, you members of the church are great politicians. We mere soldiers come at once to the point. The facts are these. I went to pay Bazamou a visit. Aramis pricked up his ears at this announcement. Stay, said Porthos. You make me remember that I have a letter from Bazamou for you, Aramis and Porthos held out the bishop the letter we have already seen. Aramis begged to be allowed to read it, and read it without D'Artagnan feeling in the slightest degree embarrassed by the circumstance that he was so well acquainted with the contents of it. Besides, Aramis's face was so impenetrable that D'Artagnan could not but admire him more than ever. After he had read it, he put the letter into his pocket with the calmest possible air. "'You were saying, Captain?' he observed. "'I was saying,' continued the musketeer, "'that I have gone to pay Bazamou a visit on His Majesty's service.' "'On His Majesty's service?' said Aramis. "'Yes,' said D'Artagnan, "'and naturally enough we talked about you and our friends. "'I must say that Bazamou received me coldly, "'so I soon took my leave of him.' As I was returning, a soldier accosted me, and said, no doubt, as he recognized me, notwithstanding I was in private clothes, Captain, will you be good enough to read me the name written on this envelope? And I read, To Monsieur du Vallon, at Monsieur Fouquet's house, saint Mande. The deuce, I said to myself, Porthouse has not returned then, as I fancied to Belle Isle, or to Pierre Fons, but is at Monsieur Fouquet's house, at saint Mande, and as Monsieur Fouquet is not at saint Mande, Porthos must be quite alone, or at all events with Aramis. I will go and see Porthos, and I accordingly went to see Porthos. Very good, said Aramis thoughtfully. You never told me that, said Porthos. I had no time, my friend. And you brought back Porthos with you to Fontainebleau? Yes, to Planchet's house. Does Planchet live at Fontainebleau? inquired Aramis. Yes, near the cemetery, said Porthos thoughtfully. What do you mean by near the cemetery? asked Aramis suspiciously. Come, thought the musketeer, since there is to be a squabble, let us take advantage of it. 
"Yes, the cemetery," said Porthos. "Planchet is a very excellent fellow, who makes very excellent preserves; but his house has windows which look out upon the cemetery, and a confoundedly melancholy prospect it is. So this morning " "This morning?" asked Aramis, more and more excited. D'Artagnan turned his back to them, and walked to the window, where he began to play a march upon one of the panes of glass. "Yes, this morning we saw a man buried there. Ah! very depressing, was it not? I should never be able to live in a house where burials can always be seen from the window. D'Artagnan, on the contrary, seems to like it very much. So D'Artagnan saw it as well? Not simply saw it, he literally never took his eyes off the whole time. Aramis started, and turned to look at the musketeer, but the latter was engaged in earnest conversation with San Anon. Aramis continued to question Porthos, and when he had squeezed all the juice out of this enormous lemon, he threw the peel aside. He turned toward his friend D'Artagnan, and clapping him on the shoulder when Saint Agnon had left him, the king's supper having been announced, said, D'Artagnan, yes, my dear fellow, he replied, we do not sup with his majesty, I believe. We do. Can you give me ten minutes' conversation? Twenty, if you like. His majesty will take quite that time to get properly seated at table. Where shall we talk, then? Here, upon these seats, if you like. The king has left, we can sit down, and the apartment is empty. Let us sit down, then. They sat down, and Aramis took one of D'Artagnan's hands in his. Tell me candidly, my dear friend, whether you have not counseled Porthos to distrust me a little. I admit I have, but not as you understand it. I saw that Porthos was bored to death, and I wished, by presenting him to the king, to do for him and for you what you would never do for yourselves. What is that? Speak in your own praise. And you have done it most nobly. I thank you. And I brought the cardinal's hat a little nearer, just as it seemed to be retreating from you. Ah, I admit that, said Aramis, with a singular smile. You are indeed not to be matched for making your friends' fortunes for them. You see, then, that I only acted with the view of making Porthos's fortune for him. I meant to have done that myself, but your arm reaches further than ours. It was now D'Artagnan's turn to smile. Come, said Aramis, we ought to deal truthfully with each other. Do you still love me, D'Artagnan? The same as I used to do, replied D'Artagnan, without compromising himself too much by this reply. In that case, thanks. And now, for the most perfect frankness, said Aramis, you visited Belle Isle on behalf of the king? Pardieu! You wish to deprive us of the pleasure of offering Belle Isle completely fortified to the king. But before I could deprive you of that pleasure, I ought to have been made acquainted with your intention of doing so. You came to Belle Isle without knowing anything? Of you, yes. How the devil could I imagine that Aramis had become so clever an engineer as to be able to fortify like Polybius or Archimedes? true and yet you smelt me out over yonder oh yes and porthos too i did not divine that aramis was an engineer i was only able to guess that porthos might have become one there is a saying one becomes an orator one is born a poet but it has never been said one is born porthos and one becomes an engineer your wit is always amusing said aramis coldly well i will go on do when you found out our secret you made all the haste you could to communicate it to the king i certainly made as much haste as i could since i saw that you were making still more when a man weighing two hundred and fifty pounds as porthos does rides post when a gouty prelate i beg your pardon but you yourself told me you were so when a prelate scours the highway, I naturally suppose that my two friends, who did not wish to be communicative with me, 
had certain matters of the highest importance to conceal from me, and so I made as much haste as my leanness and the absence of gout would allow. Did it not occur to you, my dear friend, that you might be rendering Porthos and myself a very sad service? Yes, I thought it not unlikely, but you and Porthos made me play a very ridiculous part at Belle Isle. I beg your pardon, said Aramis. Excuse me, said D'Artagnan. So that, pursued Aramis, you now know everything? No, indeed. You know I was obliged to inform Monsieur Fouquet of what had happened, in order that he would be able to anticipate what you might have to tell the king. That is rather obscure. Not at all. Monsieur Fouquet has his enemies. You will admit that, I suppose. Certainly. And one in particular. A dangerous one? A mortal enemy. Well, in order to counteract that man's influence, it was necessary that Monsieur Fouquet should give the king a proof of his great devotion to him, and of his readiness to make the greatest sacrifices. He surprised his majesty by offering him Belle Isle. If you had been the first to reach Paris, the surprise would have been destroyed. It would have looked as if we had yielded to fear. I understand. That is the whole mystery, said Aramis, satisfied that he had at last quite convinced the musketeer. Only, said the latter, it would have been more simple to have taken me aside and said to me, My dear D'Artagnan, we are fortifying Belle Isle and intend to offer it to the king. Tell us frankly for whom you are acting. Are you a friend of Monsieur Colbert or of Monsieur Fouquet? Perhaps I should not have answered you, but you would have added, Are you my friend? I should have said, Yes. Aramis hung down his head. In this way, continued D'Artagnan, you would have paralyzed my movements. And I should have gone to the king and said, Sire, Monsieur Fouquet is fortifying Belle Isle, and exceedingly well, too. But here is a note which the governor of Belle Isle gave me for your majesty. Or, Monsieur Fouquet is about to wait upon your majesty to explain his intentions with regard to it. And I should not have been placed in an absurd position. You would have enjoyed the surprise so long planned, and we should not have had any occasion to look askant at each other when we met. While, on the contrary, replied Aramis, you have acted altogether as one friendly to Monsieur Colbert. And you really are a friend of his, I suppose. Certainly not, indeed, exclaimed the captain. Monsieur Colbert is a mean fellow, and I hate him as I used to hate Mazarin, but without fearing him. Well, then, said Aramis, I love Monsieur Fouquet, and his interests are mine. You know my position. I have no property or means whatever. Monsieur Fouquet gave me several livings, a bishopric as well. Monsieur Fouquet has served and obliged me like the generous-hearted man he is, and I know the world sufficiently well to appreciate a kindness when I meet with one. Monsieur Fouquet has won my regard, and I have devoted myself to his service. You could not possibly do better you will find him a very liberal master. Aramis bit his lips, and then said, The best a man could possibly have. He then paused for a minute, D'Artagnan taking good care not to interrupt him. I suppose you know how Porthos got mixed up in all this? No, said D'Artagnan. I am curious, of course, but I never question a friend when he wishes to keep a secret from me. Well, then, I will tell you. It is hardly worth the trouble, if the confidence is to bind me in any way. Oh, do not be afraid, there is no man whom I love better than Porthos, because he is so simple-minded and good-natured. Porthos is so straightforward in everything. Since I have become a bishop, I have looked for these primeval natures, which make me love truth and hate intrigue. D'Artagnan stroked his mustache, but said nothing. I saw Porthos, and again cultivated his acquaintance. His own time hanging idly on his hands, his presence recalled my earlier and better days, 
without engaging me in any present evil. I sent for Porthos to come to Vannes. Monsieur Fouquet, whose regard for me is very great, having learnt that Porthos and I attached to each other by old ties of friendship, promised him increase of rank at the earliest promotion, and that is the whole secret. I shall not abuse your confidence, said D'Artagnan. I am sure of that, my dear friend. No one has a finer sense of honor than yourself. I flatter myself that you are right, Aramis. And now, and here the prelate looked searchingly and scrutinizingly at his friend, now let us talk of ourselves and for ourselves. Will you become one of Monsieur Fouquet's friends? Do not interrupt me until you know what that means. Well, I am listening. Will you become a marshal of France, peer, duke, and the possessor of a duchy with a million of francs? But, my friend, replied D'Artagnan, what must one do to get all that? Belong to Monsieur Fouquet. But I already belong to the king. Not exclusively, I suppose. Oh, a D'Artagnan cannot be divided. You have, I presume, ambitions, as noble hearts like yours have. Yes, certainly I have. Well? Well, I wish to be a marshal. The king will make me a marshal, duke, peer. The king will make me all that. Aramis fixed a searching look upon D'Artagnan. Is not the king master? said D'Artagnan. No one disputes it, but Louis the Thirteenth was master also. Oh, my dear friend, between Richelieu and Louis the Thirteenth stood no D'Artagnan, said the musketeer very quietly. There are many stumbling blocks round the king, said Aramis. Not for the king's feet. Very likely not. Still. One moment, Aramis, I observe that every one thinks of himself and never of his poor prince. I will maintain myself maintaining him. And if you meet with ingratitude, the weak alone are afraid of that. You are quite certain of yourself? I think so. Still, the king may some day have no further need for you. On the contrary, I think his need of me will soon be greater than ever. And hearken, my dear fellow, if it became necessary to arrest a new conde, who would do it? This, this alone in France. And D'Artagnan struck his sword, which clanked sullenly on the tessellated floor. You are right, said Aramis, turning very pale, and then he rose and pressed D'Artagnan's hand. That is the last summons for supper, said the captain of the musketeers. Will you excuse me? Aramis threw his arm round the musketeer's neck and said, A friend like you is the highest jewel in the royal crown, and they immediately separated. I was right, mused D'Artagnan. There is indeed something strangely serious stirring. We must hasten the explosion, breathed the coming cardinal, for dark. Chapter 10 of Louise de la Vallière. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick. Louise de la Vallière by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 10. Madame and de Guiche. It will not be forgotten how Comte de Guiche left the Queen Mother's apartments on the day when Louis the Fourteenth presented la Vallière with the beautiful bracelets he had won in the lottery. The comte walked to and fro for some time outside the palace, in the greatest distress, from a thousand suspicions and anxieties with which his mind was beset. Presently he stopped and waited on the terrace opposite the grove of trees, watching for Madame's departure. More than half an hour passed away, and as he was at that moment quite alone, the comte could hardly have had any very diverting ideas at his command. He drew his tables from his pocket, and, after hesitating over and over again, determined to write these words. Madame, I implore you to grant me one moment's conversation. 
do not be alarmed at this request which contains nothing in any way opposed to the profound respect with which i subscribe myself etc etc he had signed and folded this singular love-letter when he suddenly observed several ladies leaving the chateau and afterwards several courtiers too in fact almost every one that formed the queen's circle he saw la valliere herself then montalais walking with malicorne he watched the departure of the very last of the numerous guests that had a short time before thronged the queen mother's cabinet madame herself had not yet passed she would be obliged however to cross the courtyard in order to enter her own apartments and from the terrace where he was standing de guiche could see all that was going on in the courtyard at last he saw madame leave attended by a couple of pages who were carrying torches before her she was walking very quickly as soon as she reached the door she said let some one go and look for de guiche he has to render an account of the mission he had to discharge for me if he should be disengaged request him to be good enough to come to my apartment de guiche remained silent hidden in the shade but as soon as madame had withdrawn he darted from the terrace down the steps and assumed a most indifferent air so that the pages who were hurrying towards his rooms might meet him ah it is madame then who is seeking me he said to himself quite overcome and he crushed in his hand the now worse than useless letter monsieur le comte said one of the pages approaching him we are indeed most fortunate in meeting you why so messieurs a command from madame from madame said de guiche looking surprised yes monsieur le comte her royal highness has been asking for you she expects to hear she told us the result of a commission you had to execute for her are you at liberty i am quite at her royal highness's orders will you have the goodness to follow us then when de guiche entered the princess's apartments he found her pale and agitated montalais was standing at the door evidently uneasy about what was passing in her mistress's mind de guiche appeared ah is that you monsieur de guiche said madame come in i beg mademoiselle de montalais i do not require your attendance any longer montalais more puzzled than ever curtsied and withdrew de guiche and the princess were left alone the comte had every advantage in his favour it was madame who had summoned him to a rendezvous but how was it possible for the comte to make use of this advantage madame was so whimsical and her disposition so changeable she soon allowed this to be perceived for suddenly opening the conversation she said well have you nothing to say to me he imagined she must have guessed his thoughts he fancied for those who are in love are thus constituted being as credulous and the blind as poets or prophets he fancied she knew how ardent was his desire to see her and also the subject uppermost in his mind yes madame he said and i think it very singular the affair of the bracelets she exclaimed eagerly you mean that i suppose yes madame and you think the king is in love do you not de guiche looked at her for some time her eyes sank under his gaze which seemed to read her very heart i think he said that the king may possibly have had an idea of annoying some one were it not for that the king would hardly show himself so earnest in his attention as he is he would not run the risk of compromising for mere thoughtlessness of disposition a young girl against whom no one has hitherto been able to say a word indeed the bold shameless girl said the princess haughtily i can positively assure your royal highness said de guiche with a firmness marked by great respect that madame de la valliere is beloved by a man who merits every respect for he is a brave and honourable gentleman bragelonne my friend yes madame well and though he is your friend what does that matter to the king the king knows that bragelonne is affianced to mademoiselle de la valliere and as raoul has served the king most valiantly the king will not inflict an irreparable injury upon him madame began to laugh in a manner that produced a sinister impression upon de guiche i repeat madame do not believe the king is in love with mademoiselle de la valliere and the proof that i do not believe it is that i was about to ask you whose a more propre it is likely the king is desirous of wounding you who are well acquainted with the whole court can perhaps assist me in ascertaining that and assuredly with greater sincerity since it is everywhere said that your royal highness is on very friendly terms with the king madame bit her lips and unable to assign any good and sufficient reasons changed the conversation prove to me she said fixing on him one of those looks in which the whole soul seems to pass into the eyes 
prove to me, I say, that you intend to interrogate me at the very moment I sent for you. De Guiche gravely drew from his pocket the now crumpled note that he had written, and showed it to her. Sympathy, she said. Yes, said the comte, with an indescribable tenderness of tone. Sympathy. I have explained to you how and why I sought you. You, however, have yet to tell me, madame, why you have sent for me. True, replied the princess. She hesitated, then suddenly exclaimed, Those bracelets will drive me mad. You expected the king would offer them to you, replied de Guiche. Why not? But before you, madame, before you, his sister-in-law, was there not the queen herself to whom the king should have offered them? Before La Valliere, cried the princess, wounded to the quick, could he not have presented them to me? Was there not the whole court, indeed, to choose from? I assure you, madame, said the comte respectfully, that if any one heard you speak in this manner, if any one were to see how red your eyes are, and, heaven forgive me, to see, too, the tear trembling on your eyelids, it would be said that your royal highness was jealous. Jealous, said the princess haughtily, jealous of La Valliere. She expected to see de Guiche yield beneath her scornful gesture and her proud tone, but he simply and boldly replied, Jealous of La Valliere, yes, madame. Am I to suppose, monsieur, she stammered out, that your object is to insult me? It is not possible, madame, replied the comte, slightly agitated, but resolved to master that fiery nature. Leave the room, said the princess, thoroughly exasperated, de Guiche's coolness and silent respect having made her completely lose her temper. De Guiche fell back a step, bowed slowly, but with great respect, drew himself up, looked as white as his lace cuffs, and, in a voice slightly trembling, said, "'It was hardly worth while to have hurried here to be subjected to this unmerited disgrace.' And he turned away with hasty steps. He had scarcely gone half a dozen paces when Madame darted like a tigress after him, seized him by the cuff, and, making him turn round again, said, trembling with passion as she did so, "'The respect you pretend to have is more insulting than the insult itself. Insult me, if you please, but at least speak.' "'Madame,' said the comte gently, as he drew his sword, thrust this blade into my heart rather than kill me by degrees. At the look he fixed upon her, a look full of love, resolution, and despair even, she saw how readily the comte, so outwardly calm in appearance, would pass his sword through his own breast if she added another word. She tore the blade from his hands, and, pressing his arm with a feverish impatience, which might pass for tenderness, said, "'Do not be too hard upon me, comte. You see how I am suffering.' and yet you have no pity for me. Tears, the cries of this strange attack, stifled her voice. As soon as de Guiche saw her weep, he took her in his arms and carried her to an armchair. In another moment she would have been suffocated. Oh, why, he murmured, as he knelt by her side, why do you conceal your troubles from me? Do you love any one? Tell me. It would kill me, I know, but not until I should have comforted, consoled, and served you even. And do you love me to that extent? she replied, completely conquered. I do indeed love you to that extent, madame. She placed both her hands in his. My heart is indeed another's, she murmured in so low a tone that her voice could hardly be heard. But he heard it and said, Is it the king you love? She gently shook her head, and her smile was like a clear bright streak in the clouds, through which after the tempest has passed one almost fancies paradise is opening. But, she added, there are other passions in a high-born heart. Love is poetry, but the real life of the heart is pride. Comte, I was born on a throne. I am proud and jealous of my rank. Why does the king gather such unworthy objects round him? Once more, I repeat, said the Comte, you are acting unjustly towards that poor girl, who will one day be my friend's wife. Are you simple enough to believe that, Comte? If I did not believe it, he said, turning very pale, Bragelon should be informed of it to-morrow. Indeed he should, if I thought that poor La Valliere had forgotten the vow she had exchanged with Raoul. But no, it would be cowardly to betray a woman's secret. It would be criminal to disturb a friend's peace of mind. "'You think, then,' said the princess, with a wild burst of laughter, "'that ignorance is happiness?' "'I believe it,' he replied. "'Prove it to me, then,' she said hurriedly. "'It is easily done, madame.' It is reported through the whole court that the king loves you, and that you return his affection. Well, she said, breathing with difficulty, well, 
admit for a moment that raoul my friend had come to me and said to me yes the king loves madame and has made an impression upon her heart i possibly should have slain raoul it would have been necessary said the princess with the obstinacy of a woman who feels herself not easily overcome for monsieur de bragelonne to have had proofs before he ventured to speak to you in that manner such however is the case replied de guiche with a deep sigh that not having been warned i have never examined into the matter seriously and now i find that my ignorance has saved my life so then you drive selfishness and coldness to that extent said madame that you would let this unhappy young man continue to love la valliere i would until la valliere's guilt were revealed but the bracelets well madame since you yourself expected to receive them from the king what can i possibly say the argument was a telling one and the princess was overwhelmed by it and from that moment her defeat was assured but as her heart and mind were instinct with noble and generous feelings she understood de guiche's extreme delicacy she saw that in his heart he really suspected that the king was in love with la valliere and that he did not wish to resort to the common expedient of ruining a rival in the mind of a young woman by giving the latter the assurance and certainty that this rival's affections were transferred to another woman she guessed that his suspicions of la valliere were aroused and that in order to leave himself time for his convictions to undergo a change so as not to ruin louise utterly he was determined to pursue a certain straightforward line of conduct she could read so much real greatness of character and such true generosity of disposition in her lover that her heart really warmed with affection towards him whose passion for her was so pure and delicate despite his fear of incurring her displeasure de guiche by retaining his position as a man of proud independence of feeling and deep devotion became almost a hero in her estimation and reduced her to the state of a jealous and little-minded woman she loved him for this so tenderly that she could not refuse to give him a proof of her affection see how many words we have wasted she said taking his hand suspicions anxieties mistrust sufferings i think we have enumerated all those words alas madame yes efface them from your heart as i drive them from mine whether la valliere does or does not love the king and whether the king does or does not love la valliere from this moment you and i will draw a distinction in the two characters i have to perform you open your eyes so wide i am sure you hardly understand me you are so impetuous madame that i always tremble at the fear of displeasing you and see how he trembles now poor fellow she said with the most charming playfulness of manner yes monsieur i have two characters to perform i am the sister of the king the sister-in-law of the king's wife in this character ought i not to take an interest in these domestic intrigues come tell me what you think as little as possible madame agreed monsieur but it is a question of dignity and then you know i am the wife of the king's brother de guiche sighed a circumstance she added with an expression of great tenderness which will remind you that i am always to be treated with the profoundest respect de guiche fell at her feet which he kissed with the religious fervor of a worshipper and i begin to think that really and truly i have another character to perform i was almost forgetting it name it oh name it said de guiche i am a woman she said in a voice lower than ever and i love he rose she opened her arms and their lips met a footstep was heard behind the tapestry and mademoiselle de montalais appeared what do you want said madame monsieur de guiche is wanted replied montalais who was just in time to see the Chapter Eleven of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Eleven. Montalais and Malicorne. Montalais was right. Monsieur de Guiche, thus summoned in every direction, was very much exposed, from such a multiplication of business, to the risk of not attending to any. It so happened that, considering the awkwardness of the interruption, Madame, notwithstanding her wounded pride and secret anger, could not, for the moment at least, reproach Montalais for having violated, in so bold a manner, the semi-royal order in which she had been dismissed on de Guiche's entrance. 
de guiche also lost his presence of mind or it would have been more correct to say had already lost it before montalais's arrival for scarcely had he heard the young girl's voice then without taking leave of madame as the most ordinary politeness required even between persons equal in rank and station he fled from her presence his heart tumultuously throbbing and his brain on fire leaving the princess with one hand raised as though to bid him adieu montalais was at no loss therefore to perceive the agitation of the two lovers the one who fled was agitated and the one who remained was equally so well murmured the young girl as she glanced inquisitively round her this time at least i think i know as much as the most curious woman could possibly wish to know madame felt so embarrassed by this inquisitorial look that as if she heard montalais's muttered side remark she did not speak a word to her maid of honour but casting down her eyes retired at once to her bedroom montalais observing this stood listening for a moment and then heard madame lock and bolt the door by this she knew that the rest of the evening was at her own disposal and making behind the door which had just been closed a gesture which indicated but little real respect for the princess she went down the staircase in search of malicorne who was very busily engaged at the moment in watching a courier who covered with dust had just left for the comte de guiche's apartments montalais knew that malicorne was engaged in a manner of some importance she therefore allowed him to look round and stretch out his neck as much as he pleased and it was only when malicorne had resumed his natural position that she touched him on the shoulder well said montalais what is the latest intelligence you have monsieur de guiche is in love with madame fine news truly i know something more recent than that well what do you know that madame is in love with monsieur de guiche the one is the consequence of the other not always my good monsieur is that remark intended for me present company always excepted thank you said malicorne oh, well and in the other direction what is stirring the king wished this evening after the lottery to see mademoiselle de la valliere well and has he seen her no indeed what do you mean by that the door was shut and locked so that so that the king was obliged to go back again looking very sheepish like a thief who has forgotten his crowbar good and in the third place inquired montalais the courier who has just arrived for de guiche came from monsieur de bragelonne excellent said montalais clapping her hands together why so because we have work to do if we get weary now something unlucky will be sure to happen we must divide the work then said malicorne in order to avoid confusion nothing easier replied montalais three intrigues carefully nursed and carefully encouraged will produce one with another and taking a low average three love letters a day oh exclaimed malicorne shrugging his shoulders you cannot mean what you say darling three letters a day that may do for sentimental common people a musketeer on duty a young girl at a convent may exchange letters with their lovers once a day perhaps from the top of a ladder or through a hole in the wall a letter contains all the poetry their poor hearts have to boast of but the cases we have in hand require to be dealt with very differently well finish said montalais out of patience with him some one may come finish why i am only at the beginning i have still three points as yet untouched upon my word he will be the death of me with his flemish indifference exclaimed montalais and you will drive me mad with your italian vivacity i was going to say that our lovers here will be writing volumes to each other but what are you driving at at this not one of our lady correspondents will be able to keep the letters they may receive very likely monsieur de guiche will not be able to keep his either that is probable very well then i will take care of all that that is the very thing that is impossible said malicorne why so because you are not your own mistress your room is as much la valliere's as your own and there are certain persons who will think nothing of visiting and searching a maid of honour's room so that i am terribly afraid of the queen who is as jealous as a spaniard of the queen mother who is as jealous as a couple of spaniards and last of all of madame herself who has jealousy enough for ten spaniards you forget some one else who monsieur i was only speaking of the women let us add them up we will call monsieur number one de guiche number two the vicomte de bragelonne number three and the king the king number four of course the king who not only will be more jealous but more powerful than all the rest put together ah my dear well into what a wasp's nest you have thrust yourself 
and as yet not quite far enough, if you will follow me into it. Most certainly I will follow you where you like. Yet— Well, yet— While we have the time, I think it will be prudent to turn back. But I, on the contrary, think the wisest course to take is to put ourselves at once at the head of all these intrigues. You will never be able to do it. With you, I could superintend ten of them. I am in my element, you must know. I was born to live at the court, as the salamander is made to live in the fire. Your comparison does not reassure me in the slightest degree in the world, my dear Montalais. I have heard it said, and by learned men, too, that in the first place there are no salamanders at all, and that, if there had been any, they would have been infallibly baked or roasted on leaving the fire. Your learned men may be very wise as far as salamanders are concerned, but they would never tell you what I can tell you, namely, that our de Montalais is destined, before a month is over, to become the first diplomatist in the court of France. Be it so, but on the condition that I shall be the second. Agreed. An offensive and defensive alliance, of course. Only be very careful of any letters. I will hand them to you as I receive them. What shall we tell the king about madame? That madame is still in love with his majesty. What shall we tell madame about the king? That she would be exceedingly wrong not to humor him. What shall we tell La Vallière about madame? Whatever we choose, for La Vallière is in our power. How so? Every way. What do you mean? In the first place, through the Vicomte de Bragelon. Explain yourself. You do not forget, I hope, that Monsieur de Bragelon has written many letters to Mademoiselle de la Vallière? I forget nothing. Well, then, it was I who received, and I who intercepted those letters. And, consequently, it is you who have them still? Yes. Where? Here? Oh, no, I have them safe at Blois, in the little room you know well enough. That dear little room, that darling little room, the antechamber of the palace I intend you to live in one of these days. But, I beg your pardon, you said all those letters are in that little room? Yes. Did you not put them in a box? Of course, in the same box where I put all the letters I received from you, and where I put mine also when your business or your amusements prevented you from coming to our rendezvous. Ah, very good, said Malicorne. Why are you satisfied? "'Because I see there is a possibility of not having to run to Blois after the letters, for I have them here.' "'You have brought the box away?' "'It was very dear to me, because it belonged to you.' "'Be sure and take care of it, for it contains original documents that will be of priceless value by and by.' "'I am perfectly well aware of that, indeed, and that is the very reason why I laugh as I do, and with all my heart, too.' "'And now, one last word.' "'Why last?' Do we need any one to assist us? No one. Valets or maidservants? Bad policy. You will give the letters. You will receive them. We must have no pride in this affair. Otherwise, Monsieur Malicorne and Mademoiselle R., not transacting their own affairs themselves, will have to make up their minds to see them done by others. You are quite right. But what is going on yonder in Monsieur de Guiche's room? Nothing. He is only opening his window. Let us be gone and they both immediately disappeared, all the terms of the contract being agreed on. The window just opened was, in fact, that of the Comte de Guiche. It was not alone with the hope of catching a glimpse of Madame through her curtains that he seated himself by the open window, for his preoccupation of mind had, at that time, a different origin. He had just received, as we had already stated, the courier who had been dispatched to him by Bragelon, the latter having written to de Guiche a letter which made the deepest impression upon him, and which he had read over and over again. "'Strange, strange,' he murmured. "'How irresponsible are the means by which destiny hurries men onward to their fate!' Leaving the window in order to approach nearer to the light, he once more read the letter he had just received. "'Calais. My dear Count, I found Monsieur de Wardes at Calais. He has been seriously wounded in an affair with the Duke of Buckingham.' De Wardes is, as you know, unquestionably brave, but full of malevolent and wicked feelings. He conversed with me about yourself, for whom he says he has a warm regard, also about Madame, whom he considers a beautiful and amiable woman. He has guessed your affection for a certain person. He also talked to me about the lady for whom I have so ardent a regard, and showed the greatest interest on my behalf in expressing a deep pity for me, accompanied, however, by dark hints which alarmed me at first, but which I at last looked upon as the result of his unusual love of mystery. These are the facts. He had received news of the court, 
You will understand, however, that it was only through Monsieur de Lorraine. The report goes, so says the news, that a change has taken place in the king's affections. You know whom that concerns. Afterwards, the news continues, people are talking about one of the maids of honor, respecting whom various slanderous reports are being circulated. These vague phrases have not allowed me to sleep. I have been deploring, ever since yesterday, that my diffidence and vacillation of purpose, notwithstanding a certain obstinacy of character I may possess, have left me unable to reply to these insinuations. In a word, M. de Wardes was setting off for Paris, and I did not delay his departure with explanations, for it seemed rather hard, I confess, to cross-examine a man whose wounds are hardly yet closed. In short, he travelled by short stages, as he was anxious to leave, he said, in order to be present at a curious spectacle the court cannot fail to offer within a short time. He added a few congratulatory words accompanied by vague sympathising expressions. I could not understand the one any more than the other. I was bewildered by my own thoughts, and tormented by a mistrust of this man, a mistrust which, you know better than any one else, I have never been able to overcome. As soon as he left, my perceptions seemed to become clearer. It is hardly possible that a man of de Wardes's character should not have communicated something of his own malicious nature to the statement he made to me. It is not unlikely, therefore, that in the strange hints de Wardes threw out in my presence there may be a mysterious signification, which I might have some difficulty in applying either to myself or to someone with whom you are acquainted. Being compelled to leave as soon as possible in obedience to the king's commands, the idea did not occur to me of running after de Wardes in order to ask him to explain his reserve but I have dispatched a courier to you with this letter, which will explain in detail my various doubts. I regard you as myself. You have reflected and observed. It will be for you to act. M. de Wardes will arrive very shortly. Endeavour to learn what he meant, if you do not already know. M. de Wardes, moreover, pretended that the Duke of Buckingham left Paris on the very best of terms with Madame. This was an affair which would have unhesitatingly made me draw my sword, had I not felt I was under the necessity of dispatching the king's mission before undertaking any quarrel whatsoever. Burn this letter, which Olivant will hand you. Whatever Olivant says, you may confidently rely on. Will you have the goodness, my dear Comte, to recall me to the remembrance of Mademoiselle de la Vallière, whose hands I kiss with the greatest respect? Your devoted de Bragelonne. P.S. If anything serious should happen, we should be prepared for everything. Dispatch a courier to me with this one single word. Come, and I will be in Paris within six and thirty hours after the receipt of your letter. De Guiche sighed, folded up the letter a third time, and, instead of burning it as Raoul had recommended him to do, placed it in his pocket. He felt it needed reading over and over again. How much distress of mind, yet what sublime confidence he shows, murmured the Comte. He has poured out his whole soul in this letter. He says nothing of the Comte de la Fere, and speaks of his respect for Louise. He cautions me on my own account, and entreats me on his. Ah, continued de Guiche, with a threatening gesture, you interfere in my affairs, Monsieur de Wardes, do you? Very well, then, I will shortly occupy myself with yours. As for you, poor Raoul, you who entrust your heart to my keeping, be assured I will watch over it. With this promise— De Guiche begged Malicorne to come immediately to his apartments, if possible. Malicorne acknowledged the invitation with an activity which was the first result of his conversation with Montalais. And when De Guiche, who thought that his motive was undiscovered, cross-examined Malicorne, the latter, who appeared to be working in the dark, soon guessed his questioner's motives. The consequence was that after a quarter of an hour's conversation, during which de Guiche thought he had ascertained the whole truth with regard to La Valliere and the king, he had learned absolutely nothing more than his own eyes had already acquainted him with, while Malicorne learned, or guessed, that Raoul, who was absent, was fast becoming suspicious, and that de Guiche intended to watch over the treasure of the Hesperides. Malicorne accepted the office of dragon. De Guiche fancied he had done everything for his friend, and soon began to think of nothing but his personal affairs. The next evening, de Wardes's return and first appearance at the king's reception was announced. When that visit had been paid, the convalescent waited on Monsieur de Guiche. Chapter 12 of Louisa de la Valliera. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliera by Alexander Dumas. 
Chapter Twelve: How De Wardes Was Received at Court. Monsieur had received De Wardes with that marked favor light and frivolous minds bestow on every novelty that comes in their way. De Wardes, who had been absent for a month, was like fresh fruit to him. To treat him with marked kindness was an infidelity to old friends and there is always something fascinating in that moreover it was a sort of reparation to de wardes himself nothing consequently could exceed the favorable notice monsieur took of him the chevalier de lorraine who feared this rival but a little but who respected a character and disposition only to parallel to his own in every particular with the addition of a bulldog courage he did not himself possess received de wardes with a greater display of regard and affection than even monsieur had done de guiche as we have said was there also but kept in the background waiting very patiently until all these interchanges were over de wardes while talking to the others and even to monsieur himself had not for a moment lost sight of de guiche who he instinctively felt was there on his account as soon as he had finished with the others he went up to de guiche they exchanged the most courteous compliments after which de wardes returned to monsieur and the other gentlemen in the midst of these congratulations madame was announced she had been informed of de wardes arrival and knowing all the details of his voyage and duel she was not sorry to be present at the remarks she knew would be made without delay by one who she felt assured was her personal enemy two or three of her ladies accompanied her de wardes saluted madame in the most graceful and respectful manner and as a commencement of hostilities announced in the first place that he could furnish the duke of buckingham's friends with the latest news about him this was a direct answer to the coldness with which madame had received him the attack was a vigorous one and madame felt the blow but without appearing to have even noticed it he rapidly cast a glance at monsieur and at de guiche the former colored and the latter turned very pale madame alone preserved an unmoved countenance but as she knew how many unpleasant thoughts and feelings her enemy could awaken in the two persons who were listening to him she smilingly bent forward towards the traveller as if to listen to the news he had brought but he was speaking of other matters madame was brave even to imprudence if she were to retreat it would be inviting an attack so after the first disagreeable impression had passed away she returned to the charge have you suffered much from your wounds monsieur de wardes she inquired for we have been told that you had the misfortune to get wounded it was now de wardes turn to whence he bit his lips and replied no madame hardly at all indeed and yet in this terribly hot weather the sea breezes were very fresh and cool madame and then i had one consolation indeed what was it the knowledge that my adversary's sufferings were still greater than my own ah you mean he was more seriously wounded than you were i was not aware of that said the princess with utter indifference oh madame you are mistaken or rather you pretend to misunderstand my remark i did not say that he was a greater sufferer in body than myself but his heart was very seriously affected de guiche comprehended instinctively from what direction the struggle was approaching he ventured to make a sign to madame as if entreating her to retire from the contest but she without acknowledging de guiche's gesture without pretending to have noticed it even and still smiling continued is it possible she said that the duke of buckingham's heart was touched i had no idea until now that a heart wound could be cured alas madame replied de wardes politely 
every woman believes that and it is this belief that gives them that superiority to man which confidence begets you misunderstand altogether dearest said the prince impatiently monsieur de ward means that the duke of buckingham's heart had been touched not by the sword but by something sharper ah very good very good exclaimed madame it is a jest of monsieur de ward's very good but i should like to know if the duke of buckingham would appreciate the jest it is indeed a very great pity he is not here monsieur de ward the young man's eyes seemed to flash fire oh he said as he clenched his teeth there is nothing i should like better de guiche did not move madame seemed to expect that he would come to her assistance monsieur hesitated the chevalier de lorraine advanced and continued the conversation madame he said de ward knows perfectly well that for a buckingham's heart to be touched is nothing new and what he has said has already taken place instead of an ally i have two enemies murmured madame two determined enemies and in league with each other and she changed the conversation to change the conversation is as every one knows a right possessed by princes which etiquette requires all to respect the remainder of the conversation was moderate enough in tone the principal actors had rehearsed their parts madame withdrew easily and monsieur who wished to question her on several matters offered her his hand on leaving the chevalier was seriously afraid that an understanding might be established between the husband and wife if he were to leave them quietly together he therefore made his way to monsieur's apartments in order to surprise him on his return and to destroy with a few words all the good impressions madame might have been able to sow in his heart de guiche advanced towards de ward who was surrounded by a large number of persons and thereby indicated his wish to converse with him de ward at the same time showing by his looks and by a movement of his head that he perfectly understood him there was nothing in these signs to enable strangers to suppose they were otherwise than upon the most friendly footing de guiche could therefore turn away from him and wait until he was at liberty he had not long to wait for de ward freed from his questioners approached de guiche and after a fresh salutation they walked side by side together you have made a good impression since your return my dear de ward said the comte excellent as you see and your spirits are just as lively as ever better and a very great happiness too why not everything is so ridiculous in this world everything so absurd around us you are right you are of my opinion then i should think so and what news do you bring us from yonder i none at all i have come to look for news here but tell me you surely must have seen some people at bologna one of our friends for instance it is no great time ago some people one of our friends your memory is short ah true bragelonne you mean exactly so who was on his way to fulfil a mission with which he was entrusted to king charles the second precisely well then did he not tell you or did not you tell him i do not precisely know what i told him i must confess but i do know what i did not tell him de ward was finesse itself he perfectly well knew from de guiche's tone and manner which was cold and dignified that the conversation was about to assume a disagreeable turn he resolved to let it take what course it pleased and to keep strictly on his guard may i ask you what you did not tell him inquired de guiche all about la valliere la valliere what is it and what was that strange circumstance you seem to have known over yonder 
which Bragelonne, who was here on the spot, was not acquainted with. Do you really ask me that, in a serious manner? Nothing more so. What? You, a member of the court, living in Madame's household, a friend of Monsieur's, a guest at their table, the favorite of our lovely princess? Guiche colored violently from anger. What princess are you alluding to, he said? I am only acquainted with one, my dear fellow. I am speaking of Madame herself. Are you devoted to another princess, then? Come, tell me. De Guiche was on the point of launching out, but he saw the drift of the remark. A quarrel was imminent between the two young men. De Ward wished the quarrel to be only in Madame's name while de Guiche would not accept it except on La Valliere's account. From this moment it became a series of feigned attacks, which would have continued until one of the two had been touched home. De Guiche, therefore, resumed all the self-possession he could command. There is not the slightest question in the world of Madame in this matter, my dear de Ward, said de Guiche, but simply of what you were talking about just now what was i saying that you had concealed certain things from bragelonne certain things which you know as well as i do replied de ward no upon my honor nonsense if you tell me what they are i shall know but not otherwise i swear what i who have just arrived from a distance of sixty leagues and you who have not stirred from this place who have witnessed with your own eyes that which rumor informed me of at calais do you now tell me seriously that you do not know what is it about oh comte this is hardly charitable of you as you like de ward but i again repeat i know nothing you are truly discreet well perhaps it is very prudent of you and so you will not tell me anything will not tell me any more than you told Bragelonne. You are pretending to be deaf, I see. I am convinced that Madame could not possibly have more command over herself than you have. Double hypocrite, murmured Guiche to himself. You are again returning to the old subject. Very well, then, continued de Ward, since we find it so difficult to understand each other about La Valliere and Bragelonne, let us speak about your own affairs nay said de guiche i have no affairs of my own to talk about you have not said anything about me i suppose to bragelonne which you cannot repeat to my face no but understand me guiche that however much i may be ignorant of certain matters i am quite as conversant with others if for instance we were conversing about the intimacies of the duke of buckingham at paris as i did during my journey with the duke i could tell you a great many interesting circumstances would you like me to mention them de guiche passed his hand over his forehead which was covered in perspiration no no he said a hundred times no i have no curiosity for matters which do not concern me the duke of buckingham is for me nothing more than a simple acquaintance whilst raoul is an intimate friend i have not the slightest curiosity to learn what happened to the duke while i have on the contrary the greatest interest in all that happened to raoul in paris yes in paris or bologna you understand i am on the spot if anything should happen i am here to meet it whilst raoul is absent and has only myself to represent him so raoul's affairs before my own but he will return not however until his mission is completed in the meantime you understand evil reports cannot be permitted to circulate about him without my looking into them and for a better reason still that he will remain some time in london said de ward chuckling you think so said de guiche simply think so indeed do you suppose he was sent to london for no other purpose than to go there and return again immediately no no he was sent to london to remain there 
"'Ah, De Wardes,' said De Guiche, grasping De Wardes' hand, "'that is a very serious suspicion concerning Bragelonne, "'which completely confirms what he wrote to me from Bologna.' "'De Wardes resumed his former coldness of manner. "'His love of raillery had led him too far, "'and by his own imprudence he had laid himself open to attack. "'Well, tell me, what did he write to you about?' he inquired. "'He told me that you had artfully insinuated "'some injurious remarks against La Valliere, "'and that you had seemed to laugh at his great confidence in that young girl.' well it is perfectly true i did so said de wardes and i was quite ready at the time to hear from the vicomte de bragelonne that which every man expects from another whenever anything may have been said to displease him in the same way for instance if i were seeking a quarrel with you i should tell you that madame after having shown the greatest preference for the duke of buckingham is at this moment supposed to have sent the handsome duke away for your benefit oh that would not wound me in the slightest degree my dear de wardes said de guiche smiling notwithstanding the shiver that ran through his whole frame why such a favor would be too great a happiness i admit that but if i absolutely wished to quarrel with you i should try and invent a falsehood perhaps and speak to you about a certain arbor where you and that illustrious princess were together i should speak also of certain gratifications of certain kissings of the hand and you who are so secret on all occasions so hasty so punctilious well said de guiche interrupting him with a smile upon his lips although he almost felt as if he were going to die i swear i should not care for that nor should i in any way contradict you for you must know my dear marquis that for all matters which concern myself i am a block of ice but it is a very different thing when an absent friend is concerned a friend who on leaving confided his interest to my safe keeping for such a friend de ward believe me i am like fire itself i understand you monsieur de guiche in spite of what you say there cannot be any question between us just now either of bragelonne or of this insignificant girl whose name is la valliere at this moment some of the younger courtiers were crossing the apartment and having already heard the few words which had just been pronounced were able also to hear those which were about to follow de wardes observed this and continued aloud oh if la valliere were a coquette like madame whose innocent flirtations i am sure were first of all the cause of the duke of buckingham being sent back to england and afterwards were the reason of your being sent into exile for you will not deny i suppose that madame's pretty ways really had a certain influence over you the courtiers drew nearer to the speakers saint agno at their head and then monicamp but my dear fellow whose fault was that said de guiche laughing i am a vain conceited fellow i know and everybody else knows it too i took seriously that which was only intended as a jest and got myself exiled for my pains but i saw my error i overcame my vanity and i obtained my recall by making the amende honorable and by promising myself to overcome this defect and the consequence is that i am so thoroughly cured that i now laugh at the very thing which three or four days ago would have almost broken my heart but raoul is in love and is loved in return he cannot laugh at the reports which disturb his happiness reports which you seem to have undertaken to interpret when you know marquis as i do as these gentlemen do as every one does in fact that all such reports are pure calumny calumny exclaimed de ward furious at seeing himself caught in the snare by de guiche's coolness of temper certainly calumny 
Look at this letter from him, in which he tells me you have spoken ill of Mademoiselle de la Valliere, and where he asks me if what you reported about this young girl is true or not. Do you wish me to appeal to these gentlemen, De Ward, to decide? And with admirable coolness, De Guiche read aloud the paragraph of the letter which referred to La Valliere. And now, continued De Guiche, there is no doubt in the world, as far as I am concerned, that you wished to disturb Bragelonne's peace of mind, and that your remarks were maliciously intended. De Ward looked round him to see if he could find support from any one but at the idea that de wardes had insulted either directly or indirectly the idol of the day every one shook his head and de wardes saw that he was in the wrong messieurs said de guiche intuitively divining the general feeling my discussion with monsieur de wardes refers to a subject so delicate in its nature that is most important no one should hear more than you have already heard close the doors then i beg you and let us finish our conversation in the manner which becomes two gentlemen one of whom has given the other the lie messieurs messieurs exclaimed those who were present is it your opinion then that i was wrong in defending mademoiselle de la valliere said de guiche in that case i pass judgment upon myself and am ready to withdraw the offensive words i may have used to monsieur de Ward the deuce certainly not said saint agno mademoiselle de la valliere is an angel virtue and purity itself said manicamp you see monsieur de wardes said de guiche i am not the only one who undertakes the defence of that poor girl i entreat you therefore messieurs a second time to leave us you see it is impossible we could be more calm and composed than we are it was the very thing the courtiers wished some went out at one door and the rest at the other and the two young men were left alone well played said de wardes to the comte was it not replied the latter how can it be wondered at my dear fellow i have got quite rusty in the country while the command you have acquired over yourself comte confounds me a man always gains something in women's society so pray accept my congratulations i do accept them and i will make madame a present of them and now my dear monsieur de wardes let us speak as loud as you please do not defy me i do defy you for you are known to be an evil-minded man if you do that you will be looked upon as a coward too and monsieur would have you hanged this evening at his window casement speak my dear de wardes speak i have fought already but not quite enough yet i see you would not be sorry to fight me while my wounds are still open no better still the deuce you are unfortunate in the moment you have chosen a duel after the one i have just fought would hardly suit me i have lost too much blood at bologna at the slightest effort my wounds would open again and you would really have too good a bargain true said de guiche and yet on your arrival here your looks and your arms showed there was nothing the matter with you yes my arms are all right but my legs are weak and then i have not had a foil in my hand since that devil of a duel and you i am sure have been fencing every day in order to carry your little conspiracy against me to a successful issue upon my honor monsieur replied de guiche it is six months since i last practised no comte after due reflection i will not fight at least with you i will await bragelonne's return since you say it is bragelonne who finds fault with me oh no indeed you shall not wait until bragelonne's return exclaimed the comte losing all command over himself for you have said that bragelonne might possibly be some time before he returns and in the meanwhile your wicked insinuations would have had their effect yet i shall have my excuse so take care i shall give you a week to finish your recovery 
That is better. We will wait a week. Yes, yes, I understand. A week will give time to my adversary to make his escape. No, no, I will not give you one day even. You are mad, monsieur, said de Wardes, retreating a step. And you are a coward if you do not fight willingly. Nay, what is more, I will denounce you to the king as having refused to fight after having insulted la valliere ah said de wardes you are dangerously treacherous though you pass for a man of honor there is nothing more dangerous than the treachery as you term it of the man whose conduct is always loyal and upright restore me the use of my legs then or get yourself bled till you are as white as i am as to equalize our chances no no i have something better than that to propose what is it we will fight on horseback and will exchange three pistol shots each you are a first-rate marksman i have seen you bring down swallows with single balls and at full gallop do not deny it for i have seen you myself i believe you are right said de wardes and as that is the case it is not unlikely i might kill you you would be rendering me a very great service if you did. I will do my best. Is it agreed? Give me your hand upon it. There it is, but on one condition, however. Name it, that not a word shall be said about it to the king. Not a word, I swear. I will go and get my horse then, and I mine. Where shall we meet? In the plain, I know an admirable place shall we go together why not and both of them on their way to the stables passed beneath madame's windows which were faintly lighted a shadow could be seen behind the lace curtains there is a woman said de wardes smiling who does not suspect that we are going Chapter 13 of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 13 The Combat. De Wade and de Guiche selected their horses and saddled them with their own hands with holster saddles. De Guiche, having two pairs of pistols, went to his apartments to get them, and after having loaded them, gave the choice to de Wade, who selected the pair he had made use of twenty times before, the same, indeed, with which de Guiche had seen him kill swallows flying. You will not be surprised, he said, if I take every precaution. You know the weapons well, and consequently I am only making the chances equal. Your remark was quite useless, replied de Guiche, and you have done no more than you are entitled to do. Now, said de Wade, I beg you to have the goodness to help me mount, for I still experience a little difficulty in doing so. In that case, we had better settle the matter on foot. No, once in the saddle, I shall be all right. Very good, then. We will not speak of it again, said de Guiche, as he assisted de Wade to mount his horse. And now, continued the young man, in our eagerness to murder one another, we have neglected one circumstance. What is that? That it is quite dark, and we shall almost be obliged to grope about in order to kill oh said de guiche you are as anxious as i am that everything should be done in the proper order yes but i do not wish people to say that you have assassinated me any more than supposing i were to kill you i should myself like to be accused of such a crime did any one make a similar remark about your duel with the duke of buckingham said de guiche it took place precisely under the same conditions as ours very true but there was still light enough to see by and we were up to our middles almost in the water besides there were a good number of spectators on shore looking at us 
De Guiche reflected for a moment, and the thought which had already presented itself to him became more confirmed, that De Wardes wished to have witnesses present in order to bring back the conversation about Madame, and to give a new turn to the combat. He avoided saying a word in reply, therefore, and as De Wardes once more looked at him interrogatively, he replied by a movement of the head that it would be best to let things remain as they were. The two adversaries consequently set off and left the chateau by the same gate, close to which we may remember to have seen Montalais and Malicon together. The night, as if to counteract the extreme heat of the day, had gathered the clouds together in masses which were moving slowly along from the west to the east. The vault above, without a clear spot anywhere visible, or without the faintest indication of thunder, seemed to hang heavily over the earth, and soon began, by the force of the wind, to split into streamers like a huge sheet torn to shreds. Large and warm drops of rain began to fall heavily, and gathered the dust into globules which rolled along the ground. At the same time, the hedges, which seemed conscious of the approaching storm, the thirsty plants, the drooping branches of the trees, exhaled a thousand aromatic odors, which revived in the mind tender recollections, thoughts of youth, endless life, happiness, and love. How fresh the earth smells, said de Watt. It is a piece of coquetry to draw us to her. By the by, replied de Guiche, several ideas have just occurred to me, and I wish to have your opinion upon them. Relative to? Relative to our engagement. It is quite some time, in fact, that we should begin to arrange matters. Is it to be an ordinary combat, and conducted according to established custom? Let me first know what your established custom is that we dismount in any particular open space that may suit us fasten our horses to the nearest object meet each without our pistols in our hands and afterwards retire for a hundred and fifty paces in order to advance on each other very good that is precisely the way in which i killed poor foliva three weeks ago at saint denis i beg your pardon but you forgot one circumstance what is that that in your duel with foliva you advanced towards each other on foot your swords between your teeth and your pistols in your hands true while now on the contrary as you cannot walk you yourself admit that we shall have to mount our horses again and charge and the first who wishes to fire will do so that is the best course no doubt but it is quite dark we must make allowances for more missed shots than would be the case in the daytime. Very well, each will fire three times, the pair of pistols already loaded, and one reload. Excellent! Where shall our engagement take place? Have you any preference? No. You see that small wood which lies before us? The wood which is called Rochin? Exactly. You know it? Perfectly you know that there is an open glade in the center yes well this glade is admirably adapted for such a purpose with a variety of roads by paths paths ditches windings and avenues we could not find a better spot i am perfectly satisfied if you are so we are at our destination if i am not mistaken yes look at the beautiful open space in the center the faint light which the stars afford seems concentrated in this spot the woods which surround it seem with their barriers to form its natural limits very good do as you say let us first settle the conditions these are mine if you have any objection to make you will state it i am listening if the horse be killed its rider will be obliged to fight on foot that is a matter of course since we have no change of horses here but that does not oblige his adversary to dismount his adversary will in fact be free to act as he likes the adversaries having once met in close contact cannot quit each other under any circumstances and may consequently fire muzzle the muzzle 
agreed three shots and no more will do i suppose quite sufficient i think here are powder and balls for your pistols measure out three charges take three balls i will do the same then we will throw the rest of the powder and balls away and we will solemnly swear said de wide that we have neither balls nor powder about us agreed and i swear it said de guiche holding his hand towards heaven a gesture which de wade imitated and now my dear comte said de wade allow me to tell you that i am in no way your dupe you already are or soon will be the accepted lover of madame i have detected your secret and you are afraid i shall tell others of it you wish to kill me to ensure my silence that is very clear and in your place i should do the same de guiche hung down his head only continued de wade triumphantly was it really worth while tell me to throw this affair of bragelonne's on my shoulders but take care my dear fellow in bringing the wild boar to bay you enrage him to madness in running down the fox you endow him with the ferocity of the jaguar the consequence is that brought to bay by you i shall defend myself to the very last you will be quite right to do so yes but take care i shall work more harm than you think in the first place as a beginning you will readily suppose that i have not been absurd enough to lock up my secret or your secret rather in my own breast there is a friend of mine who resembles me in every way a man whom you know very well who shares my secret with me so pray understand that if you kill me my death will not have been of much service to you whilst on the contrary if i kill you and everything is possible you know you understand de guiche shuddered if i kill you continued de wad you will have secured two mortal enemies to madame who will do their very utmost to ruin her oh monsieur exclaimed de guiche furiously do not reckon upon my death so easily of the two enemies you speak of i trust most heartily to dispose of one immediately and the other at the earliest opportunity the only reply de wade made was a burst of laughter so diabolical in its sound that a superstitious man would have been terrified but de guiche was not so impressionable as that i think he said that everything is now settled monsieur de wardes so have the goodness to take your place first unless you would prefer me to do so by no means said de wade i shall be delighted to save you the slightest trouble and spurring his horse to a gallop he crossed the wide open space and took his stand at the point of the circumference of the cross-road immediately opposite to where de guiche was stationed de guiche remained motionless at this distance of a hundred paces the two adversaries were absolutely invisible to each other being completely concealed by the thick shade of elms and chestnuts a minute elapsed amidst the profoundest silence at the end of the minute each of them in the deep shade in which he was concealed heard the double click of the trigger as they put the pistols on full cock de guiche adopting the usual tactics put his horse to a gallop persuaded that he should render his safety doubly sure by the movement as well as by the speed of the animal he directed his course in a straight line towards the point where in his opinion de wade would be stationed and he expected to meet de wade about halfway but in this he was mistaken he continued his course presuming that his adversary was impatiently awaiting his approach when however he had gone about two-thirds of the distance he beheld the trees suddenly illuminated and a ball flew by cutting the plume of his hat in two nearly at the same moment and as if the flash of the first shot had served to indicate the direction of the other a second report was heard and a second ball passed through the head of de guiche's horse a little below the ear the animal fell these two reports proceeding from the very opposite direction in which he expected to find de wade surprised him a great deal but as he was a man of amazing self-possession he prepared himself for his horse falling but not so completely however that the toe of his boot escaped being caught under the animal as it fell 
very fortunately the horse in its dying agonies moved so as to enable him to release the leg which was less entangled than the other de guiche rose felt himself all over and found that he was not wounded at the very moment he had felt the horse tottering under him he placed his pistols in the holsters afraid that the force of the fall might explode one at least if not both of them by which he would have been disarmed and left utterly without defence once on his feet he took the pistols out of the holsters and advanced toward the spot where by the light of the flash he had seen de wad appear de wad had at the first shot accounted for the manoeuvre than which nothing could have been simpler instead of advancing to meet de guiche or remaining in his place to await his approach de wad had for about fifteen paces followed the circle of the shadow which hid him from his adversary's observation and at the very moment when the latter presented his flank in his career he had fired from the place where he stood taking careful aim and assisted instead of being inconvenienced by the horse's gallop it has been seen that notwithstanding the darkness the first ball passed hardly more than an inch above de guiche's head de wad had so confidently relied upon his aim that he thought he had seen de guiche fall his astonishment was extreme when he saw he still remained erect in his saddle he hastened to fire his second shot but his hand trembled and he killed the horse instead it would be a most fortunate chance for him if de guiche were to remain held fast under the animal before he could have freed himself de wad would have loaded his pistol and had de guiche at his mercy but de guiche on the contrary was up and had three shots to fire de guiche immediately understood the position of affairs it would be necessary to exceed de wad in rapidity of execution he advanced therefore so as to reach him before he should have had time to reload his pistol de wad saw him approaching like a tempest the ball was rather tight and offered some resistance to the ramrod to load carelessly would be simply to lose his last chance to take the proper care in loading meant fatal loss of time or rather throwing away his life he made his horse bound on one side de guiche turned round also and at the moment the horse was quiet again fired and the ball carried off de wad's hat from his head de wad now knew that he had a moment's time at his own disposal he availed himself of it in order to finish loading his pistol de guiche noticing that his adversary did not fall threw the pistol he had just discharged aside and walked straight toward de wad elevating the second pistol as he did so he had hardly proceeded more than two or three paces when de wad took aim at him as he was walking and fired an exclamation of anger was de guiche's answer the comte's arm contracted and dropped motionless by his side and the pistol fell from his grasp his anxiety was excessive i am lost murmured de wad he is not mortally wounded at the very moment however de guiche was about to raise his pistol against de wad the head shoulders and limbs of the comte seemed to collapse he heaved a deep-drawn sigh tottered and fell at the feet of de wad's horse that is all right said de wad and gathering up the reins he struck his spurs into the horse's sides the horse cleared the comte's motionless body and bore de wad rapidly back to the chateau when he arrived there he remained a quarter of an hour deliberating within himself as to the proper course to be adopted in his impatience to leave the field of battle he had omitted to ascertain whether de guiche were dead or not a double hypothesis presented itself to de wad's agitated mind either de guiche was killed or de guiche was wounded only if he were killed why should he leave his body in that manner to the tender mercies of the wolves it was a perfectly useless piece of cruelty for if de guiche were dead he certainly could not breathe a syllable of what had passed if he were not killed why should he de wad in leaving him there uncared for allow himself to be regarded as a savage incapable of one generous feeling this last consideration determined his line of conduct de wad immediately instituted inquiries after manicom he was told that manicom had been looking after de guiche 
and not knowing where to find him had retired to bed the wad went and awoke the sleeper without any delay and related the whole affair to him which manicom listened to in perfect silence but with an expression of momentarily increasing energy of which his face could hardly have been supposed capable it was only when the wad had finished that manicom uttered the words let us go as they proceeded manicom became more and more excited and in proportion as the wad related the details of the affair to him his countenance assumed every moment a darker expression and so he said when the wad had finished you think he is dead alas i do and you fought in that manner without witnesses he insisted upon it it is very singular what do you mean by saying it is singular that it is very unlike m de guiche's disposition you do not doubt my word i suppose hum hum you do doubt it then a little but i shall doubt it more than ever i warn you if i find the poor fellow is really dead monsieur manicom monsieur de wad it seems you intend to insult me just as you please the fact is i never did like people who come and say i have killed such and such a gentleman in a corner it is a great pity but i killed him in a perfectly honourable manner it has an ugly appearance monsieur de wad silence we have arrived in fact the glade could now be seen and in the open space lay the motionless body of the dead horse to the right of the horse upon the dark grass with his face against the ground the poor comte lay bathed in his blood he had remained in the same spot and did not even seem to have made the slightest movement manicom threw himself on his knees lifted the comte in his arms and found him quite cold and steeped in blood he let him gently fall again then stretching out his hand and feeling all over the ground close to where the comte lay he sought until he found de guiche's pistol by heaven he said rising to his feet pale as death and with the pistol in his hand you are not mistaken he is quite dead dead repeated de wad yes and his pistol is still loaded added manicom looking into the pan but i told you that i took aim as he was walking towards me and fired at him at the very moment he was going to fire at me are you quite sure that you fought with him monsieur de wad i confess that i am very much afraid it has been a foul assassination nay nay no exclamations you have had your three shots and his pistol is still loaded you have killed his horse and he de guiche one of the best marksmen in france has not touched even either your horse or yourself well monsieur de wad you have been very unlucky in bringing me here all the blood in my body seems to have mounted to my head and i verily believe that since so good an opportunity presents itself i shall blow your brains out on the spot so monsieur de wad recommend yourself to heaven monsieur manicom you cannot think of such a thing on the contrary i am thinking of it very strongly would you assassinate me without the slightest remorse at least for the present are you a gentleman i have given a great many proofs of that let me defend my life then at least very likely in order i suppose that you may do to me what you have done to poor de guiche and manicom slowly raised his pistol to the height of de wad's breast and with arms stretched out and a fixed determined look on his face took a careful aim de wad did not attempt a flight he was completely terrified in the midst however of this horrible silence which lasted about a second but which seemed an age to de wad a faint sigh was heard oh exclaimed de wad he still lives help de guiche i am about to be assassinated manicom fell back a step or two and the two young men saw the comte raise himself slowly and painfully upon one hand manicom threw the pistol away a dozen paces and ran to his friend uttering a cry of delight de wad wiped his forehead which was covered with a cold perspiration it was just in time he murmured where are you hurt inquired manicom of de guiche and whereabouts are you wounded de guiche showed him his mutilated hand and his chest covered with blood 
comte exclaimed de wad i am accused of having assassinated you speak i implore you and say that i fought loyally perfectly so said the wounded man monsieur de wad fought quite loyally and whoever says the contrary will make an enemy of me then sir said manicamp assist me in the first place to carry this gentleman home and i will afterwards give you every satisfaction you please or if you are in a hurry you can do better still let us staunch the blood from the comte's wounds here with your pocket-handkerchief and mine and then as there are two shots left we can have them between us thank you said de wad twice already in one hour i have seen death too close at hand to be agreeable i don't like his look at all and i prefer your apologies manicamp burst out laughing and guiche too in spite of his sufferings the two young men wished to carry him but he declared he felt quite strong enough to walk alone the ball had broken his ring finger and his little finger and then had glanced along his side but without penetrating deeply into his chest it was the pain rather than the seriousness of the wound therefore which had overcome de guiche manicamp passed his arm under one of the count's shoulders and duade did the same with the other and in this way they brought him back to fontainebleau to the house of the same doctor who had been present Chapter Fourteen of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Fourteen. The King's Supper. The king, while these matters were being arranged, was sitting at the supper table, and the not very large number of guests for that day had taken their seats too, after the usual gesture intimating the royal permission. At this period of Louis the Fourteenth's reign, although etiquette was not governed by the strict regulations subsequently adopted, the French court had entirely thrown aside the traditions of good fellowships and patriarchal affability existing in the time of henry the fourth which the suspicious mind of louis the thirteenth had gradually replaced with pompous state and ceremony which he despaired of being able fully to realize the king therefore was seated alone at a small separate table which like the desk of a president overlooked the adjoining tables although we say a small table we must not omit to add that this small table was the largest one there moreover it was the one on which were placed the greatest number and quantity of dishes consisting of fish game meat fruit vegetables and preserves the king was young and full of vigor and energy very fond of hunting addicted to all violent exercises of the body possessing besides like all members of the bourbon family a rapid digestion and an appetite speedily renewed louis the fourteenth was a formidable table companion he delighted in criticizing his cooks but when he honored them by praise and commendation the honor was overwhelming the king began by eating several kinds of soup either mixed together or taken separately he intermixed or rather separated each of the soups by a glass of old wine he ate quickly and somewhat greedily porthos who from the beginning had out of respect been waiting for a jog of d'artagnan's arm seeing the king make such rapid progress turned to the musketeer and said in a low voice it seems as if one might go on now his majesty is very encouraging from the example he sets look the king eats said d'artagnan but he talks at the same time try and manage matters in such a manner that if he should happen to address a remark to you he will not find you with your mouth full which would be very disrespectful the best way in that case said porthos is to eat no supper at all and yet i am very hungry i admit and everything looks and smells most invitingly as if appealing to all my senses at once don't think of not eating for a moment said d'artagnan 
that would put his majesty out terribly. The king has a saying that he who works well eats well, and he does not like people to eat indifferently at his table. How can I avoid having my mouth full if I eat, said Porthos. All you have to do, replied the captain of the musketeers, is simply to swallow what you have in it, whenever the king does you the honor to address a remark to you. Very good, said Porthos, and from that moment he began to eat with a certain well-bred enthusiasm. The king occasionally looked at the different persons who were at table with him, and an connoisseur could appreciate the different dispositions of his guests. Monsieur du Vallon, he said. Porthos was enjoying a salmi de lievre, and swallowed half of the back. His name, pronounced in such a manner, made him start, and by a vigorous effort of his gullet he absorbed the whole mouthful. Sire, replied Porthos, in a stifled voice, but sufficiently intelligible nevertheless, let those fillets d'agneau be handed to Monsieur du Vallon, said the king. Do you like brown meats, Monsieur du Vallon? sire i like everything replied porthos d'artagnan whispered everything your majesty sends me porthos repeated everything your majesty sends me an observation which the king apparently received with great satisfaction people eat well who work well replied the king delighted to have in tete-a-tete -tete a guest who could eat as porthos did porthos received the dish of lamb and put a portion of it on his plate well said the king exquisite said porthos calmly have you as good mutton in your part of the country monsieur du vallon continued the king sire i believe that from my own province as everywhere else the best of everything is sent to paris for your majesty's use but on the other hand i do not eat lamb in the same way your majesty does ah ah and how do you eat it generally i have a lamb dressed whole whole yes sire in what manner monsieur du vallon in this sire my cook who is a german first stuffs the lamb in question with small sausages he procures from strasbourg force meat balls from troyes and larks from pithivier by some means or other which i am not acquainted with he bones the lamb as he would do a fowl leaving the skin on however which forms a brown crust all over the animal when it is cut in beautiful slices in the same way as an enormous sausage a rose-colored gravy pours forth which is as agreeable to the eye as it is exquisite to the palate and porthos finished by smacking his lips the king opened his eyes with delight and while cutting some of the faisan au doux which was handed to him he said that is a dish i should very much like to taste monsieur du vallon is it possible a whole lamb absolutely an entire lamb sire pass those pheasants to monsieur du vallon i perceive he is an amateur the order was immediately obeyed then continuing the conversation he said and you do not find the lamb too fat no sire the fat falls down at the same time as the gravy does and swims on the surface then the servant who carves removes the fat with a spoon which i have had expressly made for that purpose where do you reside inquired the king at pierrefonds sire at pierrefonds where is that monsieur du vallon near belle isle oh no sire pierrefonds is in the Sosonnet i thought you alluded to the lamb on account of the salt marshes no sire i have marshes which are not salt it is true but which are not the less valuable on that account the king had now arrived at the entremont but without losing sight of porthos who continued to play his part in the best manner you have an excellent appetite monsieur du vallon said the king and you make an admirable guest at table ah sire if your majesty were ever to pay a visit to pierrefonds we would both of us eat our lamb together for your appetite is not an indifferent one by any means d'artagnan gave porthos a kick under the table which made porthos color up at your majesty's present happy age said porthos in order to repair the mistake he had made i was in the musketeers and nothing could ever satisfy me then 
your majesty has an excellent appetite as i have already had the honor of mentioning but you select what you eat with quite too much refinement to be called for one moment a great eater the king seemed charmed at his guest's politeness will you try some of these creams he said to porthos sire your majesty treats me with far too much kindness to prevent me speaking the whole truth pray do so monsieur du Vallon. well sire with regard to sweet dishes i only recognize pastry and even that should be rather solid all these frothy substances swell the stomach and occupy a space which seems to me to be too precious to be so badly tenanted ah gentlemen said the king indicating porthos by a gesture here is indeed a model of gastronomy it was in such a manner that our fathers who so well knew what good living was used to eat while we added his majesty do nothing but tantalize with our stomachs and as he spoke he took the breast of a chicken with ham while porthos attacked a dish of partridges and quails the cup-bearer filled his majesty's glass give monsieur du vallon some of my wine said the king this was one of the greatest honors of the royal table d'artagnan pressed his friend's knee if you could only manage to swallow the half of that boar's head i see yonder said he to porthos i shall believe you to be a duke and peer within the next twelve months presently said porthos phlegmatically i shall come to that by and by in fact it was not long before it came to the boar's turn for the king seemed to take pleasure in urging on his guest he did not pass any of the dishes to porthos until he had tasted them himself and he accordingly took some of the boar's head Porthos showed that he could keep pace with his sovereign, and, instead of eating the half, as D'Artagnan had told him, he ate three-fourths of it. "'It is impossible,' said the king in an undertone, "'that a gentleman who eats so good a supper every day, and who has such beautiful teeth, can be otherwise than the most straightforward, upright man in my kingdom.' "'Do you hear?' said D'Artagnan in his friend's ear." yes i think i am rather in favor said porthos balancing himself on his chair oh you are in luck's way the king and porthos continued to eat in the same manner to the great satisfaction of the other guests some of whom from emulation had attempted to follow them but were obliged to give up halfway the king soon began to get flushed and the reaction of the blood to his face announced that the moment of repletion had arrived it was then that louis the fourteenth instead of becoming gay and cheerful as most good livers generally do became dull melancholy and taciturn porthos on the contrary was lively and communicative d'artagnan's foot had more than once to remind him of this peculiarity of the king the dessert now made its appearance the king had ceased to think anything further of porthos he turned his eyes anxiously towards the entrance door and he was heard occasionally to inquire how it happened that m de san agno was so long in arriving at last at the moment when his majesty was finishing a pot of preserved plums with a deep sigh san agno appeared the king's eyes which had become somewhat dull immediately began to sparkle the comte advanced towards the king's table and louis rose at his approach every one got up at the same time including porthos who was just finishing an almond cake capable of making the job chapter fifteen of louise de la valliere this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 15. After Supper. The king took Saint Agnon by the arm and passed into the adjoining apartment. What has detained you, Comte? said the king. I was bringing the answer, sire, replied the Comte she has taken a long time to reply to what i wrote her sire your majesty deigned to write in verse 
and Mademoiselle de la Valliere wished to repay your majesty in the same coin, that is to say, in gold. Verses, Saint-Agnon, exclaimed the king in ecstasy, give them to me at once, and Louis broke the seal of a little letter, enclosing the verses which history had preserved entire for us, and which are more meritorious in invention than in execution. Such as they were, however, the king was enchanted with them, and exhibited his satisfaction by unequivocal transports of delight. But the universal silence which reigned in the rooms warned Louis, so sensitively particular with regard to good breeding, that his delight must give rise to various interpretations. He turned aside and put the note in his pocket, and then advancing a few steps, which brought him again to the threshold of the door close to his guests, he said, Monsieur du Vallon, I have seen you to-day with the greatest pleasure, and my pleasure will be equally great to see you again. Porthos bowed, as the Colossus of Rhodes would have done, and retired from the room with his face towards the king. Monsieur d'Artagnan, continued the king, you will await my orders in the gallery. I am obliged to you for having made me acquainted with Monsieur du Vallon. Gentlemen, addressing himself to the other guests, I return to Paris to-morrow on account of the departure of the Spanish and Dutch ambassadors. Until to-morrow, then. The apartment was immediately cleared of the guests. The king took Saint-Agnon by the arm, made him read La Valliere's verses over again, and said, What do you think of them? Charming, sire. They charm me, in fact, as if they were known. Oh, the professional poets would be jealous of them. But it was not likely they will know anything about them. Did you give her mine? Oh, sire, she positively devoured them. They were very weak, I am afraid. That is not what Mademoiselle de la Valliere said of them. Do you think she was pleased with them? I am sure of it, sire. I must answer then. Oh, sire, immediately after supper? Your majesty will fatigue yourself. You are quite right. Study after eating is notoriously injurious. The labour of a poet especially so, and besides, there is great excitement prevailing at Mademoiselle de la Valliere's. What do you mean? With her, as with all the ladies of the court. Why? On account of poor de Guiche's accident. Has anything serious happened to de Guiche, then? Yes, sire, he has one hand nearly destroyed, a hole in his breast. In fact, he is dying. Good heavens, who told you that? Manicorn brought him back just now to the house of a doctor, here in Fontainebleau, and the rumour soon reached us all. Brought back? Poor de Guiche, how did it happen? Ah, that is the very question, how did it happen? You say that in a very singular manner, saint -Aignan. Give me the details. What does he say himself? He says nothing, sire, but others do. What others? Those who brought him back, sire. Who are they? I do not know, sire, but Monsieur de Manicon knows. Monsieur de Manicon is one of his friends. As everybody is, indeed, said the king. Oh, no, returned Saint-Agnon. You are mistaken, sire. Everyone is not precisely a friend of Monsieur de Guiche. How do you know that? Does your majesty require me to explain myself? Certainly I do. Well, sire, I believe I have heard something said about a quarrel between two gentlemen. When? This very evening, before your majesty's supper was served. That can hardly be. I have issued such stringent and severe ordinances, with respect to duelling, that no one, I presume, would dare to disobey them. In that case, heaven preserve me from excusing any one, exclaimed saint -Aignan. Your majesty commanded me to speak, and I spoke accordingly. Tell me, then, in what way the Comte de Guiche has been wounded. Sire, it is said to have been at a boar hunt. This evening? Yes, sire. One of his hands shattered and a hole in his breast. Who was at the hunt with Monsieur de Guiche? I do not know, sire. But Monsieur de Manicon knows, or ought to know. You are concealing something from me, saint -Aignan. Nothing, sire, I assure you. Then explain to me how the accident happened. Was it a musket that burst? Very likely, sire. But yet, on reflection, it could hardly have been that, for de Guiche's pistol was found close by him, still loaded. His pistol? But a man does not go to a boar hunt with a pistol, I should think. Sire, it is also said that de Guiche's horse was killed, 
and that the horse is still to be found in the wide open glade in the forest his horse guiche go on horseback to a boar hunt saint aignan i do not understand a syllable of what you have been telling me where did this affair happen at the rond point in that part of the forest called the bois rochat that will do call monsieur d'artagnan saint aignan obeyed and the musketeer entered monsieur d'artagnan said the king you will leave this place by the little door of the private staircase yes sire you will mount your horse yes sire you will proceed to the rond point du bois rochin do you know the spot yes sire i have fought there twice what exclaimed the king amazed at the reply under the edict sire of cardinal richelieu returned d'artagnan with his usual impassibility that is very different monsieur you will therefore go there and will examine the locality very carefully a man has been wounded there and you will find a horse lying dead you will tell me what your opinion is upon the whole affair very good sire as a matter of course it is your own opinion i require and not that of any one else you shall have it in an hour's time sire i prohibit your speaking with any one whoever it may be except with the person who must give me a lantern said d'artagnan ah that is a matter of course said the king laughing at the liberty which he tolerated in no one but his captain of the musketeers d'artagnan left by the little staircase now let my physician be sent for said louis ten minutes afterwards the king's physician arrived quite out of breath you will go monsieur said the king to him and accompany monsieur de saint aignan wherever he may take you you will render me an account of the state of the person you may see in the house you will be taken to the physician obeyed without a remark as at that time people began to obey louis the fourteenth and left the room preceding saint aignan do you saint aignan send manicon to Chapter Sixteen of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Sixteen. Showing in what way D'Artagnan discharged the mission with which the king had entrusted him while the king was engaged in making these last mentioned arrangements in order to ascertain the truth d'artagnan without losing a second ran to the stable took down the lantern saddled his horse himself and proceeded towards the place his majesty had indicated according to the promise he had made he had not accosted any one and as we have observed he had carried his scruples so far as to do without the assistance of the stable helpers altogether d'artagnan was one of those who in moments of difficulty pride themselves on increasing their own value by dint of hard galloping he in less than five minutes reached the wood fastened his horse to the first tree he came to and penetrated to the broad open space on foot he then began to inspect most carefully on foot and with his lantern in his hand the whole surface of the rond point went forward turned back again measured examined and after half an hour's minute inspection he returned silently to where he had left his horse and pursued his way in deep reflection and at a foot-pace to fontainebleau louis was waiting in his cabinet he was alone and with a pencil was scribbling on paper certain lines which d'artagnan at the first glance recognized as unequal and very much touched up the conclusion he arrived at was that they must be verses the king raised his head and perceived d'artagnan well monsieur he said do you bring me any news yes sire what have you seen as far as probability goes sire d'artagnan began to reply it was certainty i requested of you i will approach it as near as i possibly can the weather was very well adapted for investigations of the character i have just made 
It has been raining this evening, and the roads were wet and muddy. Well, the result, Monsieur d'Artagnan. Sire, your majesty told me that there was a horse lying dead in the crossroad of the Bois Rochin, and I began, therefore, by studying the roads. I say the roads because the centre of the crossroad is reached by four separate roads. The one that I myself took was the only one that presented any fresh traces. Two horses had followed it side by side. Their eight feet were marked very distinctly in the clay. One of the riders was more impatient than the other, for the footprints of the one were invariably in advance of the other, about half a horse's length. Are you quite sure they were travelling together? said the king. Yes, sire. The horses are two rather large animals of equal pace, horses well used to manoeuvres of all kinds, for they wheeled round the barrier of the rond-point together. Well, and after? The two cavaliers paused there for a minute, no doubt to arrange the conditions of the engagement. The horses grew restless and impatient. One of the riders spoke, while the other listened, and seemed to have contented himself by simply answering. His horse pawed the ground, which proves that his attention was so taken up by listening that he let the bridle fall from his hand. A hostile meeting did take place then? Undoubtedly. Continue. You are a very accurate observer. One of the two cavaliers remained where he was standing, the one, in fact, who had been listening. The other crossed the open space, and at first placed himself directly opposite to his adversary. The one who had remained stationary traversed the rond-point at a gallop, about two-thirds of its length, thinking that by this means he would gain upon his opponent, but the latter had followed the circumference of the wood. You are ignorant of their names, I suppose. Completely so, sire. Only he who followed the circumference of the wood was mounted on a black horse. How do you know that? I found a few hairs of his tail among the brambles which bordered the side of the ditch. Go on. As for the other horse, there can be no trouble in describing him, since he was left dead on the field of battle. And what was the cause of his death? A ball which passed through his brain. Was the ball that of a pistol or a gun? It was a pistol bullet, sire. Besides, the manner in which the horse was wounded explained to me the tactics of the man who had killed it. He had followed the circumference of the wood in order to take his adversary in flank. Moreover, I followed his foot-tracks on the grass. The tracks of the black horse, do you mean? Yes, sire. Go on, Monsieur d'Artagnan. As your majesty now perceives the position of the two adversaries, I will, for a moment, leave the cavalier who had remained stationary for the one who started off at a gallop. Do so. The horse of the cavalier who rode at full speed was killed on the spot. How do you know that? The cavalier had not time even to throw himself off his horse, and so fell with it. I observed the impression of his leg, which, with a great effort, he was enabled to extricate from under the horse. The spur, pressed down by the weight of the animal, had ploughed up the ground. Very good. And what did he do as soon as he rose up again? He walked straight up to his adversary, who still remained upon the verge of the forest. Yes, sire. Then, having reached a favourable distance, he stopped firmly, for the impression of both his heels are left in the ground quite close to each other, fired, and missed the adversary. How do you know he did not hit him? I found a hat with a ball through it. Ah, a proof, then, exclaimed the king. Insufficient, sire replied d'artagnan coldly it is a hat without any letters indicating its ownership without arms a red feather as all hats have the lace even has nothing particular in it did the man with the hat through which the bullet had passed fire a second time oh sire he had already fired twice how did you ascertain that i found the waddings of the pistol and what became of the bullet which did not kill the horse it cut in two the feather of the hat belonging to him against whom it was directed, and broke a small birch at the other end of the open glade. In that case, then, the man on the black horse was disarmed, whilst his adversary had still one more shot to fire. 
Sire, while the dismounted rider was extricating himself from his horse, the other was reloading his pistol. Only, he was much agitated while he was doing it, and his hand trembled greatly. How do you know that? Half the charge fell to the ground, and he threw the ramrod aside, not having time to replace it in the pistol. Monsieur d'Artagnan, this is marvellous, you tell me. It is only close observation, sire, and the commonest highwayman could tell as much. The whole scene is before me from the manner in which you relate it. I have, in fact, reconstructed it in my own mind, with merely a few alterations. And now, said the king, let us return to the dismounted cavalier. You were saying that he walked towards his adversary while the latter was loading his pistol. Yes, but at the very moment he himself was taking aim, the other fired. Oh, said the king, and the shot? The shot told terribly, sire. The dismounted cavalier fell upon his face after having staggered forward three or four paces. Where was he hit? In two places. In the first place, in his right hand, and then, by the same bullet, in his chest. But how could you ascertain that? inquired the king, full of admiration. By a very simple means. The butt-end of the pistol was covered with blood, and the trace of the bullet could be observed with fragments of a broken ring. The wounded man, in all probability, had the ring finger and the little finger carried off. As far as the hand goes, I have nothing to say. But the chest? Sire, there were two small pools of blood at a distance of about two feet and a half from each other. At one of these pools of blood, the grass was torn up by the clenched hand. At the other, the grass was simply pressed down by the weight of the body. Poor de Guiche, exclaimed the king. Ah, it was Monsieur de Guiche, then, said the musketeer quietly. I suspected it, but did not venture to mention it to your majesty. And what made you suspect it? I recognized the de Grammont arms upon the holsters of the dead horse. And you think he is seriously wounded? Very seriously, since he fell immediately and remained a long time in the same place. However, he was able to walk as he left the spot supported by two friends. You met him returning then? No, but I observed the footprints of three men. The one on the right and the one on the left walked freely and easily, but the one in the middle dragged his feet as he walked. Besides, he left traces of blood at every step he took. Now, monsieur, since you saw the combat so distinctly that not a single detail seems to have escaped you, tell me something about de Guiche's adversary. Oh, sire, I do not know him. And yet you see everything very clearly. Yes, sire, I see everything, but I do not tell all I see. And since the poor devil has escaped, your majesty will permit me to say that I do not intend to denounce him. And yet he is guilty since he has fought a duel, monsieur. Not guilty in my eyes, sire, said D'Artagnan coldly. Monsieur, exclaimed the king, are you aware of what you are saying? Perfectly, sire. But according to my notions, a man who fights a duel is a brave man. Such, at least, is my own opinion. But your majesty may have another. It is but natural, for you are master here. Monsieur d'Artagnan, I ordered you, however, d'Artagnan interrupted the king by a respectful gesture. You ordered me, sire, to gather what particulars I could, respecting a hostile meeting that had taken place. Those particulars you have. If you order me to arrest Monsieur de Guiche's adversary, I will do so, but do not order me to denounce him to you, for in that case I will not obey. Very well, arrest him then. Give me his name, sire. The king stamped his foot angrily, but after a moment's reflection he said, You are right, ten times, twenty times, a hundred times right. That is my opinion, sire, and I am happy that, this time, it accords with your majesty's. One more word. Who assisted Guiche? I do not know, sire. But you speak of two men. There was a person present, then a second. There was no second, sire. Nay, more than that, when Monsieur de Guiche fell, his adversary fled without giving him any assistance. The miserable coward, exclaimed the king. The consequence of your ordinances, sire. If a man has fought well and fairly, and has already escaped one chance of death, he naturally wishes to escape the second. 
Monsieur de Boothville cannot be forgotten very easily. And so men turn to cowards. No, they become prudent. And he has fled then, you say? Yes, and as far as his horse could possibly carry him. In what direction? In the direction of the chateau. Well, and after that? Afterwards, as I have had the honour of telling your majesty, two men on foot arrived who carried Monsieur de Guiche back with them. What proof have you that these men arrived after the combat? A very evident proof, sire. At the moment the encounter took place, the rain had just ceased. The ground had not had time to imbibe the moisture, and was consequently soaked. The footsteps sank in the ground. But while Monsieur de Guiche was lying there in a fainting condition, the ground became firm again, and the footsteps made a less sensible impression. Louis clapped his hands together in sign of admiration. Monsieur d'Artagnan, he said, you are positively the cleverest man in my kingdom. The identical thing Monsieur de Richelieu thought, and Monsieur de Mazarin said, sire. And now it remains for us to see if your sagacity is at fault. Oh, sire, a man may be mistaken. Humanum est arare, said the musketeer philosophically. In that case, you are not human, Monsieur d'Artagnan, for I believe you are never mistaken. Your Majesty said that we were going to see whether such was the case or not. Yes. In what way, may I venture to ask? I have sent for Monsieur de Manicon, and Monsieur de Manicon is coming. And Monsieur de Manicon knows the secret? De Guiche has no secrets from Monsieur de Manicon. D'Artagnan shook his head. No one was present at the combat, I repeat, and unless Monsieur de Manicon was one of the two men who brought him back. Hush, said the king, he is coming. Remain and listen attentively. Very good, sire. And at that very... Chapter Seventeen of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter Seventeen. The Encounter. The king signified with an imperious gesture first to the musketeer then to saint Agno, on your lives not a word d'artagnan withdrew like a sentinel to a corner of the room saint Agno, in his character of a favorite leaned over the back of the king's chair manicom with his right foot properly advanced a smile upon his lips and his white and well-formed hands gracefully disposed advanced to make his reverence to the king who returned the salutation by a bow. "'Good evening, Monsieur de Manicom,' he said. "'Your Majesty did me the honor to send for me,' said Manicom. "'Yes, in order to learn from you all the details of the unfortunate accident which has befallen the Comte de Guiche. "'Oh, sire, it is grievous indeed. "'You were there?' "'Not precisely, sire.' but you arrived on the scene of the accident a few minutes after it took place sire about half an hour afterwards and where did the accident happen i believe sire the place is called the rond ponte du borochina oh the rendezvous of the hunt the very spot sire good give me all the details you are acquainted with respecting this unhappy affair monsieur de manicom perhaps your majesty has already been informed of them and i fear to fatigue you with useless repetition no do not be afraid of that manicom looked round him he saw only d'artagnan leaning with his back against the wainscot d'artagnan calm kind and good-natured as usual and saint Agno, whom he had accompanied and who still leaned over the king's armchair with an expression of countenance equally full of good feeling he determined therefore to speak out your majesty is perfectly aware he said 
that accidents are very frequent in hunting in hunting do you say i mean sire when an animal is brought to bay ah ah said the king it was when the animal was brought to bay then that the accident happened alas sire unhappily it was the king paused for a moment before he said what animal was being hunted a wild boar sire and what could possibly have possessed guiche to go to a wild boar hunt by himself that is but a clownish idea of sport only fit for that class of people who unlike the marechal de grammont have no dogs and huntsmen to hunt as gentlemen should do manicom shrugged his shoulders youth is very rash he said sententiously well go on said the king at all events continued manicom not venturing to be too precipitate and hasty and letting his words fall very slowly one by one at all events sire poor de guiche went hunting all alone quite alone indeed what a sportsman and is not monsieur de guiche aware that the wild boar always stands at bay that is the very thing that really happened sire he had some idea then of the beast being there yes sire some peasants had seen it among their potatoes footnote potatoes were not grown in france at that time la cicla insists that the error is theirs and that dumas meant tomatoes and a footnote and what kind of animal was it a short thick beast you may as well tell me monsieur that de guiche had some idea of committing suicide for i have seen him hunt and he is an active and vigorous hunter whenever he fires at an animal brought to bay and held in check by the dogs he takes every possible precaution and yet he fires with a carbine and on this occasion he seems to have faced the boar with pistols only manicom started a costly pair of pistols excellent weapons to fight a duel with a man and not a wild boar what an absurdity there are some things sire which are difficult of explanation you are quite right and the event which we are now discussing is certainly one of them go on during the recital saint Agno, who probably would have made a sign to manicom to be careful what he was about found that the king's glance was constantly fixed upon himself so that it was utterly impossible to communicate with manicom in any way as for d'artagnan the statue of silence at athens was far more noisy and far more expressive than he manicom therefore was obliged to continue in the same way he had begun and so contrived to get more and more entangled in his explanation sire he said this is probably how the affair happened guiche was waiting to receive the boar as it rushed towards him on foot or on horseback inquired the king on horseback he fired upon the brute and missed his aim and then it dashed upon him and the horse was killed ah your majesty knows that then i have been told that a horse has been found lying dead in the crossroads of the barochin and i presume it was de guiche's horse perfectly true sire it was his well so much for the horse and now for de guiche de guiche once down was attacked and worried by the wild boar and wounded in the hand and in the chest it is a horrible accident but it must be admitted it was de guiche's own fault how could he possibly have gone to hunt such an animal merely armed with pistols he must have forgotten the fable of adonis manicom rubbed his ear in seeming perplexity very true he said it was very imprudent can you explain it monsieur manicom sire what is written is written ah you are a fatalist manicom looked very uncomfortable and ill at ease i am angry with you monsieur manicom continued the king with me sire yes how was it that you who are de guiche's intimate friend and who knew that he is subject to such acts of folly did not stop him in time manicom no longer knew what to do 
the tone in which the king spoke was anything but that of a credulous man on the other hand it did not indicate any particular severity nor did he seem to care very much about the cross-examination there was more of raillery in it than menace and you say then continued the king that it was positively de guiche's horse that was found dead quite positive sire did that astonish you no sire for your majesty will remember that at the last hunt m de saint mar had a horse killed under him and in the same way yes but that one was ripped open of course sire had de guiche's horse been ripped open like m de saint mar's horse i should not have been astonished manicom opened his eyes very wide am i mistaken resumed the king was it not in the frontal bone that de guiche's horse was struck you must admit monsieur de manicom that is a very singular place for a wild boar to attack you are aware sire that the horse is a very intelligent animal and he doubtless endeavored to defend himself but a horse defends himself with his heels and not with his head in that case the terrified horse may have slipped or fallen down said manicom and the boar you understand sire the boar oh i understand that perfectly as far as the horse is concerned but how about his rider well that too is simple enough the boar left the horse and attacked the rider and as i have already had the honor of informing your majesty shattered de guiche's hand at the very moment he was about to discharge his second pistol at him and then with a gouge of his tusk made that terrible hole in his chest nothing is more likely really monsieur de manicom you are wrong in placing so little confidence in your own eloquence and you can tell a story most admirably your majesty is exceedingly kind said manicom saluting him in the most embarrassed manner from this day henceforth i will prohibit any gentleman attached to my court going out to similar encounter really one might just as well permit duelling manicom started and moved as if he were about to withdraw is your majesty satisfied delighted but do not withdraw yet monsieur de manicom said louis i have something to say to you well well thought d'artagnan there is another who is not up to the mark and he uttered a sigh which might signify oh the men of our stamp where are they now at this moment an usher lifted up the curtain before the door and announced the king's physician ah exclaimed louis here comes m valot who has just been to see m de guiche we shall now hear news of the man maltreated by the boar manicom felt more uncomfortable than ever in this way at least added the king our conscience will be quite clear and he looked at d'artagnan Chapter 18 of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gimes. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 18 The Physician. Monsieur Valou entered. The position of the different persons present was precisely the same the king was seated saint Agno leaning over the back of his armchair d'artagnan with his back against the wall and manicom still standing well monsieur valou said the king did you obey my directions with the greatest alacrity sire you went to the doctor's house in fontainebleau yes sire and you found monsieur de guiche there i did sire what state was he in speak unreservedly in a very sad state indeed sire the wild boar did not quite devour him however devour whom de guiche what wild boar the boar that wounded him 
Monsieur de Guiche wounded by a boar? So it is said, at least. By a poacher, rather, or by a jealous husband, or an ill-used lover, who, in order to be revenged, fired upon him. What is it that you say, Monsieur Valou? Were not Monsieur de Guiche's wounds produced by defending himself against a wild boar? Monsieur de Guiche's wounds are the result of a pistol bullet that broke his ring finger and the little finger of the right hand, and afterwards buried itself in the intercostal muscles of the chest. A bullet? Are you sure Monsieur de Guiche was wounded by a bullet? exclaimed the king, pretending to look much surprised. Indeed I am, sire, so sure, in fact, that here it is and he presented to the king a half-flattened bullet, which the king looked at, but did not touch. Did he have that in his chest, poor fellow? he asked. Not precisely. The ball did not penetrate, but was flattened, as you see, either upon the trigger of the pistol, or upon the right side of the breastbone. Good heavens, said the king seriously. You said nothing to me about this, Monsieur de Manicamp sire what does all this mean then this invention about hunting a wild boar at nightfall come speak monsieur sire it seems then that you are right said the king turning round towards his captain of musketeers and that a duel actually took place the king possessed to a greater extent than any one else the faculty enjoyed by the great in power or position of compromising and dividing those beneath him. Manicom darted a look full of reproaches at the musketeer. D'Artagnan understood the look at once, and not wishing to remain beneath the weight of such an accusation, advanced a step forward and said, Sire, your majesty commanded me to go and explore the place where the crossroads meet in the Borochine and to report to you, according to my own ideas, what had taken place there. I submitted my observations to you, but without denouncing any one. It was your majesty yourself who was the first to name the Comte de Guiche. Well, monsieur, well, said the king haughtily, you have done your duty, and I am satisfied with you. But you, monsieur de Manicamp, have failed in yours, for you have told me a falsehood of falsehood sire the expression is a hard one find a more accurate then sire i will not attempt to do so i have already been unfortunate enough to displease your majesty and it will in every respect be far better for me to accept most humbly any reproaches you may think proper to address to me you are right monsieur whoever conceals the truth from me risks my displeasure sometimes sire one is ignorant of the truth no further falsehood monsieur or i double the punishment manicamp bowed and turned pale d'artagnan again made another step forward determined to interfere if the still increasing anger of the king attained certain limits you see monsieur continued the king that it is useless to deny the thing any longer monsieur de guiche has fought a duel i do not deny it sire and it would have been truly generous on your majesty's part not to have forced me to tell a falsehood forced who forced you sire monsieur de guiche is my friend your majesty has forbidden duels under pain of death a falsehood might save my friend's life and i told it good murmured d'artagnan an excellent fellow upon my word instead of telling a falsehood monsieur you should have prevented him from fighting said the king oh sire your majesty who is the most accomplished gentleman in france knows quite as well as any of us other gentlemen that we have never considered monsieur de bouville dishonored for having suffered death on the place de grave that which does in truth dishonor a man is to avoid meeting his enemy not to avoid meeting his executioner well monsieur that may be so said louis the fourteenth i am desirous of suggesting a means of your repairing all 
if it be a means of which a gentleman may avail himself i shall most eagerly seize the opportunity the name of monsieur de guiche's adversary oh oh murmured d'artagnan are we going to take louis the thirteenth as a model sire said manicamp with an accent of reproach you will not name him then said the king sire i do not know him bravo murmured d'artagnan monsieur de manicamp hand your sword to the captain manicamp bowed very gracefully unbuckled his sword smiling as he did so and handed it for the musketeer to take but saint agno advanced hurriedly between him and d'artagnan sire he said will your majesty permit me to say a word do so said the king delighted perhaps at the bottom of his heart for some one to step between him and the wrath he felt that had carried him too far manicamp you are a brave man and the king will appreciate your conduct but to wish to serve your friends too well is to destroy them manicamp you know the name the king asks you for it is perfectly true i do know it you will give it up then if i felt i ought to have mentioned it i should have already done so then i will tell it for i am not so extremely sensitive on such points of honor as you are you are at liberty to do so but it seems to me however oh a truce to magnanimity i will not permit you to go to the bastille in that way do you speak or i will manicamp was keen-witted enough and perfectly understood that he had done quite sufficient to produce a good opinion of his conduct it was now only a question of persevering in such a manner as to regain the good graces of the king speak monsieur he said to saint agno i have on my own behalf done all that my conscience told me to do and it must have been very importunate he added turning towards the king since its mandates led me to disobey your majesty's commands but your majesty will forgive me i hope when you learn that i was anxious to preserve the honor of a lady of a lady said the king with some uneasiness yes sire a lady was the cause of this duel manicamp bowed if the position of the lady in question warrants it he said i shall not complain of your having acted with so much circumspection on the contrary indeed sire everything which concerns your majesty's household or the household of your majesty's brother is of importance in my eyes in my brother's household repeated louis the fourteenth with a slight hesitation the cause of the duel was a lady belonging to my brother's household do you say or to madame's ah to madame's yes sire well and this lady is one of the maids of honor of her royal highness madame la duchesse d'orleans for whom monsieur de guiche fought do you say yes sire and this time i tell no falsehood louis seemed restless and anxious gentlemen he said turning towards the spectators of the scene will you have the goodness to retire for a moment i wish to be alone with monsieur manicamp i know he has some important communication to make for his own justification and which he will not venture before witnesses put up your sword monsieur de manicamp manicamp returned his sword to his belt the fellow decidedly has his wits about him murmured the musketeer taking saint agno by the arm and withdrawing with him he will get out of it said the latter in d'artagnan's ear and with honor too comte manicamp cast a glance of recognition at saint agno and the captain which luckily passed unnoticed by the king come come said d'artagnan as he left the room i had an indifferent opinion of the new generation well i was mistaken after all there is some good in them i perceive valu preceded the favorite and chapter nineteen of louisa de la valliera this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 19 wherein d'artagnan perceives that it was he who was mistaken and manicom who was right the king determined to be satisfied that no one was listening went himself to the door and then returned precipitately and placed himself opposite manicom and now we are alone monsieur de manicom explain yourself with the greatest frankness sire replied the young man and in the first place pray understand added the king that there is nothing to which i personally attach a greater importance than the honor of any lady that is the very reason sire why i endeavor to study your delicacy of sentiment and feeling yes i understand it all now you say that it was one of the maids of honor of my sister-in-law who was the subject of dispute and that the person in question de guiche's adversary the man in point of fact whom you will not name but whom monsieur de saint aignan will name monsieur yes you say however that this man insulted some one belonging to the household of madame yes sire mademoiselle de la valliere ah said the king as if he had expected the name and yet as if its announcement had caused him a sudden pang ah it was mademoiselle de la valliere who was insulted i did not say precisely that she was insulted sire but at all events i merely say that she was spoken of in terms far from respectful a man dares to speak in disrespectful terms of mademoiselle de la valliere and yet you refuse to tell me the name of the insulter sire i thought it was quite understood that your majesty had abandoned the idea of making me denounce him perfectly true monsieur returned the king controlling his anger besides i shall know in good time the name of this man whom i shall feel it is my duty to punish manicamp perceived that they had returned to the question again as for the king he saw he had allowed himself to be hurried away a little too far and therefore continued and i will punish him not because there is any question of mademoiselle de la valliere although i esteem her very highly but because a lady was the object of the quarrel and i intend that ladies shall be respected at my court and that quarrel shall be put a stop to altogether manicom bowed and now monsieur de manicom continued the king what was said about mademoiselle de la valliere cannot your majesty guess i your majesty can imagine the character of the jest in which young men permit themselves to indulge they very probably said that she was in love with some one the king ventured to remark probably so but mademoiselle de la valliere has a perfect right to love any one she pleases said the king that is the very point de guiche maintained and on account of which he fought do you mean yes sire the sole and only cause the king colored and you do not know anything more then in what respect sire in the very interesting respect which you are now referring to what does your majesty wish to know why the name of the man with whom la valliere is in love and whom de guiche's adversary disputed her right to love sire i know nothing i have heard nothing and have learnt nothing even accidentally but de guiche is a noble-hearted fellow and if momentarily he substituted himself in the place or stead of la valliere's protector it was because that protector was himself of too exalted a position to undertake her defence these words were more than transparent they made the king blush but this time with pleasure he struck manicom gently on the shoulder well well monsieur de manicom you are not only a ready witty fellow but a brave gentleman besides and your friend de guiche is a paladin quite after my own heart you will express that to him from me your majesty forgives me then completely and i am free the king smiled and held out his hand to manicom which he took and kissed respectfully and then added the king you relate stories so charmingly i sire 
you told me in the most admirable manner the particulars of the accident which happened to de guiche i can see the wild boar rushing out of the wood i can see the horse fall down fighting with his head and the boar rush from the horse to the rider you do not simply relate a story well you positively paint its incidents sire i think your majesty condescends to laugh at my expense said manicamp on the contrary said louis seriously i have so little intention of laughing monsieur de manicamp that i wish you to relate this adventure to every one the adventure of the hunt yes in the manner you told it to me without changing a single word you understand perfectly sire and you will relate it then without losing a minute very well and now summon m d'artagnan i hope you are no longer afraid of him oh sire from the very moment i am sure of your majesty's kind disposition i no longer fear anything call him then said the king manicamp opened the door and said gentlemen the king wishes you to return d'artagnan saint agno and valu entered gentlemen said the king i summon you for the purposes of saying that m manicamp's explanation has entirely satisfied me d'artagnan glanced at valu and saint agno as much to say well did i not tell you so the king led manicamp to the door and then in a low tone of voice said see that m de guiche takes good care of himself and particularly that he recovers as soon as possible i am very desirous of thanking him in the name of every lady but let him take special care that he does not begin again were he to die a hundred times sire he would begin again if your majesty's honor were in any way called in question this remark was direct enough but we have already said that the incense of flattery was very pleasing to the king and provided he received it he was not very particular as to its quality very well very well he said as he dismissed manicamp i will see de guiche myself and make him listen to reason and as manicamp left the apartment the king turned round towards the three spectators of this scene and said tell me monsieur d'artagnan how does it happen that your sight is so imperfect you whose eyes are generally so very good my sight bad sire certainly it must be the case since your majesty says so but in what respect may i ask why with regard to what occurred in the borochin ah ah certainly you pretended to have seen the tracks of two horses to have detected the footprints of two men and have described the particulars of an engagement which you assert took place nothing of the sort occurred pure illusion on your part ah ah said d'artagnan exactly the same with the galloping to and fro of the horses and the other indications of a struggle it was the struggle of de guiche against the wild boar and absolutely nothing else only the struggle was a long and a terrible one it seems ah ah continued d'artagnan and when i think that i almost believed it for a moment but then you told it with such confidence i admit sire that i must have been very short-sighted said d'artagnan with a readiness of humor which delighted the king you do admit it then admit it sire most assuredly i do so now that you see the thing in quite a different light from that in which i saw it half an hour ago and to what then do you attribute this difference in your opinion oh a very simple thing sire half an hour ago i returned from beaurachin where i had nothing to light me but a stupid stable lantern while now while now i have all the wax lights of your cabinet and more than that your majesty's own eyes which illuminate everything like the blazing sun at noonday the king began to laugh and saint agno broke out into convulsions of merriment it is precisely like m valot said d'artagnan resuming the conversation where the king had left off 
he has been imagining all along that not only was monsieur de guiche wounded by a bullet but still more that he extracted it even from his chest upon my word said balu i assure you now did you not believe that continued d'artagnan yes said balu not only did i believe it but at this very moment i would swear it well my dear doctor you have dreamt it i have dreamt it monsieur de guiche's wound a mere dream the bullet a dream so take my advice and prate no more about it well said returned the king monsieur d'artagnan's advice is sound do not speak of your dream to any one monsieur valu and upon the word of a gentleman you will have no occasion to repent it good evening gentlemen a very sad affair indeed is a wild boar hunt a very serious thing indeed repeated d'artagnan in a loud voice is a wild boar hunt and he repeated it in every room through which he passed and left the chateau taking valu with him and now we are alone said the king to saint agno what is the name of de guiche's adversary saint agno looked at the king oh do not hesitate said the king you know that i am bound beforehand to forgive de Wad, said saint agno very good said louis the fourteenth and then retiring to his own room added to himself Chapter Twenty of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter Twenty. Showing the advantage of having two strings to one's bow manicamp quitted the king's apartment delighted at having succeeded so well when just as he reached the bottom of the staircase and was passing a doorway he felt that some one suddenly pulled him by the sleeve he turned round and recognized mandelet who was waiting for him in the passage and who in a very mysterious manner with her body bent forward and in a low tone of voice said to him follow me monsieur and without any delay if you please where to mademoiselle inquired manicamp in the first place a true knight would not have asked such a question but would have followed me without requiring any explanation well mademoiselle i am quite ready to conduct myself as a true knight no it is too late and you cannot take the credit of it we are going to madame's apartment so come at once ah ah said manicamp lead on then and he followed montalais who ran before him as light as galatia this time said manicamp as he followed his guide i do not think that stories about hunting expeditions would be acceptable we will try however and if need be well if there should be any occasion for it we must try something else montalais still ran on how fatiguing it is thought manicamp to have need of one's head and legs at the same time at last however they arrived madame had just finished undressing and it was in a most elegant deshabille. but it must be understood that she had changed her dress before she had any idea of being subjected to the emotions now agitating her she was waiting with the most restless impatience and montalais and manicamp found her standing near the door at the sound of their approaching footsteps madame came forward to meet them ah she said at last here is monsieur manicamp replied montalais manicamp bowed with the greatest respect madame signed to montalais to withdraw and she immediately obeyed madame followed her with her eyes in silence until the door closed behind her and then turning towards manicamp said what is the matter and is it true as i am told monsieur de manicamp that some one is lying wounded in the chateau yes madame unfortunately so monsieur de guiche yes monsieur de guiche repeated the princess 
I had, in fact, heard it rumored, but not confirmed. And so, in truth, is it Monsieur de Guiche who has been thus unfortunate? Monsieur de Guiche himself, madame. Are you aware, Monsieur de Manicamp, said the princess hastily, that the king has the strongest antipathy to duels? Perfectly so, madame, but a duel with a wild beast is not answerable. Oh, you will not insult me by supposing that I credit the absurd fable, with what object I cannot tell, respecting Monsieur de Guiche having been wounded by a wild boar? No, no, monsieur, the real truth is known and in addition to the inconvenience of his wound, M. de Guiche runs the risk of losing his liberty, if not his life. Alas, madame, I am well aware of that, but what is to be done? You have seen the king? Yes, madame. What did you say to him? I told him how M. de Guiche went to the chase, and how a wild boar rushed forth out of the Beau Rochine, how M. de Guiche fired at it, and how, in fact, the furious brute dashed at de Guiche, killed his horse, and grievously wounded himself. And the king believed that? Implicitly. Oh, you surprise me, Monsieur de Manicamp, you surprise me very much. And Madame walked up and down the room, casting a searching look from time to time at Manicamp, who remained motionless and impassable in the same place. At last she stopped. And yet, she said, everyone here seems unanimous in giving another cause for this wound. What cause, madame, said Manicom? May I be permitted, without indiscretion, to ask your highness? You ask such a question? You, Monsieur de Guiche's intimate friend, his confidant, indeed. Oh, madame, his intimate friend, yes. Confidant, no. De Guiche is a man who can keep his own secrets who has some of his own, certainly, but who never breathes a syllable about them. De Guiche is discretion itself, madame. Very well, then, those secrets which Monsieur de Guiche keeps so scrupulously, I shall have the pleasure of informing you of, said the princess, almost spitefully, for the king may possibly question you a second time, and if, on the second occasion, you were to repeat the same story to him, he possibly might not be very well satisfied with it. But, madame, I think your highness is mistaken with regard to the king. His majesty was perfectly satisfied with me, I assure you. In that case, permit me to assure you, Monsieur de Manicom, it only proves one thing, which is that his majesty is very easily satisfied. I think your highness is mistaken in arriving at such an opinion. His Majesty is well known not to be contented except with very good reason. And do you suppose that he will thank you for your officious falsehood, when he will learn to-morrow that M. de Guiche had, on behalf of his friend M. de Bragelonne, a quarrel which ended in a hostile meeting? A quarrel on M. de Bragelonne's account, said Manicom, with the most innocent expression in the world, what does your royal highness do me the honor to tell me what is there astonishing in that m de guiche is susceptible irritable and easily loses his temper on the contrary madame i know m de guiche to be very patient and never susceptible or irritable except upon very good grounds but is not friendship a just ground said the princess oh certainly madame and particularly for a heart like his very good. You will not deny, I suppose, that M. de Bragelonne is M. de Guiche's good friend? A great friend. Well, then, M. de Guiche has taken M. de Bragelonne's part, and as M. de Bragelonne was absent and could not fight, he fought for him. Manicom began to smile, and moved his head and shoulders very slightly, as much as to say, Oh, if you will positively have it so, but speak at all events said the princess out of patience speak i of course it is quite clear you are not of my opinion and that you have something to say i have only one thing to say madame name it that i do not understand a single word of what you have just been telling me what you do not understand a single word about m de guiche's quarrel with m de wad exclaimed the princess almost out of temper Manicom remained silent. 
a quarrel she continued which arose out of a conversation scandalous in its tone and purport and more or less well founded respecting the virtue of a certain lady ah of a certain lady that is quite another thing said manicamp you begin to understand do you not your highness will excuse me but i dare not you dare not said madame exasperated very well then wait one moment i will dare madame madame exclaimed manicamp as if in great dismay be careful of what you are going to say it would seem monsieur that if i happened to be a man you would challenge me notwithstanding his majesty's edicts as monsieur de guiche challenged monsieur de wad and that too on account of the virtue of mademoiselle de la valliere of mademoiselle de la valliere exclaimed manicamp starting backwards as if that was the very last name he had expected to hear pronounced what makes you start in that manner monsieur de manicamp said madame ironically do you mean to say you would be impertinent enough to suspect that young lady's honour madame in the whole course of this affair there has not been the slightest question of mademoiselle de la valliere's honour what when two men have almost blown each other's brains out on a woman's behalf do you mean to say she has nothing to do with the affair and that her name has not been called in question at all i do not think you so good a courtier monsieur de manicamp pray forgive me madame said the young man but we are very far from understanding one another you give me the honor to speak one language while i am speaking altogether another i beg your pardon but i do not understand your meaning forgive me then but i fancied i understood your highness to remark that de guiche and de wad had fought on mademoiselle de la valliere's account certainly on account of mademoiselle de la valliere i think you said repeated manicamp i do not say that monsieur de guiche personally took an interest in mademoiselle de la valliere but i say that he did so as representing or acting on behalf of another on behalf of another come do not always assume such a bewildered look does not every one here know that monsieur de bragelonne is affianced to mademoiselle de la valliere and that before he went on the mission with which the king entrusted him he charged his friend monsieur de guiche to watch over that interesting young lady there is nothing more for me to say then your highness is well informed of everything i beg you to understand that clearly manicamp began to laugh which almost exasperated the princess who was not as we know of a very patient disposition madame resumed the discreet manicamp saluting the princess let us bury this affair altogether in forgetfulness for it will probably never be quite cleared up oh as far as that goes there is nothing more to do and the information is complete the king will learn that monsieur de guiche has taken up the cause of this little adventuress who gives herself all the airs of a grand lady he will learn that monsieur de bragelonne having nominated his friend monsieur de guiche his guardian in ordinary the latter immediately fastened as he was required to do upon the marquis de wade who ventured to trench upon his privileges moreover you cannot pretend to deny monsieur manicamp you who know everything so well that the king on his side casts a longing eye upon this famous treasure and that he will bear no slight grudge against monsieur de guiche for constituting himself its defender are you sufficiently well informed now or do you require anything further if so speak monsieur no madame there is nothing more i wish to know learn however for you ought to know it monsieur de manicamp learn that his majesty's indignation will be followed by terrible consequences in princes of a similar temperament to that of his majesty the passion which jealousy causes sweeps down like a whirlwind which you will temper madame i exclaimed the princess with a gesture of indescribable irony i and by what title may i ask because you detest injustice madame and according to your account then it would be an injustice to prevent the king arranging his love affairs as he pleases 
You will intercede, however, in Monsieur de Guiche's favor? You are mad, Monsieur, said the princess, in a haughty tone of voice. On the contrary, I am in the most perfect possession of my senses, and I repeat, you will defend Monsieur de Guiche before the king. Why should I? because the cause of monsieur de guiche is your own madame said manicamp with ardor kindling in his eyes what do you mean by that i mean madame that with respect to the defence which monsieur de guiche undertook in monsieur de bragelonne's absence i am surprised that your highness has not detected a pretext in la valliere's name having been brought forward a pretext but a pretext for what repeated the princess hesitatingly for manicamp's steady look had just revealed something of the truth to her i trust madame said the young man i have said sufficient to induce your highness not to overwhelm before his majesty my poor friend de guiche against whom all the malevolence of a party bitterly opposed to your own will now be directed you mean on the contrary i suppose that all those who have no great affection for mademoiselle de la valliere and even perhaps a few of those who have some regard for her will be angry with the comte oh madame why will you push your obstinacy to such an extent and refuse to open your ears and listen to the counsel of one whose devotion to you is unbounded must i expose myself to the risk of your displeasure am i really to be called upon to name contrary to my own wish the person who was the real cause of this quarrel the person said madame blushing must i continued manicamp tell you how poor de guiche became irritated furious exasperated beyond all control at the different rumors now being circulated about this person must i if you persist in this woeful blindness and if respect should continue to prevent me naming her must i i repeat recall to your recollection the various scenes which monsieur had with the duke of buckingham and the insinuations which were reported respecting the duke's exile must i remind you of the anxious care the comte always took in his efforts to please to watch to protect that person for whom alone he lives for whom alone he breathes well i will do so and when i shall have made you recall all the particulars i refer to you will perhaps understand how it happened that the comte having lost all control over himself and having been for some time past almost harassed to death by de wat became at the first disrespectful expression which the latter pronounced respecting the person in question inflamed with passion and panted only for an opportunity of avenging the affront the princess concealed her face with her hands monsieur monsieur she exclaimed do you know what you are saying and to whom you are speaking and so madame pursued manicamp as if he had not heard the exclamations of the princess nothing will astonish you any longer neither the comte's ardor in seeking the quarrel nor his wonderful address in transferring it to a quarter foreign to your own personal interests that latter circumstance was indeed a marvellous instance of tact and perfect coolness and if the person in whose behalf the comte so fought and shed his blood does in reality owe some gratitude to the poor wounded sufferer it is not on account of the blood he has shed or the agony he has suffered but for the steps he has taken to preserve from comment or reflection an honour which was more precious to him than his own oh cried madame as if she had been alone is it possible the quarrel was on my account manicamp felt he could now breathe for a moment and gallantly had he won the right to do so madame on her side remained for some time plunged in a painful reverie her agitation could be seen by her quick respiration by her drooping eyelids by the frequency with which she pressed her hand upon her heart but in her coquetry was not so much a passive quality as on the contrary a fire which sought for fuel to maintain itself finding anywhere and everywhere what it required if it be as you assert she said the comte will have obliged two persons at the same time for monsieur de bragelonne also owns a deep debt of gratitude to monsieur de guiche 
and with far greater reason indeed because everywhere and on every occasion mademoiselle de la valliere will be regarded as having been defended by this generous champion manicamp perceived that there still remained some lingering doubt in the princess's heart a truly admirable service indeed he said is the one he has rendered to mademoiselle de la valliere a truly admirable service to m de bragelonne the duel has created a sensation which in some respects casts a dishonorable suspicion upon that young girl a sensation indeed which will embroil her with the vicomte the consequence is that de wad's pistol bullet has had three results instead of one it destroys at the same time the honor of a woman the happiness of a man and perhaps it has wounded to death one of the best gentlemen in france oh madame your logic is cold even calculating it always condemns it never absolves manicamp's concluding words scattered to the winds the last doubt which lingered not in madame's heart but in her mind she was no longer a princess full of scruples nor a woman with her ever-returning suspicions but one whose heart has just felt the mortal chill of a wound wounded to death she murmured in a faltering voice oh monsieur de manicamp did you not say wounded to death manicamp returned no other answer than a deep sigh and so you said that the comte is dangerously wounded continued the princess yes madame one of his hands is shattered and he has a bullet lodged in his breast gracious heavens resumed the princess with a feverish excitement this is horrible monsieur de manicamp a hand shattered do you say and a bullet in his breast and that coward that wretch that assassin de wad did it manicamp seemed overcome by a violent emotion he had in fact displayed no little energy in the latter part of his speech as for madame she entirely threw aside all regard for the formal observances of propriety society imposes for when with her passion spoke in accents either of anger or sympathy nothing could restrain her impulses madame approached manicamp who had subsided in a chair as if his grief were a sufficiently powerful excuse for his infraction of the laws of etiquette monsieur she said seizing him by the hand be frank with me manicamp looked up is monsieur de guiche in danger of death doubly so madame he replied in the first place on account of the hemorrhage which has taken place an artery having been injured in the hand and next in consequence of the wound in his breast which may the doctor is afraid at least have injured some vital part he may die then die yes madame and without even having had the consolation of knowing that you have been told of his devotion you will tell him i yes are you not his friend i oh no madame i will tell only monsieur de guiche if indeed he is still in a condition to hear me i will only tell him what i have seen that is your cruelty to him oh monsieur you will not be guilty of such barbarity indeed madame i shall speak the truth for nature is very energetic in a man of his age the physicians are clever men and if by chance the poor comte should survive his wound i should not wish him to die of a wound of the heart after surviving one of the body manicamp rose and with an expression of profoundest respect seemed to be desirous of taking leave at least monsieur said madame stopping him with almost a suppliant air you will be kind enough to tell me in what state your wounded friend is and who is the physician who attends him as regards the state he is in madame he is seriously ill his physician is M. Valot, his majesty's private medical attendant. M. Valot is moreover assisted by a professional friend, to whose house M. de Guiche has been carried. What? He is not in the chateau, said madame. Alas, madame, the poor fellow was so ill that he could not even be conveyed thither. Give me the address, monsieur, said the princess hurriedly. I will send to inquire after him. Rue de Fura a brick-built house with white outside blinds the doctor's name is on the door you are returning to your wounded friend monsieur de manicamp yes madame 
You will be able then to do me a service. I am at your highness's orders. Do what you intended to do. Return to Monsieur de Guiche. Send away all those whom you may find there, and have the kindness yourself to go away too. Madame, let us waste no time in useless explanations. Accept the fact as I present it to you. See nothing in it beyond what is really there, and ask nothing further than what I tell you. I am going to send one of my ladies, perhaps two, because it is now getting late. I do not wish them to see you, or rather I do not wish you to see them. These are scruples you can understand, you particularly, Monsieur de Manicom, who seem capable of divining so much. Oh, madame, perfectly, I can even do better still. I will precede, or rather walk, in advance of your attendants. It will, at the same time, be the means of showing them the way more accurately, and of protecting them if the occasion arises, though there is no probability of their needing protection. And by this means, then, they would be sure of entering without difficulty, would they not? Certainly, madame, for as I should be the first to pass, I thus remove any difficulties that might chance to be in the way. Very well. Go, go, Monsieur de Manicom, and wait at the bottom of the staircase. I will go at once, madame. Stay. Manicom paused. When you hear the footsteps of two women descending the stairs, go out, and without once turning round, take the road which leads to where the poor count is lying. But if, by any mischance, two other persons were to descend, and I were to be mistaken, you will hear one of the two clap her hands together softly. Go. Manicom turned round, bowed once more, and left the room, his heart overflowing with joy. In fact, he knew very well that the presence of Madame herself would be the best balm to apply to his friend's wounds. A quarter of an hour had hardly elapsed when he heard the sound of a door open softly and closed with like precaution. He listened to the light footfalls gliding down the staircase, and then heard the signal agreed upon. He immediately went out, and, faithful to his promise, bent his way, without once turning his head. Chapter Twenty One of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Louise de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Twenty One. Monsieur Malicorne, the Keeper of the Records of France. Two women, their figures completely concealed by their mantles, and whose masks effectually hid the upper portion of their faces, timidly followed Manicon's steps. On the first floor, behind curtains of red damask, the soft light of a lamp placed upon a low table faintly illumined the room, at the other extremity of which, on a large bedstead, supported by spiral columns, around which curtains of the same colour as those which deadened the rays of the lamp had been closely drawn, lay de Guiche, his head supported by pillows, his eyes looking as if the mists of death were gathering, his long black hair scattered over the pillow, set off the young man's hollow temples. It was easy to see that fever was the chief tenant of the chamber. De Guiche was dreaming. His wandering mind was pursuing, through gloom and mystery, one of those wild creations delirium engenders. Two or three drops of blood, still liquid, stained the floor. Manicon hurriedly ran up the stairs, but paused at the threshold of the door, looked into the room, and seeing that everything was perfectly quiet, he advanced towards the foot of the large leathern armchair, a specimen of furniture of the reign of Henry the Fourth, and seeing that the nurse, as a matter of course, had dropped off to sleep, he awoke her, and begged her to pass into the adjoining room. Then, standing by the side of the bed, he remained for a moment deliberating whether it would be better to awaken Guiche in order to acquaint him with the good news. But as he began to hear behind the door the rustling of silk dresses and the hurried breathing of his two companions, 
and as he already saw that the curtain screening the doorway seemed on the point of being impatiently drawn aside, he passed round the bed and followed the nurse into the next room. As soon as he had disappeared, the curtain was raised, and his two female companions entered the room he had just left. The one who entered first made a gesture to her companion, which riveted her to the spot where she stood, close to the door, and then resolutely advanced towards the bed, drew back the curtains along the iron rod, and threw them in thick folds behind the head of the bed. She gazed upon the Comte's pallid face, remarked his right hand enveloped in linen, whose dazzling whiteness was emphasized by the counterpane patterned with dark leaves thrown across the couch. She shuddered as she saw a stain of blood growing larger and larger upon the bandages. The young man's breast was uncovered, as though for the cool night air to assist his respiration. A narrow bandage fastened the dressings of the wound, around which a purplish circle of extravasated blood was gradually increasing in size. A deep sigh broke from her lips. She leaned against one of the columns of the bed and gazed, through the apertures in her mask upon the harrowing spectacle before her. A hoarse, harsh groan passed like a death rattle through the corn's clenched teeth. The masked lady seized his left hand, which scorched like burning coals, and at the very moment she placed her icy hand upon it, the action of the cold was such that de Guiche opened his eyes, and by a look in which revived intelligence was dawning, seemed as though struggling back again into existence. The first thing upon which he fixed his gaze was this phantom standing erect by his bedside. At that sight his eyes became dilated, but without any appearance of consciousness in them. The lady thereupon made a sign to her companion, who had remained at the door, and in all probability the latter had already received her lesson, for in a clear tone of voice and without any hesitation whatever, she pronounced these words, Monsieur le Comte, Her Royal Highness Madame is desirous of knowing how you are able to bear your wound, and to express to you, by my lips, her great regret at seeing you suffer. As she pronounced the word Madame, Guiche started. He had not as yet remarked the person to whom the voice belonged, and he naturally turned towards the direction whence it proceeded. But as he felt the cold hand still resting on his own, he again turned towards the motionless figure beside him. "'Was it you who spoke, madame?' he asked in a weak voice. "'Or is there another person in beside you in the room?' "'Yes,' replied the figure in an almost unintelligible voice as she bent down her head. "'Well,' said the wounded man with a great effort, "'I thank you. Tell madame that I no longer regret to die, since she has remembered me.' At the words to die, pronounced by one whose life seemed to hang on a thread, the masked lady could not restrain her tears, which flowed under the mask, and appeared upon her cheeks just where the mask left her face bare. If de Guiche had been in fuller possession of his senses, he would have seen her tears roll like glistening pearls and fall upon his bed. The lady, forgetting that she wore a mask, raised her hand as though to wipe her eyes, and meeting the rough velvet, she tore away her mask in anger and threw it on the floor. At the unexpected apparition before him, which seemed to issue from a cloud, de Guiche uttered a cry and stretched his arms toward her, but every word perished on his lips, and his strength seemed utterly abandoning him. His right hand, which had followed his first impulse, without calculating the amount of strength he had left, fell back again upon the bed and immediately afterwards the white linen was stained with a larger spot than before. In the meantime, the young man's eyes became dim and closed, as if he were already struggling with the messenger of death, and then, after a few involuntary movements, his head fell back motionless on his pillow. His face grew livid. The lady was frightened, but on this occasion, contrary to what is usually the case, fear attracted. She leaned over the young man, gazed earnestly, fixedly at his pale, cold face, which she almost touched, then imprinted a rapid kiss upon de Guiche's left hand, who, trembling as if an electric shock had passed through him, awoke a second time, opened his large eyes, incapable of recognition, 
and again fell into a state of complete insensibility. Come, she said to her companion, we must not remain here longer. I shall be committing some folly or other. Madame, Madame, your highness is forgetting your mask, said her vigilant companion. Pick it up, replied her mistress, as she tottered almost senseless toward the staircase. And as the outer door had been left only half closed, the two women, light as birds, passed through it, and with hurried steps returned to the palace. One of them ascended towards Madame's apartment, where she disappeared. The other entered the rooms belonging to the maids of honour, namely, on the entresol, and having reached her own room, she sat down before a table, and without giving herself time even to breathe, wrote the following letter. This evening Madame has been to see Monsieur de Guiche, Everything is going well on this side. See that your news is equally exemplary, and do not forget to burn this paper. She folded the letter, and leaving her room with every possible precaution, crossed a corridor which led to the apartments appropriated to the gentleman attached to Monsieur's service. She stopped before a door, under which, having previously knocked twice in a short, quick manner, she thrust the paper and fled. Then, returning to her own room, she removed every trace of her having gone out, and also of having written the letter. Amid the investigations she was so diligently pursuing, she perceived on the table the mask which belonged to Madame, and which, according to her mistress's directions, she had brought back, but had forgotten to restore to her. Oh, oh, she said, I must not forget to do tomorrow what I have forgotten today. As she took hold of the velvet mask by that part which covered the cheek, and feeling that her thumb was wet, looked at it. It was not only wet, but reddened. The mask had fallen upon one of the spots of blood which, we have already said, stained the floor, and from that black velvet outside which had accidentally come into contact with it, the blood had passed through to the inside and stained the white cambric lining. Oh, oh! said Montalais, for doubtless our readers have already recognized her by these various maneuvers. I shall not give back this mask. It is far too precious now. And, rising from her seat, she ran towards a box made of maple wood, which enclosed different articles of toilet and perfumery. No, not here, she said. Such a treasure must not be abandoned to the slightest chance of detection. Then, after a moment's silence, and with a smile that was peculiarly her own, she added, beautiful mask, stained with the blood of that brave knight, you shall go and join that collection of wonders, La Valliere's and Raoul's letters, that loving collection indeed, which will some day or other form part of the history of France, of European royalty. You shall be placed under Monsieur Malicorne's care, said the laughing girl as she began to undress herself, under the protection of that worthy Monsieur Malicorne, she said, blowing out the taper who thinks he was born only to become the chief usher of monsieur's apartments, and whom I will make keeper of the records and historiographer of the house of Bourbon, and of the first houses in the kingdom. Let him grow. Chapter Twenty Two of Louisa de la Valliera. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliera by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Twenty Two The Journey. The next day being agreed upon for the departure. The king, at eleven o'clock precisely, descended the grand staircase with the two queens and madame, in order to enter his carriage drawn by six horses that were pawing the ground in impatience at the foot of the staircase. The whole court awaited the royal appearance in the Verachaval Croissant in their travelling costumes. The large number of saddled horses and carriages of ladies and gentlemen of the court, surrounded by their attendants, servants, and pages, formed a spectacle whose brilliancy could scarcely be equaled. The king entered his carriage with the two queens. Madame was in the same one with Monsieur. 
the maids of honour followed their example and took their seats two by two in the carriages destined for them the weather was exceedingly warm a light breeze which early in the morning all had thought would have proved sufficient to cool the air soon became fiercely heated by the rays of the sun although it was hidden behind the clouds and filtered through the heated vapour which rose from the ground like a scorching wind bearing particles of fine dust against the faces of the travellers madame was the first to complain of the heat monsieur's only reply was to throw himself back in the carriage as though about to faint and to inundate himself with scents and perfumes uttering the deepest sighs all the while whereupon madame said to him with her most amiable expression really monsieur i fancied that you would have been polite enough on account of the terrible heat to have left me my carriage to myself and to have performed the journey yourself on horseback ride on horseback cried the prince with an accent of dismay which showed how little idea he had of adopting this unnatural advice you cannot suppose such a thing madame my skin would peel off if i were to expose myself to such a burning breeze as this madame began to laugh you can take my parasol she said but the trouble of holding it replied monsieur with the greatest coolness besides i have no horse what no horse replied the princess who if she did not secure the solitude she required at least obtained the amusement of teasing no horse you are mistaken monsieur for i see your favorite bay out yonder my bay horse exclaimed the prince attempting to lean forward to look out of the door but the movement he was obliged to make cost him so much trouble that he soon hastened to resume his immobility yes said madame your horse led by monsieur de malicorne poor beast replied the prince how warm it must be and with these words he closed his eyes like a man on the point of death madame on her side reclined indolently in the other corner of the carriage and closed her eyes also not however to sleep but to think more at her ease in the meantime the king seated in the front of his carriage the back of which he had yielded up to the two queens was a prey to that feverish contrariety experienced by anxious lovers who without being able to quench their ardent thirst are ceaselessly desirous of seeing the loved object and then go away partially satisfied without perceiving they have acquired a more insatiable thirst than ever the king whose carriage headed the procession could not from the place he occupied perceive the carriages of the ladies and maids of honour which followed in a line behind it besides he was obliged to answer the eternal questions of the young queen who happy to have with her her dear husband as she called him in utter forgetfulness of royal etiquette invested him with all her affection stifled him with her attentions afraid that some one might come to take him from her or that he himself might suddenly take a fancy to quit her society anne of austria whom nothing at that moment occupied except the occasional cruel throbbings in her bosom looked pleased and delighted and although she perfectly realized the king's impatience tantalizingly prolonged his sufferings by unexpectedly resuming the conversation at the very moment the king absorbed in his own reflections began to muse over his secret attachment everything seemed to combine not alone the little teasing attentions of the queen but also the queen mother's interruptions to make the king's position almost insupportable for he knew not how to control the restless longings of his heart at first he complained of the heat a complaint merely preliminary to others but with sufficient tact to prevent maria theresa guessing his real object 
understanding the king's remark literally she began to fan him with her ostrich plumes but the heat passed away and the king then complained of cramps and stiffness in his legs and as the carriages at that moment stopped to change horses the queen said shall i get out with you i too feel tired of sitting we can walk on a little distance the carriage will overtake us and we can resume our places presently the king frowned it is a hard trial a jealous woman makes her husband submit to whose fidelity she suspects when although herself a prey to jealousy she watches herself so narrowly that she avoids giving any pretext for an angry feeling the king therefore in the present case could not refuse he accepted the offer alighted from the carriage gave his arm to the queen and walked up and down with her while the horses were being changed as he walked along he cast an envious glance upon the, the courtiers who were fortunate enough to be on horseback the queen soon found out that the promenade she had suggested afforded the king as little pleasure as he had experienced from driving she accordingly expressed a wish to return to her carriage and the king conducted her to the door but did not get in with her he stepped back a few paces and looked along the file of carriages for the purpose of recognizing the one in which he took so strong an interest at the door of the sixth carriage he saw la valliere's fair countenance as the king thus stood motionless wrapped in thought without perceiving that everything was ready and that he alone was causing the delay he heard a voice close beside him addressing him in the most respectful manner it was monsieur malicorne in a complete costume of an equerry holding over his left arm the bridles of a couple of horses your majesty asked for a horse i believe he said a horse have you one of my horses here inquired the king trying to remember the person who had addressed him and whose face was not as yet familiar to him sire replied malicorne in all events i have a horse here which is at your majesty's service and malicorne pointed at monsieur's bay horse which madame had observed it was a beautiful creature royally caparisoned this is not one of my horses monsieur said the king sire it is a horse out of his royal highness's stables but he does not ride when the weather is as hot as it is now louis did not reply but approached the horse which stood pawing the ground with its foot malicorne hastened to hold the stirrup for him but the king was already in the saddle restored to good humor by this lucky accident the king hastened toward the queen's carriage where he was anxiously expected and notwithstanding maria theresa's thoughtful and preoccupied air he said i have been fortunate enough to find this horse and i intend to avail myself of it i felt stifled in the carriage adieu ladies then bending gracefully over the arched neck of his beautiful steed he disappeared in a second anne of austria leaned forward in order to look after him as he rode away he did not get very far for when he reached the sixth carriage he reined in his horse suddenly and took off his hat he saluted la valliere who uttered a cry of surprise as she saw him blushing at the same time with pleasure montalais who occupied the other seat in the carriage made the king a most respectful bow and then with all the tact of a woman she pretended to be exceedingly interested in the landscape and withdrew herself into the left-hand corner the conversation between the king and la valliere began as all lovers conversations generally do namely by eloquent looks and by a few words utterly devoid of common sense the king explained how warm he had felt in his carriage so much so indeed that he could almost regard the horse he then rode as a blessing thrown in his way and he added my benefactor is an exceedingly intelligent man for he seemed to guess my thoughts intuitively i have now only one wish 
that of learning the name of the gentleman who so cleverly assisted his king out of his dilemma and extricated him from his cruel position montalais during this colloquy the first words of which had awakened her attention had slightly altered her position and contrived so as to meet the king's look as he finished his remark it followed very naturally that the king looked inquiringly as much at her as at la valliere she had every reason to suppose that it was herself who was appealed to and consequently might be permitted to answer she therefore said sire the horse which your majesty is riding belongs to monsieur and was being led by one of his royal highness's gentlemen and what is that gentleman's name may i ask mademoiselle monsieur de malicorne sire the name produced its usual effect for the king repeated it smilingly yes sire replied ara stay it is the gentleman who is galloping on my left hand and she pointed out malicorne who with a very sanctified expression was galloping by the side of the carriage knowing perfectly well that they were talking of him at that very moment but sitting in his saddle as if he were deaf and dumb yes said the king that is the gentleman i remember his face and will not forget his name said the king looking tenderly at la valliere ara had now nothing further to do she had let malicorne's name fall the soil was good all that was now left to be done was to let the name take root and the event would bear fruit in due season she consequently threw herself back in her corner feeling perfectly justified in making as many agreeable signs of recognition as she liked to malicorne since the latter had had the happiness of pleasing the king as will readily be believed montalais was not mistaken and malicorne with his quick ear and his sly look seemed to interpret her remark as all goes on well the whole being accompanied by a pantomimic action which he fancied conveyed something resembling a kiss alas mademoiselle said the king after a moment's pause the liberty and freedom of the country is soon about to cease your attendance on madame will be more strictly enforced and we shall see each other no more your majesty is too much attached to madame replied louisa not to come and see her very frequently and whenever your majesty may chance to pass across the apartment ah said the king in a tender voice which was gradually lowered in its tone to perceive is not to see and yet it seems that it would be quite sufficient for you louisa did not answer a syllable a sigh filled her heart almost to bursting but she stifled it you exercise a great control over yourself said the king to louisa who smiled upon him with a melancholy expression exert the strength you have in loving fondly he continued and i will bless heaven for having bestowed it on you la valliere still remained silent but raised her eyes brimful of affection toward the king louis as if overcome by this burning glance passed his hand across his forehead and pressing the sides of his horse with his knees made him bound several paces forward la valliere leaning back in her carriage with her eyes half closed gazed fixedly upon the king whose plumes were floating in the air she could not but admire his graceful carriage his delicate and nervous limbs which pressed his horse's sides and the regular outline of his features which his beautiful curling hair set off to great advantage revealing occasionally his small and well-formed ear in fact the poor girl was in love and she reveled in her innocent affection in a few moments the king was again by her side did you not perceive he said how terribly your silence affects me oh mademoiselle how pitilessly inexorable you would become 
if you would ever to resolve to break off all acquaintance with any one. And then, too, I think you changeable. In fact, in fact, I dread this deep affection which fills my whole being. Oh, sire, you are mistaken, said La Valliere. If ever I love, it will be for all my life. If you love, you say, exclaimed the king. You do not love now, then? She hid her face in her hands. You see, said the king, that I am right in accusing you. You must admit you are changeable, capricious, a coquette, perhaps. Oh, no, sire. Be perfectly satisfied as to that. No, I say again, no, no. Promise me, then, that to me you will always be the same. Oh, always, sire, that you will never show any of that severity which would break my heart, none of that fickleness of manner which would be worse than death to me. Oh, no, no. Very well, then. But listen, I like promises. I like to place under the guarantee of an oath, under the protection of heaven. In fact, everything which interests my heart and my affections promise me or rather swear to me that if in the life we are about to commence a life which will be full of sacrifice mystery anxiety disappointment and misunderstanding swear to me that if we should in any way deceive or misunderstand each other or should judge each other unjustly for that, indeed, would be criminal in love such as ours. Swear to me, Louisa. She trembled with agitation to the very depths of her heart. It was the first time she had heard her name pronounced in that manner by her royal lover. As for the king, taking off his glove and placing his hand within the carriage, he continued, Swear that never in all our quarrels will we allow one night even to pass by, if any misunderstanding should arise between us without a visit, or at least a message from either, in order to convey consolation and repose to the other. La Valliere took her lover's burning hand between her own cool palms, and pressed it softly, until a movement of the horse frightened by the proximity of the wheels, obliged her to abandon her happiness. She had vowed as he desired. Return, sire, she said, return to the queen. I foresee a storm yonder, which threatens my peace of mind and yours. Louis obeyed, saluted Mademoiselle de Montalais, and set off at a gallop to rejoin the queen. As he passed Monsieur's carriage, he observed that he was fast asleep, although Madame, on her part, was wide awake. As the king passed her, she said, What a beautiful horse, sire! Is it not Monsieur's bay horse? The young queen. Chapter Twenty Three of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Twenty Three. Triumphemate. On the king's arrival in Paris, he sat at the council which had been summoned and worked for a certain portion of the day the queen remained with the queen mother and burst into tears as soon as she had taken leave of the king ah madame she said the king no longer loves me what will become of me a husband always loves his wife when she is like you replied anne of austria a time may come when he will love another woman instead of me what do you call loving always thinking of a person always seeking her society do you happen to have remarked said anne of austria that the king has ever done anything of the sort no madame said the young queen hesitatingly what is there to complain of then marie you will admit that the king leaves me 
the king, my daughter, belongs to his people, and that is the very reason why he no longer belongs to me, and that is the reason, too, why I shall find myself, as so many queens before me, forsaken and forgotten, whilst glory and honor will be reserved for others. Oh, my mother, the king is so handsome. How often will others tell him that they love him, and how much, indeed, they must do so? It is very seldom, indeed, that women love the man in loving the king. But if such a thing happened, which I doubt, you would be better to wish, Marie, that such women should really love your husband. In the first place, the devoted love of a mistress is a rapid element of the dissolution of a lover's affection and then by dint of loving the mistress loses all influence over her lover whose power of wealth she does not covet caring only for his affection wish therefore that the king should love but lightly and that his mistress should love with all her heart oh my mother what power may not a deep affection exercise over him and yet you say you are resigned quite true quite true i speak absurdly there is a feeling of anguish however which i can never control and that is the king may make a happy choice may find a home with all the tender influences of home not far from that we can offer him a home with children round him the children of another woman Oh, madame, I should die if I were but to see the king's children. Marie, Marie, replied the queen mother with a smile, and she took the young queen's hand in her own. Remember what I am going to say, and let it always be a consolation to you. The king cannot have a dauphin without you. With this remark, the queen mother quitted her daughter-in-law in order to meet madame, whose arrival in the grand cabinet had just been announced by one of the pages. Madame had scarcely taken time to change her dress. Her face revealed her agitation, which betrayed a plan, the execution of which occupied, while the result disturbed, her mind. I came to ascertain, she said, if your majesties are suffering any fatigue from our journey. Not at all, said the queen mother a little replied maria theresa i have suffered from annoyance more than anything else said madame how was that inquired anne of austria the fatigue the king undergoes in riding about on horseback that does the king good and it was i who advised him said maria theresa turning pale madame said not a word in reply but one of those smiles which were peculiarly her own flitted for a moment across her lip without passing over the rest of her face then immediately changing the conversation she continued we shall find paris precisely the paris we quitted the same intrigues plots and flirtations going on intrigues what intrigues do you allude to inquired the queen mother People are talking a good deal about Monsieur Fouquet and Madame Plessy Valere, who makes up the number to about ten thousand, replied the queen mother. But what are the plots you speak of? We have, it seems, certain misunderstandings with Holland to settle. What about? Monsieur has been telling me the story of the medals. Oh, exclaimed the young queen you mean those medals struck in holland on which a cloud is seen passing across the sun which is the king's device you are wrong in calling that a plot it is an insult but so contemptible that the king can well despise it replied the queen mother well what are the flirtations which are alluded to do you mean that of madame de lone no no nearer ourselves than that casa de usted murmured the queen mother and without moving her lips in her daughter-in-law's ear without being overheard by madame who thus continued you know the terrible news oh yes monsieur de guiche's wound 
and you attribute it, I suppose, as every one else does, to an accident which happened to him while hunting? Yes, of course, said both the queens together, their interest awakened. Madame drew closer to them, as she said, in a low tone of voice, It was a duel. Ah, said Anne of Austria, in a severe tone, for in her ears the word duel, which had been forbidden in France all the time she reigned over it, had a strange sound, a most deplorable duel, which has nearly cost Monsieur two of his best friends, and the king two of his best servants. What was the cause of the duel? inquired the young queen, animated by a secret instinct. Flirtation, repeated Madame triumphantly. The gentlemen in question were conversing about the virtue of a particular lady belonging to the court. One of them thought that Pelet was a very second-rate person compared to her. The other pretended that the lady in question was an imitation of Venus alluring Mars, and thereupon the two gentlemen fought as fiercely as Hector and Achilles venus alluring mars said the young queen in a low tone of voice without venturing to examine into the allegory very deeply who is the lady inquired anne of austria abruptly you said i believe she was one of the ladies of honor did i say so replied madame yes at least i thought i heard you mention it are you not aware that such a woman is of ill omen to a royal house is it not mademoiselle de la valliere said the queen mother yes indeed that plain-looking creature i thought she was affianced to a gentleman who certainly is not at least so i have heard either monsieur de guiche or monsieur de war very possibly madame the young queen took up a piece of tapestry and began to broider with an affectation of tranquillity her trembling fingers contradicted what were you saying about venus and mars pursued the queen mother is there a mars also she boasts of that being the case did you say she boasts of it that was the cause of the duel and monsieur de guiche upheld the cause of mars yes certainly like the devoted servant he is the devoted servant of whom exclaimed the young queen forgetting her reserve in allowing her jealous feeling to escape mars not to be defended except at the expense of venus replied madame monsieur de guiche maintained the perfect innocence of mars and no doubt affirmed that it was all a mere boast and monsieur de Wye said anne of austria quietly spread the report that venus was within her rights i suppose oh de what thought madame you shall pay dearly for the wound you have given that noblest best of men and she began to attack de what with the greatest bitterness thus discharging her own and de guiche's debt with the assurance that she was working the future ruin of her enemy she said so much in fact that had monacomp been there he would have regretted he had shown such firm regard for his friend inasmuch as it resulted in the ruin of his unfortunate foe i see nothing in the whole affair but one cause of mischief and that is la valliere herself said the queen mother the young queen resumed her work with perfect indifference of manner while madame listened eagerly i do not yet quite understand what you said just now about the danger of coquetry resumed anne of austria it is quite true madame hastened to say that if the girl had not been a coquette mars would not have thought at all about her the repetition of this word mars brought a passing color to the queen's face but she still continued her work i will not permit that in my court gentlemen should be set against each other in this manner said anne of austria calmly such manners were useful enough perhaps in days when the divided nobility had no other rallying point than mere gallantry at that time women whose sway was absolute and undivided were privileged to encourage men's valor by frequent trials of their courage but now thank heaven there is but one master in france 
and to him every instinct of the mind every pulse of the body are due i will not allow my son to be deprived of any single one of his servants and she turned towards the young queen saying what is to be done with this la valliere la valliere said the queen apparently surprised i do not even know the name and she accompanied this remark by one of those cold fixed smiles only to be observed on royal lips madame was herself a princess great in every respect great in intelligence great by birth by pride the queen's reply however completely astonished her and she was obliged to pause for a moment in order to recover herself she is one of my maids of honor she replied with a bow in that case retorted maria theresa in the same tone it is your affair my sister and not ours i beg your pardon resumed anne of austria it is my affair and i perfectly well understand she pursued addressing a look full of intelligence at madame madame's motive for saying what she has just said everything which emanates from you madame said the english princess proceeds from the lips of wisdom if we send this girl back to her own family said maria theresa gently we must bestow a pension upon her which i will provide for out of my income exclaimed madame no no interrupted anne of austria no disturbance i beg the king dislikes that the slightest disrespectful remark should be made of any lady let everything be done quietly will you have the kindness madame to send for this girl here and you my daughter will have the goodness to retire to your own room the dowager queen's entreaties were commands and as maria theresa rose to return to her apartments madame rose in order Chapter Twenty Four of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter Twenty Four. The First Quarrel. La Valliere entered the Queen Mother's apartments without in the least suspecting that a serious plot was being concerted against her. She thought it was for something connected with her duties, and never had the Queen Mother been unkind to her when such was the case. Besides, not being immediately under the control or direction of Anne of Austria, she could only have an official connection with her, to which her own gentleness of disposition and the rank of the august princess made her yield on every occasion with the best possible grace she therefore advanced towards the queen mother with that soft and gentle smile which constituted her principal charm and as she did not approach sufficiently close anne of austria signed to her to come nearer madame then entered the room and with a perfectly calm air took her seat beside her mother-in-law and continued the work which maria theresa had begun when la valliere instead of the direction which she expected to receive immediately on entering the room perceived these preparations she looked with curiosity if not with uneasiness at the two princesses and seemed full of thought while madame maintained an affectation of indifference that would have alarmed a less timid person even than louisa mademoiselle said the queen mother suddenly without attempting to moderate or disguise her spanish accent which she never failed to do except when she was angry come closer we were talking of you as every one else seems to be doing of me exclaimed la valliere turning pale do you pretend to be ignorant of it are you not aware of the duel between m de guiche and m de wart oh madame i heard of it yesterday said la valliere clasping her hands together and you did not foresee this quarrel why should i madame because two men never fight without a motive 
and because you must be aware of the motive which awakened the animosity of the two in question i am perfectly ignorant of it madame a persevering denial is a very commonplace mode of defence and you who have great pretensions to be witty and clever ought to avoid commonplaces what else have you to say oh madame your majesty terrifies me with your cold severity of manner but i do not understand how i can have occurred your displeasure or in what respect people concern themselves about me then i will tell you monsieur de guiche has been obliged to undertake your defence my defence yes he is a gallant knight and beautiful adventuresses like to see such brave knights couch lances in their honor but for my part i hate fields of battle and above all i hate adventures and take my remark as you please la valliere sank at the queen's feet who turned her back upon her she stretched out her hands toward madame who laughed in her face a feeling of pride made her rise to her feet i have begged your majesty to tell me what is the crime i am accused of i can claim this at your hands and i see i am condemned before i am even permitted to justify myself ah indeed cried anne of austria listen to her beautiful phrases madame and to her fine sentiments she is an inexhaustible well of tenderness and heroic expressions one can easily see young lady that you have cultivated your mind in the society of crowned heads la valliere felt struck to the heart she became not whiter but as white as a lily and all her strength forsook her i wish to inform you interrupted the queen disdainfully that if you continue to nourish such feelings you will humiliate us to such a degree that we shall be ashamed of appearing before you be simple in your manners by the by i am informed that you are affianced is it the case la valliere pressed her hand over her heart which was wrung with a fresh pang answer when you are spoken to yes madame to a gentleman yes madame his name the vicomte de bragelonne are you aware that it is an exceedingly fortunate circumstance for you mademoiselle that such is the case and without fortune or position as you are or without any very great personal advantages you ought to bless heaven for having procured you such a future as seems to be in store for you la valliere did not reply where is the vicomte de bragelonne pursued the queen in england said madame where the report of this young lady's success will not fail to reach him oh heaven murmured la valliere in despair very well mademoiselle said anne of austria we will get this young gentleman to return and send you away somewhere with him if you are of a different opinion for girls have strange views and fancies at times trust to me i will put you in a proper path again i have done as much for girls who are not as good as you are probably la valliere ceased to hear the queen who pitilessly added i will send you somewhere by yourself where you will be able to indulge in a little serious reflection reflection calms the ardor of the blood and swallows up the illusions of youth i suppose you understand what i have been saying madame not a word i am innocent of everything your majesty supposes oh madame you are a witness of my despair i love i respect your majesty so much it would be far better not to respect me at all said the queen with a chilling irony of manner it would be far better if you were not innocent do you presume to suppose that i should be satisfied simply to leave you unpunished if you had committed the fault oh madame you are killing me no acting if you please or i will precipitate the denouement of this play leave the room return to your own apartment and i trust my lesson may be of service to you madame said la valliere to the duchess of d'orleans whose hand she seized in her own do you who are so good intercede for me 
i replied the latter with an insulting joy i good ah mademoiselle you think nothing of the kind and with a rude hasty gesture she repulsed the young girl's grasp la valliere instead of giving away as from her extreme pallor and her tears the two princesses possibly expected suddenly resumed her calm and dignified air she bowed profoundly and left the room well said anne of austria to madame do you think she will begin again i always suspect those gentle patient characters replied madame nothing is more full of courage than a patient heart nothing more self-reliant than a gentle spirit i feel i may almost venture to assure you she will think twice before she looks at the god mars again so long as she does not obtain the protection of his buckler i do not care retorted madame a proud defiant look of the queen mother was the reply to this objection which was by no means deficient in finesse and both of them almost sure of their victory went to look for maria theresa who had been waiting for them with impatience it was about half-past six in the evening and the king had just partaken of refreshment he lost no time but the repast finished and the business matters settled he took saint aignu by the arm and desired him to lead the way to la valliere's apartments the courtier uttered an exclamation well what is that for it is a habit you will have to adopt and in order to adopt a habit one must make a beginning oh sire said saint aignu it is hardly possible for every one can be seen entering or leaving those apartments if however some pretext or other were made use of if your majesty for instance would wait until madame were in her own apartments no pretext no delays i have had enough of these impediments and mysteries i cannot perceive in what respect the king of france dishonors himself by conversing with an amiable and clever girl evil be to him who evil thinks will your majesty forgive an excess of zeal on my part speak freely how about the queen true true i always wish the most entire respect to be shown to her majesty well then this evening only will i pay mademoiselle de la valliere a visit and after to-day i will make use of any pretext you like to-morrow we will devise all sorts of means to-night i have no time saint aignot made no reply he descended the steps preceding the king and crossed the different courtyards with a feeling of shame which the distinguished honor of accompanying the king did not remove the reason was that saint aignot wished to stand well with madame as well as with the queens and also that he did not on the other hand want to displease mademoiselle de la valliere and in order to carry out so many promising affairs it was difficult to avoid jostling against some obstacle or other besides the windows of the young queen's rooms those of the queen mother's and of madame herself looked out upon the courtyard of the maids of honor to be seen therefore accompanying the king would be effectually to quarrel with three great and influential princesses whose authority was unbounded for the purpose of supporting the ephemeral credit of a mistress the unhappy saint aignot who had not displayed a very great amount of courage in taking la valliere's part in the park of fontainebleau did not feel any braver in the broad daylight and found a thousand defects in the poor girl which he was most eager to communicate to the king but his trial soon finished the courtyards were crossed not a curtain was drawn aside nor a window opened the king walked hastily because of his impatience and the long legs of saint aignot who preceded him at the door however saint aignot wished to retire but the king desired him to remain a delicate consideration on the king's part which the courtier could very well have dispensed with he had to follow louis into la valliere's apartment as soon as the king arrived the young girl dried her tears but so precipitately that the king perceived it he questioned her most anxiously and tenderly and pressed her to tell him the cause of her emotion nothing is the matter sire she said and yet you were weeping 
Oh, no, indeed, sire. Look, Saint Agnew, and tell me if I am mistaken. Saint Agnew ought to have answered, but he was too much embarrassed. At all events, your eyes are red, mademoiselle, said the king. The dust of the road merely, sire. No, no, you no longer possess the air of supreme contentment, which renders you so beautiful and so attractive. You do not look at me. Why avoid my gaze, he said, as she turned aside her head. In heaven's name, what is the matter, he inquired, beginning to lose command over himself. Nothing at all, sire, and I am perfectly ready to assure your majesty that my mind is as free from anxiety as you could possibly wish. Your mind at ease, when I see you are embarrassed at the slightest thing, has any one annoyed you? No, no, sire. I insist upon knowing if such really be the case, said the prince, his eyes sparkling. No one, sire, no one has in any way offended me. In that case, pray resume your gentle air of gaiety, or that sweet melancholy look which I so loved in you this morning. For pity's sake, do so. Yes, sire, yes. The king tapped the floor impatiently with his foot, saying, Such a change is positively inexplicable. And he looked at Saint Agno, who had also remarked La Valliere's particular lethargy, as well as the king's impatience. It was futile for the king to entreat, and as useless for him to try to overcome her depression. The poor girl was completely overwhelmed. The appearance of an angel would hardly have awakened her from her torpor. The king saw in her repeated negative replies a mystery full of unkindness. He began to look around the apartment with a suspicious air. There happened to be in La Valliere's room a miniature of Athos, the king remarked that this portrait bore a strong resemblance to Bragelonne, for it had been taken when the count was quite a young man. He looked at it with a threatening air. La Valliere, in her misery far indeed from thinking of this portrait, could not conjecture the cause of the king's preoccupation. And yet the king's mind was occupied with a terrible remembrance, which had more than once taken possession of his mind but which he had always driven away. He recalled the intimacy existing between the two young people from their birth, their engagement, and that Athos himself had come to solicit La Valliere's hand for Raoul. He, therefore, could not but suppose that on her return to Paris, La Valliere had found news from London awaiting her, and that this news had counterbalanced the influence he had been enabled to exert over her. He immediately felt himself stung, as it were, by feelings of the wildest jealousy, and again questioned her with increased bitterness. La Valliere could not reply, unless she were to acknowledge everything, which would be to accuse the queen and madame also, and the consequence would be that she would have to enter into an open warfare with these two great and powerful princesses. She thought within herself that as she made no attempt to conceal from the king what was passing in her own mind, the king ought to be able to read in her heart, in spite of her silence, and that, had he really loved her, he would have understood and guessed everything. What was sympathy, then, if not that divine flame which possesses the property of enlightening the heart, and of saving lovers the necessity of an expression of their thoughts and feelings? She maintained her silence, therefore, sighing and concealing her face in her hands. These sighs and tears, which had at first distressed, then terrified Louis the Fourteenth, now irritated him. He could not bear opposition, the opposition which tears and sighs exhibited any more than opposition of any other kind. His remarks, therefore, became bitter, urgent, and openly aggressive in their nature, this was a fresh cause of distress for the poor girl. From that very circumstance, therefore, which she regarded as an injustice on her lover's part, she drew sufficient courage to bear not only her other troubles, but this one also. The king next began to accuse her in direct terms. La Valliere did not even attempt to defend herself. She endured all his accusations without according any other reply than that of shaking her head. 
without any other remark than that which escapes the heart in deep distress a prayerful appeal to heaven for help but this ejaculation instead of calming the king's displeasure rather increased it he moreover saw himself seconded by saint agno for saint agno as we have observed having seen the storm increasing and not knowing the extent of the regard of which louis the fourteenth was capable felt by anticipation all the collected wrath of the three princesses and the near approach of poor la valliere's downfall and he was not true knight enough to resist the fear that he himself might be dragged down in the impending ruin saint agno did not reply to the king's questions except by short dry remarks pronounced half aloud and by abrupt gestures whose object was to make things worse and bring about a misunderstanding the result of which would be to free him from the annoyance of having to cross the courtyards in open day in order to follow his illustrious companion to la valliere's apartments in the meantime the king's anger momentarily increased he made two or three steps towards the door as if to leave the room but returned the young girl did not however raise her head although the sound of his footsteps might have warned her that her lover was leaving her he drew himself up for a moment before her with his arms crossed for the last time mademoiselle he said will you speak will you assign a reason for this change this fickleness for this caprice what can i say murmured la valliere do you not see sire that i am completely overwhelmed at this moment that i have no power of will or thought or speech is it so difficult then to speak the truth you could have told me the whole truth in fewer words than those in which you have expressed yourself but the truth about what sire about everything la valliere was just on the point of revealing the truth to the king her arms made a sudden movement as if they were about to open but her lips remained silent and her hands again fell listlessly by her side the young girl had not yet endured sufficient unhappiness to risk the necessary revelation i know nothing she stammered out oh exclaimed the king this is no longer mere coquetry or caprice it is treason and this time nothing could restrain him the impulse of his heart was not sufficient to induce him to turn back and he darted out of the room with a gesture full of despair saint agno followed him wishing for nothing better than to quit the place louis the fourteenth did not pause until he reached the staircase and grasping the balustrade said you see how shamefully i have been duped how sire inquired the favorite de guiche fought on the vicomte de bragelonne's account and this bragelonne oh saint agno she still loves him i vow to you saint agno that if in three days from now there were to remain but an atom of, of affection for her in my heart i should die from very shame and the king resumed his way to his own apartments i told your majesty how it would be murmured saint agno continuing to follow the king and timidly glancing up at the different windows unfortunately their return was not like their arrival unobserved a curtain was suddenly drawn aside madame was behind it she had seen the king leave the apartments of the maids of honor and as soon as she observed that his majesty had passed she left her own apartments with hurried steps and ran up Chapter Twenty Five of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Jones. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Twenty Five. Despair. As soon as the king was gone, la Valliere raised herself from the ground and stretched out her arms as if to follow and detain him but when having violently closed the door the sound of his retreating footsteps could be heard in the distance she had hardly sufficient strength left to totter towards and fall at the foot of her crucifix 
There she remained, broken-hearted, absorbed, and overwhelmed by her grief, forgetful and indifferent to everything but her profound sorrow, a grief she only vaguely realized, as though by instinct. In the midst of this wild tumult of thought, La Valliere heard her door open again. She started and turned round, thinking it was the king who had returned. She was deceived, however, for it was Madame who had appeared at the door. What did she now care for Madame? Again she sank down, her head supported by her pre chair. It was Madame, agitated, angry, and threatening. But what was that to her? Mademoiselle, said the princess, standing before La Valliere, this is very fine, I admit, to kneel and pray, and make a pretense of being religious, but however submissive you may be in your address to heaven, it is desirable that you should pay some little attention to the wishes of those who reign and rule here below. La Valliere raised her head painfully in token of respect. Not long since, continued Madame, a certain recommendation was addressed to you, I believe. La Valliere's fixed and wild gaze showed how complete her forgetfulness or ignorance was. The queen recommended you, continued Madame, to conduct yourself in such a manner that no one could be justified in spreading any reports about you. La Valliere darted an inquiring look towards her. I will not, continued Madame, allow my household, which is that of the first princess of the blood, to set an evil example to the court. You would be the cause of such an example. I beg you to understand, therefore, in the absence of any witness of your shame, for I do not wish to humiliate you, that you are from this moment at perfect liberty to leave, and that you can return to your mother at Blois. La Valliere could not sink lower, nor could she suffer more than she had already suffered. Her countenance did not even change, but she remained kneeling with her hands clasped, like the figure of the Magdalene. Did you hear me? said Madame. A shiver, which passed through her whole frame, was La Valliere's only reply and as the victim gave no other signs of life madame left the room and then her very respiration suspended and her blood almost congealed as it were in her veins la valliere by degrees felt that the pulsation of her wrists her neck and temples began to throb more and more painfully these pulsations as they gradually increased soon changed into a species of brain fever and in her temporary delirium she saw the figures of her friends contending with her enemies floating before her vision she heard too mingled together in her deafened ears words of menace and words of fond affection she seemed raised out of her existence as though it were upon the wings of a mighty tempest and in the dim horizons of the path along which her delirium hurried her she saw the stone which covered her tomb upraised and the grim appalling texture of eternal night revealed to her distracted gaze but the horror of the dream which possessed her senses faded away and she was again restored to the habitual resignation of her character a ray of hope penetrated her heart as a ray of sunlight streams into the dungeon of some unhappy captive her mind reverted to the journey from fontainebleau she saw the king riding beside her carriage telling her that he loved her, asking for her love in return, requiring her to swear, and himself to swear too, that never should an evening pass by, if ever a misunderstanding were to arise between them, without a visit, a letter, a sign of some kind, being sent, to replace the troubled anxiety of the evening with the calm repose of the night. It was the king who had suggested that, who had imposed a promise on her, and who had sworn it to himself it was impossible therefore she reasoned that the king should fail in keeping the promise which he had himself exacted from her unless indeed louis was a despot who enforced love as he enforced obedience unless too the king were so indifferent that the first obstacle in his way was sufficient to arrest his further progress the king that kind protector who by a word a single word could relieve her distress of mind the king even joined her persecutors oh his anger could not possibly last 
Now that he was alone, he would be suffering all that she herself was a prey to. But he was not tied hand and foot as she was. He could act, could move about, could come to her, while she could do nothing but wait. And the poor girl waited and waited, with breathless anxiety, for she could not believe it possible that the king would not come. It was now about half-past ten. He would either come to her, or write to her, or send some kind word by M. de saint Agno. If he were to come, oh, how she would fly to meet him, how she would thrust aside that excess of delicacy, which she now discovered was misunderstood. How eagerly she would explain. It is not I who do not love you. It is the fault of others who will not allow me to love you. And then it must be confessed that she reflected upon it, and also the more she reflected louis appeared to her to be less guilty in fact he was ignorant of everything what must he have thought of the obstinacy with which she remained silent impatient and irritable as the king was known to be it was extraordinary that he had been able to preserve his temper so long and yet had it been her own case she undoubtedly would not have acted in such a manner she would have understood have guessed everything yes but she was nothing but a poor simple-minded girl and not a great and powerful monarch oh if he would but come if he would but come how eagerly she would forgive him for all he had just made her suffer how much more tenderly she would love him because she had so cruelly suffered and so she sat with her head bent forward in eager expectation towards the door her lips slightly parted as if, and heaven forgive her for the mental exclamation, they were awaiting the kiss which the king's lips had in the morning so sweetly indicated, when he pronounced the word love. If the king did not come, at least he would write. It was a second chance, a chance less delightful certainly than the other, but which would show an affection just as strong, only more timid in its nature oh how she would devour his letter how eager she would be to answer it and when the messenger who had brought it had left her how she would kiss it read it over and over again press to her heart the lucky paper which would have brought her peace of mind tranquillity and perfect happiness at all events if the king did not come if the king did not write he could not do otherwise than send saint Agno or St. Agnew could not do otherwise than come of his own accord. Even if it were a third person, how openly she would speak to him. The royal presence would not be there to freeze her words upon her tongue, and then no suspicious feeling would remain a moment longer in the king's heart. Everything with La Valliere, heart and look, body and mind, was concentrated in eager expectation. She said to herself that there was an hour left in which to indulge hope, that until midnight struck the king might come or write or send that at midnight only would every expectation vanish every hope be lost whenever she heard any stir in the palace the poor girl fancied she was the cause of it whenever she heard any one pass in the courtyard below she imagined they were messengers of the king coming to her eleven o'clock struck then a quarter past eleven then half past the minutes dragged slowly on in this anxiety and yet they seemed to pass too quickly and now it struck a quarter to twelve midnight midnight was near the last the final hope that remained with the last stroke of the clock the last ray of light seemed to fade away and with the last ray faded her final hope and so the king himself had deceived her it was he who had been the first to fail in keeping the oath which he had sworn that very day. Twelve hours only between his oath and his perjured vow. It was not long, alas, to have preserved the illusion. And so, not only did the king not love her, but he despised her whom every one ill-treated. He despised her to the extent even of abandoning her to the shame of an expulsion which was equivalent to having an ignominious sentence passed on her and yet it was he the king himself who was the first cause of this ignominy a bitter smile the only symptom of anger which during this long conflict had passed across the angelic face appeared upon her lips 
what in fact now remained on earth for her after the king was lost to her nothing but heaven still remained and her thoughts flew thither she prayed that the proper course for her to follow might be suggested it is from heaven she thought that i expect everything it is from heaven i ought to expect everything and she looked at her crucifix with a devotion full of tender love there she said hangs before me a master who never forgets and never abandons those who neither forget nor abandon him it is to him alone that we must sacrifice ourselves and thereupon could any one have gazed into the recesses of that chamber they would have seen the poor despairing girl adopt the final resolution and determine upon one last plan in her mind then as her knees were no longer able to support her she gradually sank down upon the prie dieu and with her head pressed against the wooden cross her eyes fixed and her respiration short and quick she watched for the earliest rays of approaching daylight at two o'clock in the morning she was still in the same bewilderment of mind or rather the same ecstasy of feeling her thoughts had almost ceased to hold the communion with things of the world and when she saw the pale violet tints of early dawn visible over the roofs of the palace and vaguely revealing the outlines of the ivory crucifix which she held embraced she rose from the ground with a newborn strength kissed the feet of the divine martyr descended the staircase leading from the room and wrapped herself from head to foot in a mantle as she went along she reached the wicket at the very moment the guard of the musketeers opened the gate to admit the first relief guard belonging to one of the swiss regiments and then gliding behind the soldiers she reached the street before the officer in command of the patrol had even thought of asking who the young girl was who was Chapter Twenty Six of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Twenty Six The Flight. La Valliere followed the patrol as it left the courtyard. The patrol bent its steps towards the right, by the Rue saint Honore, and mechanically La Valliere turned to the left. Her resolution was taken, her determination fixed. She wished to betake herself to the convent of the Carmelites at Chaillot, the superior of which enjoyed a reputation for severity which made the worldly-minded people of the court tremble. La Valliere had never seen Paris. She had never gone out on foot, and so would have been unable to find her way, even had she been in a calmer frame of mind than was then the case. And this may explain why she ascended, instead of descending, the Rue saint Honore. Her only thought was to get away from the Palais Royal, and this she was doing. She had heard it said that Chaillot looked out upon the Seine, and she accordingly directed her steps towards the Seine. She took the Rue de Coq, and not being able to cross the Louvre, bore towards the church of saint germain l'Auxerrois, proceeding along the site of the colonnade, which was subsequently built there by Perrault. In a very short time, she reached the quays. Her steps were rapid and agitated. She scarcely felt the weakness which reminded her of having sprained her foot when very young, and which obliged her to limp slightly. At any other hour in the day, her countenance would have awakened the suspicions of the least clear-sighted, attracted the attention of the most indifferent. But at half-past two in the morning, the streets of Paris are almost, if not quite, deserted, and scarcely is any one to be seen but the hard-working artisan on his way to earn his daily bread, or the roistering idlers of the streets, who are returning to their homes 
after a night of riot and debauchery. For the former the day was beginning, and for the latter it was just closing. La Vallière was afraid of both faces, in which her ignorance of Parisian types did not permit her to distinguish the type of probity from that of dishonesty. The appearance of misery alarmed her, and all she met seemed either vile or miserable. Her dress, which was the same she had worn during the previous evening, was elegant even in its careless disorder, for it was the one in which she had presented herself to the Queen Mother, and moreover, when she drew aside the mantle which covered her face in order to enable her to see the way she was going, her pallor and her beautiful eyes spoke an unknown language to the men she met. And unconsciously, the poor fugitive seemed to invite the brutal remarks of the one class, or to appeal to the compassion of the other. La Vallière still walked on in the same way, breathless and hurried, until she reached the top of the Place de Grève. She stopped from time to time, placed her hand upon her heart, leaned against a wall until she could breathe freely again, and then continued on her course more rapidly than before. On reaching the Place de Grève, La Vallière suddenly came upon a group of three drunken men, reeling and staggering along, who were just leaving a boat which they had made fast to the quay. The boat was freighted with wines, and it was apparent that they had done ample justice to the merchandise. They were celebrating their convivial exploits in three different quays, when suddenly, as they reached the end of the railing leading down to the quay, they found an obstacle in their path in the shape of this young girl. La Vallière stopped, while they, on their part, at the appearance of the young girl dressed in court costume, also halted, and seizing each other by the hand, they surrounded La Vallière, singing, O oh, all ye weary whites who mope alone, come drink and sing and laugh round Venus's throne. La Vallière at once understood that the men were insulting her, and wished to prevent her passing. She tried to do so several times, but her efforts were useless. Her limbs failed her. She felt she was on the point of falling, and uttered a cry of terror. At the same moment, the circle which surrounded her was suddenly broken through, in a most violent manner. One of her insulters was knocked to the left, another fell rolling over and over to the right, close to the water's edge, while the third could hardly keep his feet. An officer of the musketeers stood face to face with the young girl, with threatening brow and hand raised to carry out his threat. The drunken fellows, at the sight of the uniform, made their escape with what speed their staggering limbs could lend them all the more eagerly for the proof of strength which the wearer of the uniform had just afforded them. "'Is it possible,' exclaimed the musketeer, "'that it can be Mademoiselle de la Vallière?' La Vallière, bewildered by what had just happened, and confounded by hearing her name pronounced, looked up and recognised D'Artagnan. "'Oh!' "'Monsieur d'Artagnan, it is indeed I.' And at the same moment she seized his arm. "'You will protect me, will you not?' she added in a tone of entreaty. "'Most certainly I will protect you. But in heaven's name, where are you going at this hour?' "'I am going to Chaillot.' "'You are going to Chaillot?' by way of La Rappe. Why, mademoiselle, you are turning your back upon it. In that case, monsieur, be kind enough to put me in the right way, and to go with me a short distance. Most willingly. But how does it happen 
that I have found you here? By what merciful intervention were you sent to my assistance? I almost seem to be dreaming, or to be losing my senses. I happen to be here, mademoiselle, because I have a house in the Place de Greve, at the sign of the Notre Dame, the rent of which I went to receive yesterday, and where I, in fact, passed the night, and I also wish to be at the palace early, for the purposes of inspecting my posts. Thank you said La Valliere. "'That is what I was doing,' said D'Artagnan to himself. "'But what is she doing? And why is she going to Chaillot at such an hour?' And he offered her his arm, which she took, and began to walk with increased precipitation, which ill-concealed, however, her weakness. D'Artagnan perceived it, and proposed to La Valliere that she should take a little rest, which she refused. "'You are ignorant, perhaps, where Chaillot is?' inquired D'Artagnan. "'Quite so. "'It is a great distance. "'That matters very little. "'It is at least a league. "'I can walk it.' D'Artagnan did not reply. He could tell, merely by the tone of a voice, when a resolution was real or not. He rather bore along than accompanied La Valliere, until they perceived the elevated ground of Chaillot. "'What house are you going to, mademoiselle?' inquired D'Artagnan. "'To the Carmelites, monsieur.' "'To the Carmelites?' repeated D'Artagnan, in amazement. Yes, and since heaven has directed you towards me to give me your support on my road, accept both my thanks and my adieu. To the Carmelites! Your adieu! Are you going to become a nun? exclaimed D'Artagnan. Yes, monsieur. What? You! There was in this you, which we have marked by three notes of exclamation, in order to render it as expressive as possible, there was, we repeat, in this you, a complete poem. It recalled to La Valliere her old recollections of Blois, and her new recollections of Fontainebleau. It said to her, You, who might be happy with Raoul! You! who might be powerful with Louis. You, about to become a nun. Yes, monsieur, she said, I am going to devote myself to the service of heaven and to renounce the world entirely. But are you not mistaken with regard to your vocation? Are you not mistaken in supposing it to be the will of heaven? No, since heaven has been pleased to throw you in my way. Had it not been for you, I should certainly have sunk from fatigue on the road, and since heaven, I repeat, has thrown you in my way, it is because it has willed that I should carry out my intention. Oh, said D'Artagnan doubtingly, that is rather a subtle distinction, I think. Whatever it may be, returned the young girl, I have acquainted you with the steps I have taken, and with my fixed resolution. And now I have one last favour to ask of you, even while I return you my thanks. The king is entirely ignorant of my flight from the Palais Royal, and is ignorant also of what I am about to do. The king ignorant, you say, exclaimed D'Artagnan. Take care, mademoiselle, you are not aware of what you are doing. No one ought to do anything with which the king is unacquainted, especially those who belong to the court. 
I no longer belong to the court, monsieur. D'Artagnan looked at the young girl with increasing astonishment. Do not be uneasy, monsieur, she continued. I have well calculated everything, and were it not so, it would now be too late to reconsider my resolution. All is decided. Well, mademoiselle, what do you wish me to do? In the name of that sympathy which misfortune inspires, by your generous feeling, and by your honour as a gentleman, I entreat you to promise me one thing. Name it. Swear to me, Monsieur d'Artagnan, that you will not tell the king that you have seen me, and that I am at the Carmelites. I will not swear that, said d'Artagnan, shaking his head. Why? Because I know the king, I know you, I know myself even, nay, the whole human race, too well. No, no. I will not swear that. In that case, cried La Valliere, with an energy of which one would hardly have thought her capable, instead of the blessing which I should have implored for you until my dying day, I will invoke a curse, for you are rendering me the most miserable creature that ever lived. We have already observed that d'Artagnan could easily recognize the accents of truth and sincerity, and he could not resist this last appeal. He saw by her face how bitterly she suffered from a feeling of degradation. He remarked her trembling limbs, how her whole slight and delicate frame was violently agitated by some internal struggle, and clearly perceived that resistance might be fatal. I will do as you wish, then, he said. Be satisfied, mademoiselle. I will say nothing to the king. Oh, thank you, thank you, exclaimed La Valliere. You are the most generous man breathing. And in her extreme delight she seized hold of D'Artagnan's hands and pressed them between her own. D'Artagnan, who felt himself quite overcome, said, This is touching upon my word. She begins where others leave off. And La Valliere, who in the bitterness of her distress had sunk upon the ground, rose and walked towards the convent of the Carmelites, which could now, in the dawning light, be perceived just before them. D'Artagnan followed her at a distance. The entrance door was half open. She glided in like a shadow, and thanking D'Artagnan by a parting gesture, disappeared from his sight. When D'Artagnan found himself quite alone, he reflected very profoundly upon what had just taken place. Upon my word, he said, this looks very much like what is called a false position. To keep such a secret as that is to keep a burning coal in one's breeches pocket and trust that it may not burn the stuff. And yet, not to keep it, when I have sworn to do so, is dishonourable. It generally happens that some bright idea or other occurs to me as I am going along. But I am very much mistaken if I shall not now have to go a long way in order to find the solution of this affair. Yes, but which way to go? Oh, towards Paris, of course. That is the best way, after all. Only one must make haste. And in order to make haste, four legs are better than two. And I, unhappily, only have two. A horse, a horse, as I heard them say at the theatre in London, 
my kingdom for a horse. And now I think of it, it need not cost me so much as that, for at the Barriere de la Confrance there is a guard of musketeers, and instead of one horse I need, I shall find ten there. So in pursuance of this resolution, which he adopted with his usual rapidity, D'Artagnan immediately turned his back upon the heights of Chaillot, reached the guard-house, took the fastest horse he could find there, and was at the palace in less than ten minutes. It was striking five as he reached the Palais Royal. The king, he was told, had gone to bed at his usual hour, having been long engaged with Monsieur Colbert, and in all probability was still sound asleep. Come, said D'Artagnan, she spoke the truth. The king is ignorant of everything. If he only knew one half of what has happened, the Palais Royal. Chapter Twenty Seven of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Louise de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Twenty Seven. Showing how Louis, on his part, had passed the time from ten to half-past twelve at night. When Louis left the apartments of the maids of honour, he found Colbert awaiting him, to take directions for the next day's ceremony, as the king was then to receive the Dutch and Spanish ambassadors. Louis the Fourteenth had serious causes of dissatisfaction with the Dutch. The States had already been guilty of many mean shifts and evasions with France, and without perceiving or without caring about the chances of a rupture, they again abandoned the alliance with his most Christian majesty, for the purpose of entering into all kinds of plots with Spain. Louis the Fourteenth, at his accession, that is to say, at the death of Cardinal Mazarin, had found this political question roughly sketched out. The solution was difficult for a young man, but as at that time the king represented the whole nation, anything that the head resolved upon, the body could be found ready to carry out. Any sudden impulse of anger, the reaction of young hot blood upon the brain, would be quite sufficient to change an old form of policy and create another system altogether. The part that diplomatists had to play in those days was that of arranging among themselves the different coup d'etat which their sovereign masters might wish to effect. Louis was not in that calm frame of mind which was necessary to enable him to determine on a wise course of policy. Still much agitated from the quarrel he had just had with La Valliere, he walked hastily into his cabinet, dimly desirous of finding an opportunity of producing an explosion after he had controlled himself for so long a time. Colbert, as he saw the king enter, knew the position of affairs at a glance, understood the king's intentions, and resolved, therefore, to manoeuvre a little. When Louis requested to be informed what it would be necessary to say on the morrow, Colbert began by expressing his surprise that His Majesty had not been properly informed by Monsieur Fouquet. Monsieur Fouquet, he said, is perfectly acquainted with the whole of this Dutch affair. He received the dispatches himself direct. The king, 
who was accustomed to hear M. Colbert speak in not over-scrupulous terms of M. Fouquet, allowed this remark to pass unanswered, and merely listened. Colbert noticed the effect it had produced, and hastened to back out, saying that M. Fouquet was not on all occasions as blamable as at the first glance might seem to be the case, inasmuch as at the moment he was greatly occupied. The king looked up. "'What do you allude to?' he said. "'Sire, men are but men, and M. Fouquet has his defects as well as his great qualities.' "'Ah! Defects! Who is without them, M. Colbert?' "'Your Majesty, hardly,' said Colbert, boldly, for he knew how to convey a good deal of flattery in a light amount of blame. Like the arrow which cleaves the air notwithstanding its weight, thanks to the light feathers which bear it up. The King smiled. "'What defect has Monsieur Fouquet, then?' he said. "'Still the same, sire.' It is said he is in love. In love? With whom? I am not quite sure, sire. I have very little to do with matters of gallantry. At all events, you know, since you speak of it. I have heard a name mentioned. Whose? I cannot now remember whose. "'But I think it is one of Madame's maids of honour. The king started. "'You know more than you like to say, Monsieur Colbert,' he murmured. "'I assure you, no, sire.' "'At all events, Madame's maids of honour are all known, "'and in mentioning their names to you, "'you will perhaps recollect the one you allude to.' No, sire. At least try. It would be useless, sire. Whenever the name of any lady who runs the risk of being compromised is concerned, my memory is like a coffer of bronze, the key of which I have lost. A dark cloud seemed to pass over the mind as well as across the face of the king. Then, Wishing to appear as if he were perfect master of himself and his feelings, he said, "'And now, for the affair concerning Holland.' "'In the first place, sire, at what hour will your Majesty receive the ambassadors?' "'Early in the morning.' Eleven o'clock?' "'That is too late. Say nine o'clock.' "'That will be too early, sire.' "'For friends, that would be a matter of no importance. "'One does what one likes with one's friends. "'But for one's enemies, in that case, "'nothing could be better than if they were to feel hurt. "'I should not be sorry, I confess, "'to have to finish altogether with these marsh-birds, "'who annoy me with their cries.' It should be precisely as your Majesty desires. At nine o'clock, therefore, I will give the necessary orders. Is it to be a formal audience? No, I wish to have an explanation with them, and not to embitter matters, as is always the case when many persons are present. But at the same time, I wish to clear up everything with them, in order not to have to begin over again. Your Majesty will inform me of the persons you wish to be present at the reception. I will draw out a list. Let us speak of the ambassadors. What do they want? Allies with Spain, they gain nothing. Allies with France, they lose much. How is that? Allied with Spain, 
they see themselves bounded and protected by the possessions of their allies. They cannot touch them, however anxious they may be to do so. From Antwerp to Rotterdam is but a step, and that by way of the Scheldt and the Meurs. If they wish to make a bite at the Spanish cake, you, sire, the son-in-law of the King of Spain, could, with your cavalry, sweep the earth from your dominions to Brussels in a couple of days. Their design is, therefore, only to quarrel so far with you, and only to make you suspect Spain so far as will be sufficient to induce you not to interfere with their own affairs. It would be far more simple, I should imagine, replied the king, to form a solid alliance with me, by means of which I should gain something, while they would gain everything. Not so, for if by chance they were to have you, or France rather, as a boundary, your majesty is not an agreeable neighbour. Young, ardent, warlike, the King of France might inflict some serious mischief on Holland, especially if he were to get near her. I perfectly understand, Monsieur Colbert, and you have explained it very clearly. But be good enough to tell me the conclusion you have arrived at. Your Majesty's own decisions are never deficient in wisdom. What will these ambassadors say to me? They will tell your majesty that they are ardently desirous of forming an alliance with you, which will be a falsehood. They will tell Spain that the three powers ought to unite so as to check the prosperity of England, and that will equally be a falsehood. For at present, the natural ally of your majesty is England, who has ships while we have none. England, who can counteract Dutch influence in India. England, in fact, a monocle country, to which your majesty is attached by ties of relationship. Good. But how would you answer? I should answer, sire, with the greatest possible moderation of tone, that the disposition of Holland does not seem friendly towards the court of France, that the symptoms of public feeling among the Dutch are alarming as regards your majesty, that certain medals have been struck with insulting devices. "'Towards me!' exclaimed the young king excitedly. "'Oh, no, sire, no! "'Insulting is not the word. "'I was mistaken. "'I ought to have said, "'immeasurably flattering to the Dutch. "'Oh, if that be so, "'the pride of the Dutch is a matter of indifference to me,' "'said the king, sighing. "'Your Majesty is right, a thousand times right, However, it is never a mistake in politics, your majesty knows better than myself, to exaggerate a little, in order to obtain a concession in your own favour. If your majesty were to complain, as if your susceptibility were offended, you would stand in a far higher position with them. "'What are these medals you speak of?' inquired Louis. "'for if I allude to them, I ought to know what to say.' "'Upon my word, sire, I cannot very well tell you. "'Some overweeningly conceited device. "'That is the sense of it. "'The words have little to do with the thing itself.' "'Very good. "'I will mention the word medal, "'and they can understand it if they like.' Oh, they will understand without any difficulty. Your Majesty, 
can also slip in a few words about certain pamphlets which are being circulated. Never! Pamphlets befoul those who write them, much more than those against whom they are written. Monsieur Colbert, I thank you. You can leave now. Do not forget the hour I have fixed, and be there yourself. Sire, I await your Majesty's list. True, returned the King. He began to meditate. He had not thought of the list in the least. The clock struck half-past eleven. The King's face revealed a violent conflict between pride and love. The political conversation had dispelled a good deal of the irritation which Louis had felt, and La Vallière's pale, worn features, in his imagination, spoke a very different language from that of the Dutch medals or the Batavian pamphlets. He sat for ten minutes debating within himself whether he should or should not return to La Vallière. But Colbert, having with some urgency respectfully requested that the list might be furnished him, the king was ashamed to be thinking of mere matters of affection, where important state affairs required his attention. He therefore dictated, The Queen Mother, The Queen, Madame, Madame de Motteville, Madame de Châtillon, Madame de Navailles, and for the men, Monsieur le Prince, Monsieur de Cremont, Monsieur de Manicon, Monsieur de Saint-Aignan, and the officers on duty. The ministers? asked Colbert. As a matter of course, and the secretaries also. Sire, I will leave at once in order to get everything prepared. The orders will be at the different residences to-morrow. Say rather to-day, replied Louis mournfully, as the clock struck twelve. It was the very hour when poor La Vallière was almost dying from anguish and bitter suffering. The king's attendants entered it being the hour of his retirement to his chamber. The Queen, indeed, had been waiting for more than an hour. Louis accordingly retreated to his bedroom with a sigh. But as he sighed, he congratulated himself on his courage, and applauded himself Chapter twenty eight of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter twenty eight. The Ambassadors. D'Artagnan had, with very few exceptions, learned almost all of the particulars of what we have just been relating, for among his friends he reckoned all the useful, serviceable people in the royal household, officious attendants who were proud of being recognized by the captain of the musketeers, for the captain's influence was very great, and then, in addition to any ambitious views they may have imagined he could promote, they were proud of being regarded as worth being spoken to by a man as brave as D'Artagnan. In this manner D'Artagnan learned every morning what he had not been able either to see or to ascertain the night before, from the simple fact of his not being ubiquitous, so that, with the information he had been able by his own means to pick up during the day, and with what he had gathered from others, he succeeded in making up a bundle of weapons which he was in the prudent habit of using only when the occasion required. In this way, 
d'artagnan's two eyes rendered him the same service as the hundred eyes of argus political secrets bedside revelations hints or scraps of conversation dropped by the courtiers on the threshold of the royal antechamber in this way d'artagnan managed to ascertain and to store away everything in the vast and impenetrable mausoleum of his memory by the side of those royal secrets so dearly bought and faithfully preserved he therefore knew of the king's interview with colbert and the appointment made for the ambassadors in the morning and consequently that the question of the medals would be brought up for debate and while he was arranging and constructing the conversation upon a few chance words which had reached his ears he returned to his post in the royal apartments so as to be there at the very moment the king awoke it happened that the king rose very early proving thereby that he too on his side had slept but indifferently towards seven o'clock he half opened his door very gently d'artagnan was at his post his majesty was pale and seemed wearied he had not moreover quite finished dressing send for monsieur de saint-aignan he said saint-aignan was probably awaiting a summons for the messenger when he reached his apartment found him already dressed saint-aignan hastened to the king in obedience of the summons a moment afterwards the king and saint-aignan passed by together the king walking first d'artagnan went to the window which looked out upon the courtyard he had no need to put himself to the trouble of watching in what direction the king went for he had no difficulty in guessing beforehand where his majesty was going the king in fact bent his steps towards the apartments of the maids of honour a circumstance which in no way astonished d'artagnan for he more than suspected although la valliere had not breathed a syllable on the subject that the king had some kind of reparation to make saint-aignan followed him as he had done the previous evening rather less uneasy in his mind though still slightly agitated for he fervently trusted that at seven o'clock in the morning there might be only himself and the king awake amongst the august guests at the palace d'artagnan stood at the window careless and perfectly calm in his manner one could almost have sworn that he noticed nothing and was utterly ignorant who were these two hunters after adventures passing like shadows across the courtyard wrapped up in their cloaks and yet all the while that d'artagnan appeared not to be looking at them at all he did not for one moment lose sight of them and while he whistled that old march of the musketeers which he rarely recalled except under great emergencies he conjectured and prophesied how terrible would be the storm which would be raised on the king's return in fact when the king entered la valliere's apartment and found the room empty and the bed untouched he began to be alarmed and called out to montalais who immediately answered the summons but her astonishment was equal to the king's all that she could tell his majesty was that she had fancied she had heard la valliere's weeping during a portion of the night but knowing that his majesty had paid her a visit she had not dared to inquire what was the matter but inquired the king where do you suppose she has gone sire replied montalais louise is of a very sentimental disposition and as i have often seen her rise at daybreak in order to go out into the garden she may perhaps be there now this appeared probable and the king immediately ran down the staircase in search of the fugitive d'artagnan saw him grow very pale and talking in an excited manner with his companion as he went towards the gardens saint-aignan followed him out of breath d'artagnan did not stir from the window but went on whistling looking as if he saw nothing yet seeing everything come come he murmured when the king disappeared his majesty's passion is stronger than i thought he is now doing i think what he never did for mademoiselle de mancini in a quarter of an hour the king again appeared he had looked everywhere was completely out of breath and as a matter of course had not discovered anything saint-aignan who still followed him was fanning himself with his hat and in a gasping voice asking for information about la valliere 
from such of the servants as were about, in fact, from every one he met. Among others, he came across Manicon, who had arrived from Fontainebleau by easy stages, for whilst others had performed the journey in six hours, he had taken four and twenty. "'Have you seen Mademoiselle de la Valliere? saint Saint-Aignan asked him. Whereupon Manicon, dreamy and absent as usual, answered, thinking that someone was asking him about de Guiche, "'Thank you, the Comte is a little better.' As he continued on his way, until he reached the antechamber where D'Artagnan was, whom he asked to explain how it was that the king looked, as he thought, so bewildered, to which D'Artagnan replied that he was quite mistaken, that the king, on the contrary, was as lively and merry as he could possibly be. In the midst of all this, eight o'clock struck. It was usual for the king to take his breakfast at this hour, for the code of etiquette prescribed that the king should always be hungry at eight o'clock. His breakfast was laid upon a small table in his bedroom, and he ate very fast. Centennial, of whom he would not lose sight, waited on the king. He then disposed of several military audiences, during which he dispatched Centennial to see what he could find out. Then, still occupied, full of anxiety, still watching Centennial's return, who had sent out the servants in every direction to make inquiries, and who had also gone himself, the hour of nine struck, and the king forthwith passed into his large cabinet. As the clock was striking nine, the ambassadors entered, and as it finished, the two queens and madame made their appearance. There were three ambassadors from Holland and two from Spain. The king glanced at them and then bowed, and at the same moment saint entered an entrance which the king regarded as far more important, on a different sense, however, than that of the ambassadors, however numerous they might be, and from whatever country they came. And so, setting everything aside, the king made a sign of interrogation to saint Aignan, which the latter answered by a most decided negative. The king almost entirely lost his courage, but as the queens, the members of the nobility who were present, and the ambassadors, had their eyes fixed upon him, he overcame his emotion by a violent effort, and invited the latter to speak, whereupon one of the Spanish deputies made a long oration, in which he boasted the advantages which the Spanish alliance would offer. The king interrupted him, saying, Monsieur, I trust that whatever is best for France must be exceedingly advantageous for Spain. This remark, and particularly the peremptory tone in which it was pronounced, made the ambassadors pale, and brought the colour into the cheeks of the two queens, who, being Spanish, felt wounded in their pride of relationship and nationality by this reply. The Dutch ambassador then began to address himself to the king, and complained of the injurious suspicions which the king exhibited against the government of his country. The king interrupted him, saying, "'It is very singular, monsieur, that you should come with any complaint, when it is I, rather, who have reason to be dissatisfied, and yet, you see, I do not complain. Complain, sire, and in what respect? The king smiled bitterly. Will you blame me, monsieur, he said, if I should happen to entertain suspicions against a government which authorizes and protects international impertinence? Sire! I tell you, resumed the king, exciting himself by a recollection of his own personal annoyance, rather than from political grounds, that Holland is a land of refuge for all who hate me, and especially for all who malign me. Oh, sire! You wish for proofs, perhaps, very good. They can be had easily enough. Whence proceed all those vile and insolent pamphlets which represent me as a monarch without glory and without authority? Your printing press is grown under their number. If my secretaries were here, I would mention the titles of the works, as well as the names of the printers. Sire, replied the ambassador, a pamphlet can hardly be regarded as the work of a whole nation. Is it just, is it reasonable, that a great and powerful monarch like your majesty should render a whole nation responsible for the crime of a few madmen, who are, perhaps, only scribbling in a garret for a few sous to buy bread for their family? 
That may be the case, I admit, but when the mint itself at Amsterdam strikes off medals which reflect disgrace upon me, is that also the crime of a few madmen? Medals, stammered out the ambassador. Medals, repeated the king, looking at Colbert. Your majesty, the ambassador ventured, should be quite sure. The king still looked at Colbert, but Colbert appeared not to understand him, and maintained an unbroken silence, notwithstanding the king's repeated hints. D'Artagnan then approached the king, and taking a piece of money out of his pocket, he placed it in the king's hands, saying, This is the medal your majesty alludes to. The king looked at it, and with a look which, ever since he had become his own master, was ever piercing as the eagle's, observed an insulting device representing Holland arresting the progress of the sun, with this inscription, In conspectu meo stetis sol. In my presence the sun stands still, exclaimed the king furiously. Ah, you will hardly deny it now, I suppose. And the sun, said D'Artagnan, is this, as he pointed to the panels of the cabinet, where the sun was brilliantly represented in every direction, with this motto, Nec pluribus impar. Louis anger, increased by the bitterness of his own personal sufferings, hardly required this additional circumstance to ferment it. Every one saw from the kindling passion in the king's eyes that an explosion was imminent. A look from Colbert kept postponed the bursting of the storm. The ambassador ventured to frame excuses by saying that the vanity of nations was a matter of little consequence, that Holland was proud that, with such limited resources, she had maintained her rank as a great nation, even against powerful monarchs, and that if a little smoke had intoxicated his countrymen, the king would be kindly disposed, and would even excuse, this intoxication. The king seemed as if he would be glad of some suggestion. He looked at Colbert, who remained impassable, then at D'Artagnan, who simply shrugged his shoulders, a movement which was like the opening of the floodgates, whereby the king's anger, which he had restrained for so long a period, now burst forth. As no one knew what direction his anger might take, all preserved a dead silence. The second ambassador took advantage of it to begin his excuses also. While he was speaking, and while the king, who had again gradually returned to his own personal reflections, was automatically listening to the voice, full of nervous anxiety, with the air of an absent man listening to the murmuring of a cascade, D'Artagnan, on whose left hand saint Aignan was standing, approached the latter, and, in a voice which was loud enough to reach the king's ears, said, "'Have you heard the news?' "'What news?' said saint Aignan. "'About La Valliere.' The king started, and advanced his head. "'What has happened to La Valliere?' inquired saint Aignan, in a tone which can easily be imagined. "'Ah, poor girl, she is going to take the veil.' "'The veil?' exclaimed saint Aignan. "'The veil?' cried the king, in the midst of the ambassador's discourse. But then, mindful of the rules of etiquette, he mastered himself, still listening, however, with rapt attention. "'What order?' inquired saint Aignan. "'The Carmelites of Chayot. "'Who the deuce told you that? "'She did herself. "'You have seen her, then? "'Nay, I even went with her to the Carmelites.' The king did not lose a syllable of this conversation, and again he could hardly control his feelings. "'But what was the cause of her flight?' inquired saint Aignan. "'Because the poor girl was driven away from the court yesterday,' replied D'Artagnan. He had no sooner said this than the king, with an authoritative gesture, said to the ambassador, "'Enough, monsieur, enough!' Then, advancing towards the captain, he exclaimed, who says Mademoiselle de la Valliere is going to take the religious vows? Monsieur d'Artagnan, answered the favourite. Is it true what you say, said the king, turning towards the musketeer? As true as truth itself. The king clenched his hands and turned pale. You have something further to add, Monsieur d'Artagnan, he said. I know nothing more, sire. You added that Mademoiselle de la Valliere had been driven away from the court. Yes, sire. Is that true also? Ascertain for yourself, sire. And from whom? Ah, sighed D'Artagnan. 
like a man who is declining to say anything further. The king almost bounded from his seat, regardless of ambassadors, ministers, courtiers, queens, and politics. The queen mother rose. She had heard everything, or, if she had not heard everything, she had guessed it. Madame, almost fainting from anger and fear, endeavoured to rise as the queen mother had done, but she sank down again upon her chair, which, by an instinctive movement, she made roll back a few paces. "'Gentlemen,' said the king, "'the audience is over. I will communicate my answer, or rather my will, to Spain and to Holland,' and with a proud, imperious gesture he dismissed the ambassadors. "'Take care, my son,' said the queen mother indignantly. "'You are hardly master of yourself, I think.' "'Ah, madame,' returned the young lion, with a terrible gesture, "'if I am not master of myself, I will be, I promise you, of those who do me a deadly injury. Come with me, Monsieur d'Artagnan, come.' And he quitted the room in the midst of general stupefaction and dismay. The king hastily descended the staircase, and was about to cross the courtyard. "'Sire,' said d'Artagnan, "'your majesty mistakes the way.' "'No, I am going to the stables.' "'That is useless, sire, for I have horses ready for your majesty.' The king's only answer was a look, but... Chapter 29 of Louise de la Valliere this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 29 Chaillot Although they had not been summoned, Manicamp and Malicorne had followed the king and d'Artagnan. They were both exceedingly intelligent men, except that Malicorne was too precipitate, owing to ambition, while Manicamp was frequently too tardy, owing to indolence. On this occasion, however, they arrived at precisely the proper moment. Five horses were in readiness. Two were seized upon by the king and d'Artagnan two others by Manicamp and Malicorne, while a groom belonging to the stables mounted the fifth. The cavalcade set off at a gallop. D'Artagnan had been very careful in his selection of the horses. They were the very animals for distressed lovers, horses which did not simply run, but flew. Within ten minutes after their departure, the cavalcade, amidst a cloud of dust, arrived at Chaillot. The king literally threw himself off his horse, but notwithstanding the rapidity with which he accomplished this manoeuvre, he found D'Artagnan already holding his stirrup. With a sign of acknowledgment to the musketeer, he threw the bridle to the groom and darted into the vestibule, violently pushed open the door, and entered the reception-room. Manicon, Malicorne, and the groom remained outside, D'Artagnan alone following him. When he entered the reception-room, the first object which met his gaze was Louise herself, not simply on her knees, but lying at the foot of a large stone crucifix. The young girl was stretched upon the damp flagstones, scarcely visible in the gloom of the apartment which was lighted only by means of a narrow window, protected by bars, and completely shaded by creeping plants. When the king saw her in this state, he thought she was dead, and uttered a loud cry, which made D'Artagnan hurry into the room. The king had already passed one of his arms around her body, and D'Artagnan assisted him in raising the poor girl, whom the torpor of death seemed already to have taken possession of. D'Artagnan seized hold of the alarm-bell, and rang with all his might. The Carmelite sisters immediately hastened at the summons, and uttered loud exclamations of alarm 
and indignation at the sight of two men holding a woman in their arms. The superior also hurried to the scene of action, but far more a creature of the world than any of the female members of the court, notwithstanding her austerity of manners, she recognised the king at the first glance, by the respect which those present exhibited for him, as well as by the imperious and authoritative way in which he had thrown the whole establishment into confusion. As soon as she saw the king, she retired to her own apartments, in order to avoid compromising her dignity. But by one of the nuns she sent various cordials, hungry water, etc., etc., and ordered that all the doors should immediately be closed, a command which was just in time, for the king's distress was fast becoming of a most clamorous and despairing character. He had almost decided to send for his own physician, when La Vallière exhibited signs of returning animation. The first object which met her gaze as she opened her eyes was the king at her feet. In all probability she did not recognize him, for she uttered a deep sigh full of anguish and distress. Louis fixed his eyes devouringly upon her face, and when in the course of a few moments she recognized Louis, she endeavored to tear herself from his embrace. "'Oh, heavens!' she murmured. "'Is not the sacrifice yet made?' "'No! No!' exclaimed the king. "'And it shall not be made, I swear!' Notwithstanding her weakness and utter despair, she rose from the ground, saying, "'It must be made, however. It must be. So do not stay me in my purpose.' "'I! Leave you to sacrifice yourself! I! Never! Never!' exclaimed the king. "'Well,' murmured D'Artagnan, "'I may as well go now.' As soon as they begin to speak, we may as well prevent there being any listeners. And he quitted the room, leaving the lovers alone. Sire, continued La Valliere, not another word, I implore you. Do not destroy the only future I can hope for my salvation. Do not destroy the glory and brightness of your own future, for a mere caprice.' "'A caprice!' cried the king. "'Oh, sire, it is now only that I can see clearly into your heart.' "'You, Louise? What mean you?' "'An inexplicable impulse, foolish and unreasonable in its nature, may ephemerally appear to offer a sufficient excuse for your conduct.' but there are duties imposed upon you which are incompatible with your regard for a poor girl such as I am. So forget me. I forget you. You have already done so once. Rather would I die. You cannot love one whose peace of mind you hold so lightly and whom you so cruelly abandoned last night to the bitterness of death. What can you mean? Explain yourself, Louise. What did you ask me yesterday morning? To love you. What did you promise me in return? Never to let midnight pass without offering me an opportunity of reconciliation, if by any chance your anger should be roused against me. Oh, forgive me, Louise, forgive me! I was mad with jealousy. Jealousy is a sentiment unworthy of a king, a man. You may become jealous again, and will end by killing me. Be merciful, then, and leave me now to die. 
another word, mademoiselle, in that strain, and you will see me expire at your feet. No, no, sire, I am better acquainted with my own demerits, and believe me that to sacrifice yourself for one whom all despise would be needless. Give me the names of those you have cause to complain of. I have no complaint, sire, to prefer against any one, no one but myself to accuse. Farewell, sire. You are compromising yourself in speaking to me in such a manner. Oh, be careful, Louise, in what you say. You are reducing me to the darkness of despair. Oh, sire, sire, leave me at least the protection of heaven, I implore you. No, no, heaven itself shall not tear me from you. Save me, then, cried the poor girl, from those determined and pitiless enemies who are thirsting to annihilate my life and honour too. If you have courage enough to love me, show at least that you have power enough to defend me. But no, she whom you say you love, others insult and mock, and drive shamelessly away. And the gentle-hearted girl, forced by her own bitter distress to accuse others, wrung her hands in an uncontrollable agony of tears. "'You have been driven away!' exclaimed the king. "'This is the second time I have heard that said.' "'I have been driven away with shame and ignominy, sire. "'You see, then, that I have no other protector but heaven, "'no consolation but prayer, "'and this cloister is my only refuge.' "'My palace, my whole court, shall be your park of peace. "'Oh, fear nothing further now, Louise. "'Those, be they men or women, who yesterday drove you away, "'shall to-morrow tremble before you. "'To-morrow, do I say. "'Nay, this very day I have already shown my displeasure, "'have already threatened.' It is in my power, even now, to hurl the thunderbolt I have hitherto withheld. Louise, Louise, you shall be bitterly revenged. Tears of blood shall repay for the tears you have shed. Give me only the names of your enemies. Never, never. How can I show any anger, then? Sire, those upon whom your anger would be prepared to fall would force you to draw back your hand upraised to punish. Oh, you do not know me, cried the king, exasperated. Rather than draw back, I would sacrifice my kingdom and would abjure my family. Yes, I would strike until this arm had utterly destroyed all those who had ventured to make themselves the enemies of the gentlest and best of creatures. And as he said these words, Louis struck his fist violently against the oaken wainscoting with a force which alarmed La Valliere, for his anger, owing to his unbounded power, had something imposing and threatening in it like the lightning which may at any time prove deadly. She, who thought that her own sufferings could not be surpassed, was overwhelmed by a suffering which revealed itself by menace and by violence. "'Sire,' she said, "'for the last time I implore you to leave me.' Already do I feel strengthened by the calm seclusion of this asylum, and the protection of heaven has reassured me. For all the petty human meanness of this world are forgotten beneath the divine protection. Once more, then, sire, 
and for the last time, I implore you to leave me. Confess, rather, cried Louis, that you have never loved me. Admit that my humility and my repentance are flattering to your pride, but that my distress affects you not. That the king of this wide realm is no longer regarded as a lover whose tenderness of devotion is capable of working out your happiness, but as a despot whose caprice has crushed your very heart beneath his iron heel. Do not say you are seeking heaven. Say, rather, you are fleeing from the king. Louise's heart was wrung within her as she listened to his passionate utterance, which made the fever of hope course once more through her every vein. But did you not hear me say that I have been driven away, scorned, despised? I will make you the most respected and most adored and the most envied of my whole court. Prove to me that you have not ceased to love me. In what way? By leaving me. I will prove it to you by never leaving you again. But do you imagine, sire, that I shall allow that? Do you imagine that I will let you come to an open rupture with every member of your family? Do you imagine that for my sake you could abandon mother, wife, and sister? Ah! You have named them then at last. It is they then who have wrought this grievous injury. By the heaven above us then, upon them shall my anger fall. That is the very reason why my future terrifies me, why I refuse everything, why I do not wish you to revenge me. Tears enough have already been shed, sufficient sorrow and affliction have already been occasioned. I at least will never be the cause of sorrow or affliction or distress to whomsoever it may be, for I have mourned and suffered and wept too much myself. And do you count my sufferings, my tears, as nothing? In heaven's name, sire, do not speak to me in that manner. I need all my courage to enable me to accomplish the sacrifice. Louise, Louise, I implore you, whatever you desire, Whatever you command, whether vengeance or forgiveness, your slightest wish shall be obeyed, but do not abandon me. Alas, sire, we must part. You do not love me, then? Heaven knows I do. It is false, Louise, it is false. Oh, sire! If I did not love you, I should let you do what you please. I should let you revenge me in return for the insult which has been inflicted on me. I should accept the brilliant triumph to my pride which you propose. And yet you cannot deny that I reject even the sweet compensation your affection affords. That affection which for me is life itself for I wished to die when I thought that you loved me no longer. Yes, yes, I now know, I now perceive it. You are the sweetest and best and purest of women. There is no one so worthy as yourself, not alone of my respect and devotion, but also the respect and devotion of all who surround me and therefore no one shall be loved like yourself. No one shall ever possess the influence over me that you wield. You wish me to be calm, to forgive. Be it so, 
you shall find me perfectly unmoved. You wish to reign by gentleness and clemency. I will be clement and gentle. Dictate for me the conduct you wish me to adopt, and I will obey blindly. In heaven's name, no, sire. What am I, a poor girl, to dictate to so great a monarch as yourself? You are my life, the very spirit and principle of my being. Is it not the spirit that rules the body? You love me, then, sire. On my knees, yes. With my hands upraised to you, yes. With all the strength and power of my being, yes. I love you so deeply that I would lay down my life for you, gladly, at your merest wish. O oh, sire, now I know you love me, I have nothing to wish for in the world. Give me your hand, sire, and then farewell. I have enjoyed in this life all the happiness I was ever meant for. Oh, no, no, your happiness is not a happiness of yesterday. It is of today, of tomorrow, ever enduring. The future is yours. Everything which is mine is yours too. Away with these ideas of separation, away with these gloomy, despairing thoughts. You will live for me as I will live for you, Louise. And he threw himself at her feet, embracing her knees with the wildest transports of joy and gratitude. Oh, sire, sire, all that is but a wild dream. Why a wild dream? Because I cannot return to the court. Exiled, how can I see you again? Would it not be far better to bury myself in a cloister for the rest of my life, with the rich consolation that your affection gives me, with the pulses of your heart beating for me, and your latest confession of attachment still ringing in my ears. "'Exiled! You!' exclaimed Louis the Fourteenth. "'And who dares to exile, let me ask, when I recall?' "'Oh, sire, something which is greater than, and superior to the kings even, the world and public opinion.' Reflect for a moment. You cannot love a woman who has been ignominiously driven away. Love one whom your mother has stained with suspicions, one whom your sister has threatened with disgrace. Such a woman, indeed, would be unworthy of you. Unworthy? One who belongs to me? Yes, sire, precisely on that account. From the very moment she belongs to you, the character of your mistress renders her unworthy. You are right, Louise. Every shade of delicacy of feeling is yours. Very well. You shall not be exiled. Ah! From the tone in which you speak, you have not heard Madame. That is very clear. I will appeal from her to my mother. Again, sire, you have not seen your mother. She, too! My poor Louise! Everyone's hand, then, is against you. Yes, yes, poor Louise, who was already bending beneath the fury of the storm, when you arrived and crushed her beneath the weight of your displeasure. Oh, forgive me! You will not, I know, be able to make either of them yield. Believe me, the evil cannot be repaired, 
for I will not allow you to use violence or to exercise your authority. Very well, Louise. To prove to you how fondly I love you, I will do one thing. I will see Madame. I will make her revoke her sentence. I will compel her to do so. Compel? Oh, no, no. True, you are right. I will bend her. Louise shook her head. I will entreat her if it be necessary, said Louis. Will you believe in my affection after that? Louise drew herself up. Oh, never, never shall you humiliate yourself on my account. Sooner a thousand times would I die. Louis reflected. His features assumed a dark expression. I will love you as much as you have loved. I will suffer as keenly as you have suffered. This shall be my expiation in your eyes. Come, mademoiselle, put aside these paltry considerations. Let us show ourselves as great as our sufferings, as strong as our affection for each other. And as he said this, he took her in his arms and encircled her waist with both his hands, saying, My own love, my own dearest and best beloved, follow me. She made a final effort, in which she concentrated, no longer all of her firmness of will, for that had long since been overcome, but all her physical strength. No, she replied weakly. No, no, I should die from shame. No, you shall return like a queen. No one knows of your having left, except indeed d'Artagnan. He has betrayed me, then. In what way? He promised faithfully. I promised to say nothing to the king said d'Artagnan, putting his head through the half-open door. And I kept my word. I was speaking to Monsieur de Saint-Aignan, and it was not my fault if the king overheard me. Was it, sire? It is quite true, said the king. Forgive him. La Valliere smiled, and held out her small white hand to the musketeer. Monsieur d'Artagnan, said the king. Be good enough to see if you can find a carriage for Mademoiselle de la Valliere. Sire, said the captain, the carriage is waiting at the gate. You are a magic mould of forethought, exclaimed the king. You have taken a long time to find it out, muttered d'Artagnan, notwithstanding he was flattered by the praise bestowed upon him. La Valliere was overcome. After a little further hesitation, she allowed herself to be led away, half fainting by her royal lover. But as she was on the point of leaving the room, she tore herself from the king's grasp and returned to the stone crucifix, which she kissed, saying, O oh, heaven, it was thou who drewest me hither, thou who has rejected me. But thy grace is infinite. Whenever I shall return again, forget that I have ever separated myself from thee. For when I return, it will be never to leave thee again. The king could not restrain his emotion, and D'Artagnan even was overcome. Louis led the young girl away, lifted her into the carriage, and directed D'Artagnan to seat himself beside her, while he, mounting his horse, spurred violently towards the Palais Royal, where immediately on his
Chapter Thirty of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Thirty, Madame. From the manner in which the king had dismissed the ambassadors. Even the least clear-sighted persons belonging to the court imagined war would ensue. The ambassadors themselves, but slightly acquainted with the king's domestic disturbances, had interpreted as directed against themselves the celebrated sentence, "'If I be not master of myself, I at least will be so of those who insult me.' Happily for the destinies of France and Holland, Colbert had followed them out of the king's presence for the purpose of explaining matters to them. But the two queens and madame, who were perfectly aware of every particular that had taken place, in their several households, having heard the king's remark so full of dark meaning, retired to their own apartments in no little fear and chagrin. Madame especially felt that the royal anger might fall upon her, and as she was brave and exceedingly proud, instead of seeking support and encouragement from the Queen Mother, she had returned to her own apartments, if not without some uneasiness, at least without any intention of avoiding an encounter. Anne of Austria, from time to time, at frequent intervals, sent messages to learn if the King had returned. The silence which the whole palace preserved upon the matter, and upon Louise's disappearance, was indicative of a long train of misfortunes to all those who knew the haughty and irritable humour of the king. But Madame, unmoved in spite of all the flying rumours, shut herself up in her apartments, sent for Montalais, and with a voice as calm as she could possibly command, desired her to relate all she knew about the event itself. At the moment that the eloquent Montalais was concluding, with all kinds of oratorical precautions, and was recommending, if not in actual language, at least in spirit, that she should show forbearance towards La Valliere, M. Malicorne made his appearance to beg an audience of Madame on behalf of the King. Montalais's worthy friend bore upon his countenance all the signs of the very liveliest emotion. It was impossible to be mistaken. The interview which the king requested would be one of the most interesting chapters in the history of the hearts of kings and of men. Madame was disturbed by her brother-in-law's arrival. She did not expect it so soon, nor had she, indeed, expected any direct step on Louis's part. Besides, all women who wage war successfully by indirect means are invariably neither very skilful nor very strong when it becomes a question of accepting a pitched battle. Madame, however, was not one who ever drew back. She had the very opposite defect, or qualification, in whichever light it may be considered. She took an exaggerated view of what constituted real courage, and therefore the king's message of which Malicorne had been the bearer was regarded by her as the bugle-note, proclaiming the commencement of hostilities. She therefore boldly accepted the gauge of battle. Five minutes afterwards the king ascended the staircase. His colour was heightened from having ridden hard. His dusty and disordered clothes formed a singular contrast with the fresh and perfectly arranged toilet of Madame who, notwithstanding rouge on her cheeks, turned pale as Louis entered the room. Louis lost no time in approaching the object of his visit. He sat down, and Montalais disappeared. "'My dear sister,' said the king, "'you are aware that Mademoiselle de la Valliere fled from her room this morning, and that she has retired to a cloister, overwhelmed by grief and despair?' As he pronounced these words, the king's voice was singularly moved. "'Your Majesty is the first to inform me of it,' replied Madame. 
"'I should have thought that you might have learned it this morning, "'during the reception of the ambassadors,' said the king. "'From your emotion, sire, I imagined that something extraordinary had happened, "'but without knowing what.' The king, with his usual frankness, went straight to the point. "'Why did you send Mademoiselle de la Vallier away?' "'Because I had reason to be dissatisfied with her conduct,' she replied dryly. The king became crimson, and his eyes kindled with a fire which it required all Madame's courage to support. He mastered his anger, however, and continued— "'A stronger reason than that is surely requisite "'for one so good and kind as you are. "'To turn away and dishonour "'not only the young girl herself, "'but every member of her family as well. "'You know that the whole city "'has its eyes fixed upon the conduct "'of the female portion of the court. "'To dismiss a maid of honour "'is to attribute a crime to her, "'at the very least a fault. "'What crime?' "'What fault has Mademoiselle de la Vallier been guilty of?' "'Since you constitute yourself the protector of Mademoiselle de la Vallier,' replied Madame coldly, "'I will give you those explanations, which I should have a perfect right to withhold from every one.' "'Even the King!' exclaimed Louis, as with a sudden gesture he covered his head with his hat. "'You have called me your sister,' said Madame, "'and I am in my own apartments.' "'It matters not,' said the youthful monarch, "'ashamed at having been hurried away by his anger. "'Neither you nor any one else in this kingdom "'can assert a right to withhold an explanation in my presence.' "'Since that is the way you regard it,' said Madame, "'in a hoarse, angry tone of voice, "'All that remains for me to do is bow submission to your majesty, and to be silent.' "'Not so. Let there be no equivocation between us.' "'The protection with which you surround Mademoiselle de la Vallière does not impose any respect.' "'No equivocation, I repeat. You are perfectly aware—' that as the head of the nobility in France I am accountable to all for the honour of every family. You dismiss Mademoiselle de la Vallière, or whoever else it may be, Madame shrugged her shoulders, or whoever else it may be, I repeat, continued the King, and as, acting in that manner, you cast a dishonourable reflection upon that person, I ask you for an explanation in order that I may confirm or annul the sentence. "'Annul my sentence?' exclaimed Madame haughtily. "'What? When I have discharged one of my attendants, do you order me to take her back again?' The king remained silent. "'This would be sheer abuse of power, sire.' "'It would be indecorous and unseemly. "'Madame!' "'As a woman, I should revolt against an abuse so insulting to me. "'I should no longer be able to regard myself as a princess of your blood, "'a daughter of a monarch. "'I should be the meanest of creatures, "'more humbled and disgraced than the servant I had sent away.' "'The king rose from his seat with anger. "'It cannot be a heart,' he cried, "'that you have beating in your bosom. "'If you act in such a way with me, "'I may have reason to act with corresponding severity. "'It sometimes happens that in a battle "'a chance ball may reach its mark. "'The observation which the king had made "'without any particular intention "'struck Madame home and staggered her for a moment.' Some day or other she might indeed have reason to dread reprisals. "'At all events, sire,' she said, "'explain what you require.' "'I ask, madame, what has Mademoiselle de la Vallière done to warrant your conduct toward her?' 
she is the most cunning fermenter of intrigues i know she was the occasion of two personal friends engaging in mortal combat and has made people talk of her in such shameless terms that the whole court is indignant at the mere sound of her name she she cried the king under her soft and hypocritical manner continued madame she hides a disposition full of foul and dark conceit she you may possibly be deceived sire but i know her right well she is capable of creating dispute and misunderstanding between the most affectionate relatives and the most intimate friends you see that she has already sown discord betwixt us two i do assure you said the king sire look well into the case as it stands we were living on the most friendly understanding and by the artfulness of her tales and complaints she has set your majesty against me i swear to you said the king that on no occasion has a bitter word ever passed her lips i swear that even in my wildest bursts of passion she would not allow me to menace any one and i swear too that you do not possess a more devoted and respectful friend than she is friend said madame with an expression of supreme disdain take care madame said the king you forget that you now understand me and that from this moment everything is equalized mademoiselle de la valliere will be whatever i may choose her to become and to-morrow if i were determined to do so i could seat her on a throne she was not born to a throne at least and whatever you may do can affect the future alone, but cannot affect the past. Madame, towards you I have shown every kind consideration, and every eager desire to please you. Do not remind me that I am master. It is the second time, sire, that you have made that remark, and I have already informed you I am ready to submit. In that case, then, you will confer upon me the favour of receiving Mademoiselle de la Valliere back again. For what purpose, sire, since you have a throne to bestow upon her? I am too insignificant to protect so exalted a personage. Nay, a truce to this bitter and disdainful spirit. Grant me her forgiveness. Never! You drive me, then, to open warfare in my own family. I, too, have a family with whom I can find refuge. Do you mean that as a threat? And could you forget yourself so far? Do you believe that if you push the affront to that extent, your family would encourage you? I hope, sire that you will not force me to take any step which would be unworthy of my rank. I hoped that you would remember our recent friendship, and that you would treat me as a brother. Madame paused for a moment. I do not disown you for a brother, she said, in refusing your majesty an injustice. An injustice? Oh, sire! If I informed others of La Valliere's conduct, if the Queen knew— Come, come, Henrietta, let your heart speak. Remember that for however brief a time you once loved me. Remember, too, that human hearts should be as merciful as the heart of a sovereign master. Do not be inflexible with others. Forgive La Valliere. I cannot. She has offended me. But for my sake. Sire, it is for your sake I would do anything in the world, except that. You will drive me to despair. You compel me to turn to the last resource of weak people, and seek counsel of my angry and wrathful disposition. I advise you to be reasonable. Reasonable? 
I can be so no longer. Nay, sire, I pray you, for pity's sake, Henrietta, it is the first time I entreated any one, and I have no hope in any one but in you. Oh, sire, you are weeping. From rage, from humiliation, that I, the king, should have been obliged to descend to entreaty. I shall hate this moment during my whole life. You have made me suffer, in one moment, more distress and more degradation than I could have anticipated in the greatest extremity in life. And the king rose and gave free vent to his tears, which in fact were tears of anger and shame. Madame was not touched exactly, for the best women, when their pride is hurt, are without pity. But she was afraid that the tears the king was shedding might possibly carry away every soft and tender feeling in his heart. "'Give what commands you please, sire,' she said, "'and since you prefer my humiliation to your own, although mine is public and yours has been witnessed but by myself alone, speak. I will obey your majesty. No, no, Henrietta, exclaimed Louis, transported with gratitude. You will have yielded to a brother's wishes. I no longer have any brother since I obey. All that I have would be too little in return. How passionately you love, sire, when you do love. Louis did not answer. He had seized upon Madame's hand and covered it with kisses. And so you will receive this poor girl back again, and will forgive her. You will find how gentle and pure-hearted she is. I will maintain her in my household. No, you will give her your friendship, my sister. I never liked her. Well, for my sake, you will treat her kindly, will you not, Henrietta? I will treat her as your mistress. The king rose suddenly to his feet. By this word, which had so infelicitously escaped her, Madame had destroyed the whole merit of her sacrifice. The king felt freed from all obligations. Exasperated beyond measure, and bitterly offended, he replied, "'I thank you, madame. I shall never forget the service you have rendered me.' And saluting her with an affectation of ceremony, he took his leave of her. As he passed before a glass, he saw that his eyes were red, and angrily stamped his foot on the ground. But it was too late for Malicorne and D'Artagnan, who were standing at the door, had seen his eyes. "'The king has been crying,' thought Malicorne. D'Artagnan approached the king with a respectful air, and said in a low tone of voice, "'Sire, it would be better to return to your own apartments by the small staircase.' "'Why?' "'Because the dust of the road has left its traces on your face,' said D'Artagnan. "'By heavens,' he thought, "'when the king has given way like a child, let the—' Chapter 31 of Louise de la Vallière. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick. Louise de la Vallière by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 31 Mademoiselle de la Vallière's Pocket Handkerchief. Madame was not bad hearted, she was only hasty and impetuous. The king was not imprudent. He was simply in love. Hardly had they entered into this compact, which terminated in La Vallière's recall, when they both sought to make as much as they could by their bargain. 
the king wished to see la valliere every moment of the day while madame who was sensible of the king's annoyance ever since he had so entreated her would not relinquish her revenge on la valliere without a contest she planted every conceivable difficulty in the king's path he was in fact obliged in order to get a glimpse of la valliere to be exceedingly devoted in his attentions to his sister-in-law and this indeed was madame's plan of policy as she had chosen some one to second her efforts and as this person was our old friend montalais the king found himself completely hemmed in every time he paid madame a visit he was surrounded and was never left a moment alone madame displayed in her conversation a charm of manner and brilliancy of wit which dazzled everybody montalais followed her and soon rendered herself perfectly insupportable to the king which was in fact the very thing she expected would happen she then set malicorne at the king who found means of informing his majesty that there was a young person belonging to the court who was exceedingly miserable and on the king inquiring who this person was malicorne replied that it was mademoiselle de montalais to this the king answered that it was perfectly just that a person should be unhappy when she rendered others so whereupon malicorne explained how matters stood for he had received his directions from montalais the king began to open his eyes he remarked that as soon as he made his appearance madame made hers too that she remained in the corridors until after he had left that she accompanied him back to his own apartments fearing that he might speak in the antechambers to one of her maids of honour one evening she went further still the king was seated surrounded by the ladies who were present and holding in his hand concealed by his lace ruffle a small note which he wished to slip into la Valliere's hand madame guessed both his intention and the letter too it was difficult to prevent the king's going wherever he pleased and yet it was necessary to prevent his going near la valliere or speaking to her as by so doing he could let the note fall into her lap behind her fan or into her pocket-handkerchief the king who was also on the watch suspected that a snare was being laid for him he rose and pushed his chair without affectation near mademoiselle de chatillon with whom he began to talk in a light tone they were amusing themselves making rhymes from mademoiselle de chatillon he went to montalais and then to mademoiselle de tonne charente and thus by this skilful manoeuvre he found himself seated opposite to la valliere whom he completely concealed madame pretended to be greatly occupied altering a group of flowers that she was working in tapestry the king showed the corner of his letter to la valliere and the latter held out her handkerchief with a look that signified put the letter inside then as the king had placed his own handkerchief upon his chair he was adroit enough to let it fall on the ground so that la valliere slipped her handkerchief on the chair the king took it quietly without any one observing what he did placed the letter within it and returned the handkerchief to the place he had taken it from there was only just time for la valliere to stretch out her hand to take hold of the handkerchief with its valuable contents but madame who had observed everything that had passed said to mademoiselle de chatillon chatillon be good enough to pick up the king's handkerchief if you please it has fallen on the carpet the young girl obeyed with the utmost precipitation the king having moved from his seat and la valliere being in no little degree nervous and confused ah i beg your majesty's pardon said mademoiselle de chatillon you have two handkerchiefs i perceive and the king was accordingly obliged to put into his pocket la valliere's handkerchief as well as his own he certainly gained that souvenir of louise who lost however a copy of verses which had cost the king ten hours hard labour and which as far as he was concerned was perhaps as good as a long poem it would be impossible to describe the king's anger and la valliere's despair but shortly afterwards a circumstance occurred which was more than remarkable when the king left in order to retire to his own apartments malicorne informed of what had passed one can hardly tell how was waiting in the antechamber the antechambers of the palais royal are naturally very dark and in the evening they were but indifferently lighted nothing pleased the king more than this dim light as a general rule love whose mind and heart are constantly in a blaze condemns all light except the sunshine of the soul and so the antechamber was dark a page carried a torch before the king who walked on slowly greatly annoyed at what had recently occurred malicorne passed close to the king almost stumbled against him in fact and begged his forgiveness with the profoundest humility but the king who was in an exceedingly ill temper was very sharp in his reproof to malicorne who disappeared as soon and as quietly as he possibly could louis retired to rest having a misunderstanding with the queen and the very next day as soon as he entered the cabinet he wished to have la valliere's handkerchief in order to press his lips to it he called his valet fetch me he said the coat i wore yesterday evening 
but be very sure you do not touch anything it may contain. The order being obeyed, the king himself searched the pocket of the coat. He found only one handkerchief, and that his own. La Vallière's had disappeared. Whilst busied with all kinds of conjectures and suspicions, a letter was brought to him from La Vallière. It ran thus. How good and kind of you to have sent me those beautiful verses! How full of ingenuity and perseverance your affection! How is it possible to help loving you so dearly? What does this mean? thought the king. There must be some mistake. Look well about, he said to his valet, for a pocket handkerchief must be in one of my pockets, and if you do not find it, or if you have touched it, he reflected for a moment. To make a state matter of the loss of the handkerchief would be to act absurdly, and he therefore added, there was a letter of some importance inside the handkerchief, which had somehow got among the folds of it. Sire, replied the valet, your majesty has only one handkerchief, and that is it. True, true, replied the king, setting his teeth hard together. Oh, poverty, how I envy you! Happy is the man who can empty his own pockets of letters and handkerchiefs. He read La Vallière's letter over again, endeavouring to imagine in what conceivable way his verses could have reached their destination. There was a postscript to the letter. I send you back by your messenger this reply, so unworthy of what you sent me. So far so good. I shall find out something now, he said delightedly. Who is waiting, and who brought me this letter? Monsieur Malicorne, replied the valet de chambre, timidly. Desire him to come in. Malicorne entered. You come from Mademoiselle de la Vallière, said the king, with a sigh. Yes, sire. And you took Mademoiselle de la Vallière something for me? I, sire? Yes, you. Oh, no, sire. And Mademoiselle de la Vallière says so distinctly. Oh, sire, and Mademoiselle de la Vallière is mistaken. The king frowned. What jest is this? he said. Explain yourself. Why does Mademoiselle de la Vallière call you my messenger? What did you take to that lady? Speak, monsieur, and quickly. Sire, I merely took Mademoiselle de la Vallière a pocket handkerchief. That was all. A handkerchief? What handkerchief? Sire, at the very moment when I had the misfortune to stumble against your majesty yesterday, a misfortune which I shall deplore to the last day of my life, especially after the dissatisfaction which you exhibited, I remained, sire, motionless with despair, your majesty being at too great a distance to hear my excuses, when I saw something white lying on the ground. Ah, said the king, I stooped down, it was a pocket handkerchief. For a moment I had an idea that when I stumbled against your majesty I must have been the cause of the handkerchief falling from your pocket. But as I felt it all over very respectfully, I perceived a cipher at one of the corners, and, on looking at it closely, I found that it was Mademoiselle de la Vallière's cipher. I presumed that on her way to Madame's apartment in the earlier part of the evening she must have let her handkerchief fall, and I accordingly hastened to restore it to her as she was leaving, and that is all I gave to Mademoiselle de la Vallière. I entreat your majesty to believe— Malicorne's manner was so simple, so full of contrition, and marked with such extreme humility that the king was greatly amused in listening to him. He was as pleased with him for what he had done as if he had rendered him the greatest service. "'This is the second fortunate meeting I have had with you, monsieur,' he said. "'You may count upon my good intentions.' The plain and sober truth was that Malicorne had picked the king's pocket of the handkerchief as dexterously as any of the pickpockets of the good city of Paris could have done. Madame never knew of this little incident— but Montalais gave La Vallière some idea of the manner in which it had really happened, and La Vallière afterwards told the king, who laughed exceedingly at it, and pronounced Malicorne to be a first-rate politician. Chapter 32 of Louise de La Vallière this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick. Louise de la Vallière by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 32. Which treats of gardeners, of ladders, and of maids of honor. Miracles, unfortunately, could not always be happening whilst madame's ill-humour still continued. In a week's time, matters had reached such a point that the king could no longer look at La Vallière without a look full of suspicion crossing his own. Whenever a promenade was proposed, madame, 
in order to avoid the recurrence of similar scenes to that of the thunderstorm or the royal oak had a variety of indispositions ready prepared and thanks to them she was unable to go out and her maids of honour were obliged to remain indoors also there was not the slightest chance of means of paying a nocturnal visit for in this respect the king had on the very first occasion experienced a severe check which happened in the following manner as at fontainebleau he had taken saint aignan with him one evening when he wished to pay la valliere a visit but he had found no one but mademoiselle de tonnay charente who had begun to call out fire and thieves in such a manner that a perfect legion of chambermaids attendants and pages ran to her assistance so that saint aignan who had remained behind in order to save the honour of his royal master who had fled precipitately was obliged to submit to a severe scolding from the queen mother as well as from madame herself in addition he had the next morning received two challenges from the de mormont family and the king had been obliged to interfere this mistake had been owing to the circumstance of madame having suddenly ordered a change in the apartments of her maids of honour and directed la valliere and montalais to sleep in her own cabinet no gateway therefore was any longer open not even communication by letter to write under the eyes of so ferocious an argus as madame whose temper and disposition were so uncertain was to run the risk of exposure to the greatest danger and it can well be conceived into what a state of continuous irritation and ever-increasing anger all these petty annoyances threw the young lion the king almost tormented himself to death endeavouring to discover a means of communication and as he did not think proper to call in the aid of malicorne or d'artagnan the means were not discovered at all malicorne had indeed occasional brilliant flashes of imagination with which he tried to inspire the king with confidence but whether from shame or suspicion the king who had at first begun to nibble at the bait soon abandoned the hook in this way for instance one evening while the king was crossing the garden and looking up at madame's window malicorne stumbled over a ladder lying beside a border of box and said to manicamp then walking with him behind the king did you not see that i just now stumbled against a ladder and was very nearly thrown down no said manicamp as usual very absent-minded but it appears you did not fall that doesn't matter but it is not on that account the less dangerous to leave ladders lying about in that manner true one might hurt oneself especially when troubled with fits of absence of mind i don't mean that what i did mean was that it is dangerous to allow ladders to lie about so near the windows of the maids of honour louis started imperceptibly why so inquired manicamp speak louder whispered malicorne as he touched him with his arm why so said manicamp louder the king listened because for instance said malicorne a ladder nineteen feet high is just the height of the cornice of those windows manicamp instead of answering was dreaming of something else ask ye can't you what windows i mean whispered malicorne but what windows are you referring to said manicamp aloud the windows of madame's apartments eh oh i don't say that any one would ever venture to go up a ladder into madame's room but in madame's cabinet merely separated by a partition sleep two exceedingly pretty girls mademoiselles de la valliere and de montalais by a partition said manicamp look you see how brilliantly lighted madame's apartments are well do you see those two windows yes and that window close to the others but more dimly lighted yes well that is the room of the maids of honour look there is mademoiselle de la valliere opening the window ah how many soft things could an enterprising lover say to her if he only suspected that there were lying here a ladder nineteen feet long which would just reach the cornice but she is not alone you said mademoiselle de montalais is with her mademoiselle de montalais counts for nothing she is her oldest friend and exceedingly devoted to her a positive well into which can be thrown all sorts of secrets one might wish to get rid of the king did not lose a single syllable of this conversation malicorne even remarked that his majesty slackened his pace in order to give him time to finish so when they arrived at the door louis dismissed every one with the exception of malicorne a circumstance which excited no surprise for it was known that the king was in love 
and they suspected he was going to compose some verses by moonlight and although there was no moon that evening the king might nevertheless have some verses to compose every one therefore took his leave and immediately afterwards the king turned towards malicorn who respectfully waited until his majesty should address him what were you saying just now about a ladder monsieur malicorn he asked did i say anything about ladders sire said malicorn looking up as if in search of words which had flown away yes a ladder nineteen feet long oh yes sire i remember uh, but i spoke to mr manicamp and i should not have said a word had i known your majesty was near enough to hear us and why would you not have said a word because i should not have liked to get the gardener into a scrape who left it there poor fellow don't make yourself uneasy on that account what is this ladder like if your majesty wishes to see it nothing is easier for there it is in that box hedge exactly show it to me malicorn turned back and led the king up to the ladder saying this is it sire pull it this way a little when malicorn had brought the ladder on the gravel walk the king began to step its whole length hum he said you say it is nineteen feet long yes sire nineteen feet that is rather long i hardly believe it can be so long as that you cannot judge very correctly with the ladder in that position sire if it were upright against a tree or a wall for instance you would be better able to judge because the comparison would assist you a good deal oh it does not matter monsieur malicorne but i can hardly believe that the ladder is nineteen feet high i know how accurate your majesty's glance is and yet i would wager the king shook his head there is one unanswerable means of verifying it said malicorne what is that every one knows sire that the ground floor of the palace is eighteen feet high true that is very well known well sire if i place the ladder against the wall we shall be able to ascertain true malicorne took up the ladder like a feather and placed it upright against the wall and in order to try the experiment he chose or chance perhaps directed him to choose the very window of the cabinet where la valliere was the ladder just reached the edge of the cornice that is to say the sill of the window so that by standing upon the last round but one of the ladder a man of about middle height as the king was for instance could easily talk with those who might be in the room hardly had the ladder been properly placed when the king dropping the assumed part he had been playing in the comedy began to ascend the rounds of the ladder which malicorne held at the bottom but hardly had he completed half the distance when a patrol of swiss guards appeared in the garden and advanced straight toward him the king descended with the utmost precipitation and concealed himself among the trees malicorne at once perceived that he must offer himself as a sacrifice for if he too were to conceal himself the guard would search everywhere until they had found either himself or the king perhaps both it would be far better therefore that he alone should be discovered and consequently malicorne hid himself so clumsily that he was the only one arrested as soon as he was arrested malicorne was taken to the guard-house and there he declared who he was and was immediately recognized in the meantime by concealing himself first behind one clump of trees and then behind another the king reached the side door of his apartment very much humiliated and still more disappointed more than that the noise made in arresting malicorne had drawn la valliere and montalais to their window and even madame herself had appeared at her own with a pair of wax candles one in each hand clamorously asking what was the matter in the meantime malicorne sent for d'artagnan who did not lose a moment in hurrying to him but it was in vain he attempted to make him understand his reasons and in vain also that d'artagnan did understand them and further it was equally in vain that both their sharp and intuitive minds endeavoured to give another turn to the adventure there was no other resource left for malicorne but to let it be supposed that he had wished to enter mademoiselle de montalais's apartment as saint-aignan had passed for having wished to force mademoiselle de tonnay charente's door madame was inflexible in the first place because if malicorne had in fact wished to enter her apartment at night through the window and by means of the ladder in order to see montalais it was a punishable offence on malicorne's part and he must be punished accordingly 
and in the second place, if Malicorne, instead of acting in his own name, had acted as an intermediary between La Valliere and a person whose name was superfluous to mention, his crime was in that case even greater, since love, which is an excuse for everything, did not exist in the case as an excuse. Madame, therefore, made the greatest possible disturbance about the matter, and obtained his dismissal from Monsieur's household, without reflecting, poor blind creature, that both Malicorne and Montalais held her fast in their clutches, in consequence of her visit to de Guiche, and in a variety of other ways equally delicate. Montalais was perfectly furious, wished to revenge herself immediately, but Malicorne pointed out to her that the king's countenance would repay them for all the disgrace in the world, and that it was a great thing to have to suffer on his majesty's account. Malicorne was perfectly right, and therefore, although Montalais had the spirit of ten women in her, he succeeded in bringing her round to his own opinion. And we must not omit to state that the king helped them to console themselves, for, in the first place, he presented Malicorne with fifty thousand francs as a compensation for the post he had lost, and, in the next place, he gave him an appointment in his own household, delighted to have an opportunity of revenging himself in such a manner upon Madame for all she had made him and La Valliere suffer. But as Malicorne could no longer carry significant handkerchiefs for him, or plant convenient ladders, the royal lover was in a terrible state. There seemed to be no hope, therefore, of ever getting near La Valliere again, so long as she should remain at the Palais Royal. All the dignitaries and all the money in the world could not remedy that. Fortunately, however, Malicorne was on the lookout, and this so successfully that he met Montalais, who, to do her justice it must be admitted, was doing her best to meet Malicorne. "'What do you do during the night in Madame's apartment?' he asked the young girl. "'Why, I go to sleep, of course,' she replied. "'But it is very wrong to sleep. It can hardly be possible that, with the pain you are suffering, you can manage to do so.' "'And what am I suffering from, may I ask?' "'Are you not in despair at my absence?' "'Of course not, since you have received fifty thousand francs and an appointment in the king's household.' Uh, "'That is a matter of no moment. You are exceedingly afflicted at not seeing me as you used to see me formerly, and, more than all, you are in despair at my having lost Madame's confidence. Come now, is that not true?' "'Perfectly true.' "'Very good. Your distress of mind prevents you sleeping at night.' and so you sob and sigh and blow your nose ten times every minute as loud as possible. But, my dear Malicorne, Madame cannot endure the slightest noise near her. I know that perfectly well. Of course she can't endure anything. And so, I tell you, when she hears your deep distress, she will turn you out of her rooms without a moment's delay. I understand. Very fortunate you do. Well, and what will happen next? The next thing that will happen will be that La Valliere, finding herself alone without you, will groan and utter such loud lamentations that she will exhibit despair enough for two. In that case she will be put into another room, don't you see? Precisely so. Yes, but which? Which? Yes, that will puzzle you to say, Monsieur Inventor General. Not at all. Whenever and whatever the room may be, it will always be preferable to Madame's own room. That is true. Very good. So begin your lamentations to-night. I certainly will not fail to do so. And uh, give La Valliere a hint also. Oh, don't fear her. She cries quite enough already by herself. Chapter thirty three of Louise de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick. Louise de la Valliere by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter thirty three. Which treats of carpentry operations and furnishes details upon the mode of constructing staircases. The advice which had been given to Montalais was communicated by her to La Valliere, who could not but acknowledge that it was by no means deficient in judgment, and who, after a certain amount of resistance, rising rather from timidity than indifference to the project, resolved to put it into execution. This story of the two girls weeping and filling Madame's bedroom with the noisiest lamentations was Malicorne's chef d'oeuvre. 
as nothing is so probable as improbability, so natural as romance, this kind of Arabian night story succeeded perfectly with Madame. The first thing she did was to send Montalais away, and then, three days, or rather three nights afterward, she had La Vallière removed. She gave the latter one of the small rooms on the top story, situated immediately over the apartments allotted to the gentlemen of Monsieur's suite. One story only, that is to say, a mere floor separating the maids of honour from the officers and gentlemen of her husband's household. A private staircase, which was placed under Madame de Nevail's surveillance, was the only means of communication. For greater safety, Madame de Nevail's, who had heard of His Majesty's previous attempts, had the windows of the rooms and the openings of the chimneys carefully barred. There was, therefore, every possible security provided for Mademoiselle de la Vallière, whose room now bore more resemblance to a cage than to anything else. When Mademoiselle de la Vallière was in her own room, and she was there very frequently, for Madame scarcely ever had any occasion for her services, since she knew she was safe under Madame de Nevail's inspection, Mademoiselle de la Vallière had no better means of amusing herself than looking through the bars of her windows. It happened, therefore, that one morning, as she was looking out as usual, she perceived Malicorne at one of the windows exactly opposite to her own. He held a carpenter's rule in his hand, was surveying the buildings, and seemed to be adding up some figures on paper. La Vallière recognized Malicorne and nodded to him. Malicorne, in his turn, replied by a formal bow, and disappeared from the window. She was surprised at this marked coolness, so different from his usual unfailing good humour, but she remembered that he had lost his appointment on her account, and that he could hardly be very amiably disposed towards her, since, in all probability, she would never be in a position to make him any recompense for what he had lost. She knew how to forgive offences, and with still more readiness could she sympathise with misfortune. La Vallière would have asked Montalais her opinion, if she had been within hearing, but she was absent, it being the hour she commonly devoted to her own correspondence. Suddenly La Vallière observed something thrown from the window where Malicorne had been standing, pass across the open space which separated the iron bars, and roll upon the floor. She advanced with no little curiosity towards the subject, and picked it up. It was a wooden reel for silk, only, in this instance, instead of silk, a piece of paper was rolled round it. La Vallière unrolled it, and read as follows. Mademoiselle, I am exceedingly anxious to learn two things. The first is, to know if the flooring of your apartment is wood or brick. The second, to ascertain at what distance your bed is placed from the window. Forgive my importunity, and will you be good enough to send me an answer by the same way you received this letter, that is to say, by means of the silk winder, only, instead of throwing it into my room, as I have thrown it into yours, which would be too difficult for you to attempt, have the goodness merely to let it fall. Believe me, mademoiselle, your most humble, most respectful servant, Malicorne. Write the reply, if you please, upon the letter itself. Ah, poor fellow! exclaimed La Vallière. He must have gone out of his mind. And she directed towards her correspondent, of whom she caught but a faint glimpse in consequence of the darkness of the room, a look full of compassionate consideration. Malicorne understood her, and shook his head as if he meant to say, No, no, I am not out of my mind. Be quite satisfied. She smiled, as if still in doubt. No, no, he signified by a gesture. My head is right, and pointed to his head. Then, after moving his hand like a man who writes very rapidly, he put his hands together as if entreating her to write. La Vallière, even if he were mad, saw no impropriety in doing what Malicorne requested her. She took a pencil and wrote, Wood, and then walked slowly from her window to her bed, and wrote, Six paces. And having done this, she looked again at Malicorne, who bowed to her, signifying that he was about to descend. La Vallière understood that it was to pick up the silk winder. She approached the window, and, in accordance with Malicorne's instructions, let it fall. The winder was still rolling along the flagstones as Malicorne started after it, overtook and picked it up, and, beginning to peel it as a monkey would do with a nut, he ran straight toward Monsieur de Saint-Aignan's apartment. Saint-Aignan had chosen, or rather solicited, that his rooms might be as near the king as possible, as certain plants seek the sun's rays in order to develop themselves more luxuriantly. His apartment consisted of two rooms, in that portion of the palace occupied by Louis the Fourteenth himself. Monsieur de Saint-Aignan was very proud of this proximity, which afforded easy access to his majesty, and, more than that, the favour of occasional unexpected meetings. At the moment we are now referring to, 
he was engaged in having both his rooms magnificently carpeted with with expectation of receiving the honour of frequent visits from the king for his majesty since his passion for la valliere had chosen saint aignan as his confidant and would not in fact do without him either night or day malicorne introduced himself to the comte and met with no difficulties because he had been favourably noticed by the king and also because the credit which one man may happen to enjoy is always a bait for others saint aignan asked his visitor if he brought any news with him yes great news replied the latter ah ah said saint aignan what is it mademoiselle de la valliere has changed her quarters what do you mean said saint aignan opening his eyes very wide she was living in the same apartments as madame precisely so but madame got tired of her proximity and has installed her in a room which is situated exactly above your future apartment what up there exclaimed saint aignan with surprise and pointing at the floor above him with his finger no said malicorne yonder indicating the building opposite what do you mean then by saying that her room is above my apartment because i am sure that your apartment ought providentially to be under mademoiselle de la valliere's room saint aignan at this remark gave poor malicorne a look similar to one of those la valliere had already given a quarter of an hour before that is to say he thought he had lost his senses monsieur said malicorne to him i wish to answer what you are thinking about what do you mean by what i am thinking about uh, my reason is that you have not clearly understood what i want to convey i admit it well then you are aware that underneath the apartments set for madame's maids of honour the gentlemen in attendance on the king and on monsieur are lodged yes i know that since manicamp de wardes and others are living there precisely well monsieur admire the singularity of the circumstance the two rooms destined for monsieur de guiche are exactly the very two rooms situated underneath those which madame de montalais and mademoiselle de la valliere occupy well what then what then do you say why these two rooms are empty since monsieur de guiche is now lying wounded at fontainebleau i assure you my dear fellow i cannot grasp your meaning well if i had the happiness to call myself saint aignan i should guess immediately and what would you do then i should at once change the rooms i am occupying here for those which monsieur de guiche is not using yonder can you propose such a thing said saint aignan disdainfully what abandon the chief post of honour the proximity to the king a privilege conceded only to princes of the blood to dukes and peers permit me to tell you my dear monsieur malicorne that you must be out of your senses monsieur replied the young man seriously you commit two mistakes my name is malicorne simply and i am in perfect possession of all my senses then drawing a paper from his pocket he said listen to what i am going to say and afterwards i will show you this paper i am listening said saint aignan you know that madame looks after la valliere as carefully as argus did after the nymph io i do you know that the king has sought for an opportunity but uselessly of speaking to the prisoner and that neither you nor myself have yet succeeded in procuring him this piece of good fortune you certainly ought to know something about that subject my poor malicorne said saint aignan smiling very good what do you suppose would happen to the man whose imagination devised some means of bringing the lovers together oh the king would set no bounds to his gratitude let me ask you then monsieur de saint aignan whether you would not be curious to taste a little of this royal gratitude certainly replied saint aignan any favour of my master as a recognition of the proper discharge of my duty would assuredly be most precious in that case look at this paper monsieur le comte what is it a plan yes a plan of monsieur de guiche's two rooms which in all probability will soon be your two rooms oh no whatever may happen why so because my rooms are the envy of too many gentlemen to whom i certainly should not give them up monsieur de roquelaure for instance monsieur de la fere and monsieur d'angot would all be anxious to get them 
in that case i shall leave you monsieur le comte and i shall go and offer to one of those gentlemen the plan i have just shown you together with the advantages annexed to it but why do you not keep them for yourself inquired saint-aignan suspiciously because the king would never do me the honour of paying me a visit openly whilst he would readily go and see any one of those gentlemen what the king would go and see any one of those gentlemen go most certainly he would go ten times instead of once is it possible that you can ask me if the king would go to an apartment which would bring him nearer to mademoiselle de la valliere <laughs> yes indeed delightfully near her with a floor between them malicorne unfolded the piece of paper which had been wrapped round the bobbin monsieur le comte he said have the goodness to observe that the flooring of mademoiselle de la valliere's room is merely a wooden flooring well well all you would have to do would be to get hold of a journeyman carpenter lock him up in your apartments without letting him know where you have taken him to and let him make a hole in your ceiling and consequently in the flooring of mademoiselle de la valliere's room good heavens exclaimed saint-aignan as if dazzled what is the matter said malicorne nothing except that you have hit upon a singular bold idea monsieur it will seem a very trifling one to the king i assure you lovers never think of the risk they run what danger do you apprehend monsieur le comte why effecting such an opening as that will make a terrible noise it could be heard all over the palace oh monsieur le comte i am quite sure that the carpenter i shall select will not make the slightest noise in the world he will saw an opening three feet square with a saw covered with tow and no one not even those adjoining will know he is at work my dear monsieur malicorne you astound you positively bewilder me to continue replied malicorne quietly in the room the ceiling of which you will have to cut through you will put up a staircase which will either allow mademoiselle de la valliere to descend into your room or the king to ascend into mademoiselle de la valliere's room but the staircase will be seen no for in your room it will be hidden by a partition over which you will throw a tapestry similar to that which covers the rest of the apartment and in mademoiselle de la valliere's room it will not be seen for the trap-door which will be a part of the flooring itself will be made to open under the bed of course said saint-aignan whose eyes began to sparkle with delight and now monsieur le comte there is no occasion to make you admit that the king will frequently come to the room where such a staircase is constructed i think that uh, monsieur dongo particularly will be struck by my idea and i shall now go and explain to him but my dear monsieur malicorne you forget that you spoke to me about it first and that i have consequently the right of priority do you wish for the preference do i wish it of course i do the fact is monsieur de saint-aignan i am presenting you with the jacob's ladder which is better than the promise of an additional step in the peerage perhaps even with a good estate to accompany your dukedom at least replied saint-aignan it will give me an opportunity of showing the king that he is not mistaken in occasionally calling me his friend an opportunity dear monsieur malicorne for which i am indebted to you and which you will not forget to remember inquired malicorne smiling nothing will delight me more monsieur but i am not the king's friend i am simply his attendant yes and if you imagine that this staircase is as good as a dukedom for myself i think there will certainly be letters of nobility at the top of it for you malicorne bowed all i have to do now said saint-aignan is to move as soon as possible i do not think the king will object to it ask his permission however i will go and see him this very moment and i will run and get the carpenter i was speaking of when will he be here this very evening do not forget your precautions he shall be brought with his eyes bandaged and i will send you one of my carriages without arms and one of my servants without livery uh, but stay what will la valliere say if she sees what is going on 
oh i can assure you she will be very much interested in the operation and i am equally sure that if the king has not courage enough to ascend to her room she will have sufficient curiosity to come down to him we live in that hope said saint-aignan and now i am off to his majesty at what time will the carpenter be here at eight o'clock how long do you suppose he will take to make this opening about a couple of hours only afterwards he must have sufficient time to construct what may be called the hyphen between the two rooms one night and a portion of the following day will do we must not reckon upon less than two days including putting up the staircase two days that is a very long time nay when one undertakes to open up communications with paradise itself we must at least take care that the approaches are respectable quite right so farewell for a short time dear Chapter thirty four of Louisa de la Valliera. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliera by Alexander Dumas. Chapter thirty four. The Promenade by Torchlight. Saint Agno delighted with what he had just heard and rejoiced at what the future foreshadowed for him bent his steps toward de guiche's two rooms he who a quarter of an hour previously would hardly yield up his own rooms for a million francs was now ready to expend a million if it were necessary upon the acquisition of the two happy rooms he coveted so eagerly but he did not meet with so many obstacles m de guiche did not yet know where he was to lodge and besides was still too far ill to trouble himself about his lodgings and so saint agno obtained de guiche's two rooms without difficulty as for m d'anjou he was so immeasurably delighted that he did not even give himself the trouble to think whether saint agno had any particular reason for removing within an hour after saint agno's new resolution he was in possession of the two rooms and ten minutes later mollycorn entered followed by the upholsterers during this time the king asked for saint agno the valet ran to his late apartments and found m d'anjou there d'anjou sent him on to de guiche's and saint agno was found there but a little delay had of course taken place and the king had already exhibited once or twice evident signs of impatience when saint agno entered his royal master's presence quite out of breath you too abandon me then said louis the fourteenth in a similar tone of lamentation to that of which caesar eighteen hundred years previously had pronounced et tu quoi sire i am far from abandoning you for on the contrary i am busily occupied in changing my lodgings what do you mean i thought you had finished moving three days ago yes sire but i don't find myself comfortable where i am so i am going to change to the opposite side of the building was i not right when i said you were abandoning me exclaimed the king oh this exceeds all endurance but so it is there was only one woman for whom my heart cared at all and all my family is leagued together to tear her from me and my friend to whom i confided my distress and who helped me to bear up under it has become wearied of my complaints and is going to leave me without even asking my permission saint agno began to laugh the king at once guessed there must be some mystery in this want of respect what is it cried the king full of hope this sire that the friend whom the king calumniates is going to try if he cannot restore to his sovereign the happiness he has lost are you going to let me see la valliere said louis fourteenth 
I cannot say so positively, but I hope so." "How? how? Tell me that, Saint Aignan. I wish to know what your project is, and to help you with all my power." "Sire," replied Saint Aignan, "I cannot, even myself, tell very well how I must set about attaining success, but I have every reason to believe that from to-morrow " "To-morrow, do you say? What happiness! But why are you changing your rooms?" "In order to serve your majesty to better advantage." "How can your moving serve me?" "Do you happen to know where the two rooms destined for de Guiche are situated?" "Yes." "Well, your majesty now knows where I am going." "Very likely, but that does not help me." "What? Is it possible that you do not understand, sire?" that above de Guiche's lodgings are two rooms, one of which is Mademoiselle Montalais, and the other La Valliere's. Is it not so, Saint Agneau? Oh, yes, yes, it is a brilliant idea, Saint Agneau, a true friend's idea, a poet's idea. By bringing me nearer her from whom the world seems to unite to separate me, you are far more than Pallades was for Orestes, or Patroclus for Achilles. Sire, said Anya with a smile, I question whether, if your majesty were to know my projects in their full extent, you would continue to pronounce such a pompous eulogium upon me. Ah, sire, I know how very different are the epithets which certain Puritans of the court will not fail to apply to me when they learn of what I intend to do for your majesty. Saint Agno, I am dying with impatience. I am in a perfect fervor. I shall never be able to wait until to-morrow. To-morrow? Why, to-morrow is an eternity. And yet, sire, I shall require you, if you please, to go out presently and divert your impatience by a good walk. With you, agreed, we will talk about your projects, we will talk of her. Nay, sire, I shall remain here. Whom shall I go out with, then? With the queen and all the ladies of the court. Nothing shall induce me to do that, Saint Agno. And yet, sire, you must. Must? No, no, a thousand times no. I will never again expose myself to the horrible torture of being close to her, of seeing her, of touching her dress as I pass by her, and yet not be able to say a word to her. No, I renounce a torture which you suppose will bring me happiness, but which consumes and eats away my very life. To see her in the presence of strangers, and not to tell her that I love her, when my whole being reveals my affection and betrays me to every one, no, I have sworn never to do it again, and I will keep my oath. Yet, sire, pray listen to me for a moment. I will listen to nothing, Saint Agno. In that case, I will continue. It is most urgent, sire. Pray understand me. It is of the greatest importance that madame and her maids of honor should be absent for two hours from the palace i cannot understand your meaning at all saint agno it is hard for me to give my sovereign directions what to do but under the circumstances i do give you directions sire and either a hunting or a promenade party must be got up but if i were to do what you wish it would be a caprice a mere whim in displaying such an impatient humor, I show my whole court that I have no control over my own feelings. Do not people already say that I am dreaming of the conquest of the world, but that I ought previously to begin by achieving a conquest over myself? Those who say so, sire, are as insolent as they would like to be thought facetious. But whomever they may be, if your majesty prefers to listen to them, I have nothing further to say. In such a case, that which we have fixed to take place to-morrow must be postponed indefinitely. Nay, Saint Agno, I will go out this evening. I will go by torchlight to Saint Germain, 
I will breakfast there to-morrow, and will return to Paris by three o'clock. Will that do? Admirably. In that case, I will set out this evening at eight o'clock. Your Majesty has fixed upon the exact minute, and you positively will tell me nothing more? It is because I have nothing more to tell you. Industry counts for something in this world, sire, but still chance plays so important a part in it that I have been accustomed to leave her to the sidewalk, confident that she will manage so as to always take the street. Well, I abandon myself entirely to you, and you are quite right. Comforted in this manner, the king went immediately to Madame, to whom he announced the intended expedition. Madame fancied at the first moment that she saw in this unexpected arranged party a plot of the king's to converse with La Valliere, either on the road under cover of the darkness, or in some other way. But she took especial care not to show any of her fancies to her brother-in-law, and accepted the invitation with a smile upon her lips. She gave directions aloud that her maids of honor should accompany her, secretly intending in the evening to take the most effectual steps to interfere with his majesty's attachment then when she was alone and at the very moment the poor lover who had issued orders for the departure was reveling in the idea that mademoiselle de la valliere would form one of the party luxuriating in the sad happiness persecuted lovers enjoy of realizing through the sense of sight alone all the transports of possession madame who was surrounded by her maids of honor was saying two ladies will be enough for me this evening mademoiselle de tournay charant and mademoiselle de montalais la valliere had anticipated her own omission and was prepared for it but persecution had rendered her courageous and she did not give madame the pleasure of seeing on her face the impression of the shock her heart received on the contrary smiling with that ineffable gentleness which gave an angelic expression to her features in that case madame i shall be at liberty this evening i suppose she said of course i shall be able to employ it then in progressing with that piece of tapestry which your highness has been good enough to notice and which i have already had the honor of offering to you and having made a respectful obeisance she withdrew to her own apartment mesdemoiselles de tournay charant and de montalais did the same the rumor of the intended promenade soon spread all over the palace ten minutes afterwards malicorne learned madame's resolution and slipped under montalais's door a note in the following terms l v must positively pass the night with madame montalais in pursuance of the compact she had entered into began by burning the letter and then sat down to reflect montalais was a girl full of expedients and so she very soon arranged her plan towards five o'clock which was the hour for her to repair to madame's apartment she was running across the courtyard and had reached within a dozen paces of a group of officers when she uttered a cry fell gracefully on one knee rose again with difficulty and walked on limpingly the gentlemen ran forward to her assistance montalais had sprained her foot faithful to the discharge of her duty she insisted however notwithstanding her accident upon going to madame's apartments what is the matter and why do you limp so she inquired i mistook you for la valliere montalais related how it had happened that in hurrying on in order to arrive as quickly as possible she had sprained her foot madame seemed to pity her and wished to have a surgeon sent for immediately but she assuring her that there was nothing really serious in the accident said my only regret madame is that it will preclude my attendance on you and i should have begged mademoiselle de la valliere to take my place with your royal highness but seeing that madame frowned she added i have not done so why did you not do so inquired madame 
because poor la valliere seemed so happy to have her liberty for a whole evening and night too that i did not feel courageous enough to ask her to take my place what is she so delighted as that inquired madame struck by these words she is wild with delight she who is always so melancholy was singing like a bird besides your highness knows how much she detests going out and also that her character has a spice of wildness in it so thought madame this extreme delight hardly seems natural to me she has already made all her preparations for dining in her own room tete -a tete with one of her favorite books and then as your highness has six other young ladies who would be delighted to accompany you i did not make my proposal to la valliere madame did not say a word in reply have i acted properly continued montalais with a slight fluttering of the heart seeing the little success that seemed to attend the rue de guerre which she had relied upon with so much confidence that she had not thought it even necessary to try and find another does madame approve of what i have done she continued madame was reflecting that the king could very easily leave saint germain during the night and that as it was only four leagues and a half from paris to saint germain he might readily be in paris in an hour's time tell me she said whether la valliere when she heard of your accident offered at least to bear you company oh she does not yet know of my accident but even did she know of it i most certainly should not ask her to do anything that might interfere with her own plans i think she wishes this evening to realize quietly by herself that amusement of the late king when he said to monsieur de saint marsa let us amuse ourselves by doing nothing and make ourselves miserable madame felt convinced that some mysterious love adventure lurked behind this strong desire for solitude the secret might be louis's return during the night it could not be doubted any longer la valliere had been informed of his intended return and that was the reason for her delight at having to remain behind at the palais royal it was a plan settled and arranged beforehand i will not be their dupe though said madame and she took a decisive step mademoiselle de montalais she said will you have the goodness to inform your friend mademoiselle de la valliere that i am exceedingly sorry to disarrange her projects of solitude but that instead of becoming ennui by remaining behind alone as she wished she will be good enough to accompany us to saint germain and get ennui there ah poor la valliere said montalais compassionately but with her heart throbbing with delight oh madame could there not be some means enough said madame i desire it i prefer mademoiselle la boum la blanc's society to that of any one else go and send her to me and take care of your foot montalais did not wait for the order to be repeated she returned to her room almost forgetting to feign lameness wrote an answer to mollycorn and slipped it under the carpet the answer simply said she shall a spartan could not have written more laconically by this means thought madame i will look narrowly after all on the road she shall sleep near me during the night and his majesty must be very clever if he can exchange a single word with mademoiselle de la valliere la valliere received the order to set off with the same indifferent gentleness with which she had received the order to play cinderella but inwardly her delight was extreme and she looked upon this change in the princess's resolution as a consolation which providence had sent her with less penetration than madame possessed she attributed all to chance while every one with the exception of those in disgrace of those who were ill and those who were suffering from sprains were being driven toward saint germain malicorne smuggled his workman into the palace in one of monsieur de saint agnaud's carriages and led him into the room corresponding to la valliere's the man set to work with a will tempted by the splendid reward which had been promised him 
as the very best tools and implements had been selected from the reserve stock belonging to the engineers attached to the king's household and among others a saw with teeth so sharp and well tempered that it was able under water even to cut through oaken joists as hard as iron the work in question advanced very rapidly and a square portion of the ceiling taken from between two of the joists fell into the arms of the delighted saint agno Mollicorn, the workman and a confidential valet the latter being one brought into the world to see and hear everything but to repeat nothing in accordance with a new plan indicated by Mollicorn, the opening was effected in an angle of the room and for this reason as there was no dressing closet adjoining la valliere's room she had solicited and had that very morning obtained a large screen intended to serve as a partition the screen that had been allotted her was perfectly sufficient to conceal the opening which would besides be hidden by all the artifices skilled cabinet makers would have at their command the opening having been made the workman glided between the joists and found himself in la valliere's room when there he cut a square opening in the flooring and out of the boards he manufactured a trap so accurately fitting into the opening that the most practised eye could hardly detect the necessary interstices made by its lines of juncture with the floor mollicorn had provided for everything a ring and a couple of hinges which had been bought for the purpose were affixed to the trap-door and a small circular staircase packed in sections which had been bought ready-made by the industrious mollicorn who had paid two thousand francs for it it was higher than what was required but the carpenter reduced the number of steps and it was found to suit exactly this staircase destined to receive so illustrious a burden was merely fastened to the wall by a couple of iron clamps and its base was fixed into the floor of the comte's room by two iron pegs screwed down tightly so that the king and all his cabinet counsellors too might pass up and down the staircase without any fear every blow of the hammer fell upon a thick pad or cushion and the saw was not used until the handle had been wrapped in wool and the blade steeped in oil the noisiest part of the work moreover had taken place during the night and early in the morning that is to say when la valliere and madame were both absent when about two o'clock in the afternoon the court returned to the palais royal la valliere went up into her own room everything was in its proper place not the smallest particle of sawdust not the smallest chip was left to bear witness to the violation of her domicile saint agno however wishing to do his utmost in forwarding the work had torn his fingers and his shirt too and had expended no ordinary amount of perspiration in the king's service the palms of his hands were covered with blisters occasioned by his having held the ladder for mollicorn he had moreover brought up one by one the seven pieces of the staircase each consisting of two steps in fact we can safely assert that if the king had seen him so ardently at work his majesty would have sworn an eternal gratitude towards his faithful attendant as mollicorn anticipated the workman had completely finished the job in twenty-four hours he received twenty-four louis and left overwhelmed with delight for he had gained in one day as much as six months hard work would have procured him no one had the slightest suspicion of what had taken place in the room under mademoiselle de la valliere's apartment but in the evening of the second day at the very moment la valliere had just left madame's circle and returned to her own room she heard a slight creaking sound in one corner astonished she looked to see whence it proceeded and the noise began again who is there she said in a tone of alarm it is i it is i louisa replied the well-known voice of the king you you cried the young girl who for a moment fancied herself under the influence of a dream but where you sire here replied the king opening one of the folds of the screen and appearing like a ghost at the end of the room 
la valliere uttered a loud cry and fell trembling into an armchair Chapter thirty five of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter thirty five. The Apparition. La Valliere very soon recovered from her surprise for owing to his respectful bearing the king inspired her with more confidence by his presence than his sudden appearance had deprived her of but as he noticed that which made la valliere most uneasy was the means by which he had effected an entrance into her room he explained to her the system of the staircase concealed by the screen and strongly disavowed the notion of his being a supernatural appearance oh sire said la valliere shaking her fair head with a most engaging smile present or absent you do not appear to my mind more at one time than at another which means louisa oh what you know so well sire that there is not one moment in which the poor girl whose secret you surprised at fontainebleau and whom you came to snatch from the foot of the cross itself does not think of you louisa you overwhelm me with joy and happiness la valliere smiled mournfully and continued but sire have you reflected that your ingenious invention could not be of the slightest service to us why so tell me i am waiting most anxiously because this room may be subject to being searched at any moment of the day madame herself may at any time come here accidentally my companions run in at any moment they please to fasten the door on the inside is to denounce myself as plainly as if i had written above no admittance the king is within even now sire at this very moment there is nothing to prevent the door opening and your majesty being seen here in that case said the king laughingly i should indeed be taken for a phantom for no one can tell in what way i came here besides it is only spirits that can pass through brick walls or floors and ceilings oh sire reflect for a moment how terrible the scandal would be nothing equal to it could ever have been previously said about the maids of honor poor creatures whom evil report however hardly ever spares and your conclusion from all this my dear louisa come explain yourself alas it is a hard thing to say but your majesty must suppress staircase plots surprises and all for the evil consequences which would result from your being found here would be far greater than our happiness in seeing each other well louisa replied the king tenderly instead of removing this staircase by which i have ascended there is a far more simple means of which you have not thought a means another means yes another oh you do not love me as i love you louisa since my invention is quicker than yours she looked at the king who held out his hand to her which she took and gently pressed between her own you were saying continued the king that i shall be detected coming here where any one who pleases can enter stay sire at this very moment even while you are speaking about it i tremble with dread of your being discovered but you would not be found out louisa if you were to descend the staircase which leads to the room underneath oh sire what do you say cried louisa in alarm you do not quite understand me louisa since you get offended at my very first word first of all do you know to whom the apartments underneath belong to monsieur de guiche sire i believe not at all they are monsieur de saint agnes are you sure cried la valliere and this exclamation which escaped from the young girl's joyous heart made the king's heart throb with delight yes to saint agno our friend he said but sire returned la valliere i cannot visit monsieur de saint agno's rooms any more than i could monsieur de guiche's it is impossible 
impossible and yet louisa i should have thought that under the safe conduct of the king you would venture anything under the safe conduct of the king she said with a look full of tenderness you have faith in my word i hope louisa yes sire when you are not present but when you are present when you speak to me when i look upon you i have faith in nothing what can possibly be done to reassure you it is scarcely respectful i know to doubt the king but for me you are not the king thank heaven i at least hope so most devoutly you see how anxiously i am trying to find or invent a means of removing all difficulty stay would the presence of a third person reassure you the presence of monsieur de saint aignan would certainly really louisa you wound me by your suspicions louisa did not answer she merely looked steadfastly at him with that clear piercing gaze which penetrates the very heart and said softly to herself alas alas it is not you of whom i am afraid it is not you upon whom my doubts would fall well said the king sighing i agree and monsieur de saint aignan who enjoys the inestimable privilege of reassuring you shall always be present at our interviews i promise you you promise that sire upon my honor as a gentleman and you on your side oh wait sire that is not all yet for such conversations ought at least to have a reasonable motive of some kind for monsieur de saint aignan dear louisa every shade of delicacy of feeling is yours and my only study is to equal you on that point it shall be just as you wish therefore our conversations shall have a reasonable motive and i have already hit upon one so that from to-morrow if you like to-morrow do you mean that that is not soon enough exclaimed the king caressing la valliere's hand between his own at this moment the sound of steps was heard in the corridor sire sire cried la valliere some one is coming do you hear oh fly fly i implore you the king made but one bound from the chair where he was sitting to his hiding-place behind the screen he had barely time for as he drew one of the folds before him the handle of the door was turned and montalais appeared at the threshold as a matter of course she entered quite naturally and without any ceremony for she knew perfectly well that to knock at the door beforehand would be showing a suspicion towards la valliere which would be displeasing to her she accordingly entered and after a rapid glance around the room in the brief course of which she observed two chairs very close to each other she was so long in shutting the door which seemed to be difficult to close one can hardly tell how or why that the king had ample time to raise the trap-door and to descend again to saint aignan's room louisa she said to her i want to talk to you and seriously too good heavens my dear ara what is the matter now the matter is that madame suspects everything explain yourself is there any occasion for us to enter into explanations and do you not understand what i mean come you must have noticed the fluctuations in madame's humor during several days past you must have noticed how she first kept you close beside her then dismissed you and then sent for you again yes i have noticed it of course well it seems madame has now succeeded in obtaining sufficient information for she has now gone straight to the point as there is nothing further left in france to withstand the torrent which sweeps away all obstacles before it you know what i mean by the torrent la valliere hid her face in her hands i mean continued montalais pitilessly that torrent which burst through the gates of the carmelites of Cheu, and overthrew all the prejudices of the court as well at fontainebleau as at paris alas alas murmured la valliere her face still covered by her hands and her tears streaming through her fingers oh don't distress yourself in that manner or you have only heard half of your troubles 
in heaven's name exclaimed the young girl in great anxiety what is the matter well then this is how the matter stands madame who can no longer rely upon any further assistance in france for she has one after the other made use of the two queens of monsieur and the whole court too now bethinks herself of a certain person who has certain pretended rights over you la valliere became as white as a marble statue this person continued madame is not in paris at this moment but if i am not mistaken is just now in england yes yes breathed la valliere almost overwhelmed with terror and is to be found i think at the court of charles the second am i right yes well this evening a letter has been dispatched by madame to st james with directions for the courier to go straight to hampton court which i believe is one of the royal residences situated about a dozen miles from london yes well well as madame writes regularly to london once a fortnight and as the ordinary courier left for london not more than three days ago i have been thinking that some serious circumstances alone could have induced her to write again so soon for you know she is a very indolent correspondent yes this letter has been written therefore something tells me so at least on your account on my account repeated the unhappy girl mechanically and i who saw the letter lying on madame's desk before she sealed it fancied i could read what did you fancy you could read i might possibly have been mistaken though tell me what was it the name of bragelonne la valliere rose hurriedly from her chair a prey to the most painful agitation montalais she said her voice broken by sobs all my smiling dreams of youth and innocence have fled already i have nothing now to conceal either from you or any one else my life is exposed to every one's inspection and can be opened like a book in which all the world can read from the king himself to the first passer-by ara dearest ara what can i do what will become of me montalais approached close to her and said consult your own heart of course well i do not love monsieur de bragelonne when i say i do not love him understand that i love him as the most affectionate sister could love the best of brothers but that is not what he requires nor what i promised him in fact you love the king said montalais and that is a sufficiently good excuse yes i do love the king hoarsely murmured the young girl and i have paid dearly enough for pronouncing those words and now montalais tell me what can you do either for me or against me in my position you must speak more clearly still what am i to say then and so you have nothing very particular to tell me no said louisa in astonishment very good and so all you have to ask me is my advice respecting monsieur raoul nothing else it is a very delicate subject replied montalais no it is nothing of the kind ought i to marry him in order to keep the promise i made or ought i continue to listen to the king you have really placed me in a very difficult position said montalais smiling you ask me if you ought to marry raoul whose friend i am and whom i shall mortally offend in giving my opinion against him and then you ask me if you should cease to listen to the king whose subject i am and whom i should offend if i were to advise you in a particular way ah louisa you seem to hold a difficult position at a very cheap rate you have not understood me ara said la valliere wounded by the slightly mocking tone of her companion if i were to marry monsieur de bragelonne i should be far from bestowing on him the happiness he deserves but for the same reason if i listened to the king he would become the possessor of one indifferent in very many aspects i admit but one whom his affection confers an appearance of value what i ask you then is to tell me some means of disengaging myself honorably either from the one or from the other 
or rather i ask you from which side you think i can free myself most honorably my dear louisa replied montalais after a pause i am not one of the seven wise men of greece and i have no perfectly invariable rules of conduct to govern me but on the other hand i have a little experience and i can assure you that no woman ever asks for advice of the nature which you have just asked me without being in a terrible state of embarrassment besides you have made a solemn promise which every principle of honor requires you to fulfil if therefore you are embarrassed in consequence of having undertaken such an engagement it is not a stranger's advice every one is a stranger to a heart full of love it is not my advice i repeat that can extricate you from your embarrassment i shall not give it to you therefore and for a greater reason still because were i in your place i should feel much more embarrassed after the advice than before it all i can do is to repeat what i have already told you shall i assist you yes yes very well that is all tell me in what way you wish me to help you tell me for and against whom in this way we shall not make any blunders but first of all said la valliere pressing her companion's hand for whom or against whom do you decide are you not madame's confidant a greater reason for being of service to you if i were not to know what is going on in that direction i should not be of any service at all and consequently you would not obtain any advantage from my acquaintance friendships live and thrive upon a system of reciprocal benefits the result is then that you will remain at the same time madame's friend also evidently do you complain of that i hardly know sighed la valliere thoughtfully for this cynical frankness appeared to her an offence both to the woman and the friend all well and good then said montalais for if you did you would be very foolish you wish to serve me then devotedly if you will serve me in return one would almost say that you do not know my heart said la valliere looking at montalais with her eyes wide open why the fact is that since we have belonged to the court my dear louisa we are very much changed in what way it is very simple were you the second queen of france yonder at blois la valliere hung down her head and began to weep montalais looked at her in an indefinable manner and murmured poor girl and then adding poor king she kissed louisa on the forehead and Chapter Thirty Six of Louisa de la Valliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliere by Alexander Dumas. Chapter Thirty Six. The Portrait in that malady which is termed love the paroxysms succeed each other at intervals ever accelerating from the moment the disease declares itself by and by the paroxysms are less frequent in proportion as the cure approaches this being laid down as a general axiom and as the leading article of a particular chapter we will now proceed with our recital the next day the day fixed by the king for the first conversation in saint agnes room la valliere on opening one of the folds of the screen found upon the floor a letter in the king's handwriting the letter had been passed through a slit in the floor from the lower apartment to her own no indiscreet hand or curious gaze could have brought or did bring this single paper this too was one of Mollicorn's ideas having seen how very serviceable saint agnaux would become to the king on account of his apartment 
he did not wish that the courtier should become still more indispensable as a messenger and so he had on his own private account reserved this last post for himself la valliere most eagerly read the letter which fixed two o'clock that same afternoon for the rendezvous and which indicated the way of raising the trap-door which was constructed out of the flooring make yourself look as beautiful as you can added the postscript of the letter words which astonished the young girl but at the same time reassured her the hours passed away very slowly but the time fixed however arrived at last as punctual as the priestess hero louisa lifted up the trap-door at the last stroke of the hour of two and found the king on the steps waiting for her with the greatest respect in order to give her his hand to descend the delicacy and deference shown in this attention affected her very powerfully at the foot of the staircase the two lovers found the comte who with a smile and a low reverence distinguished by the best taste expressed his thanks to la valliere for the honor she conferred upon him then turning towards the king he said sire our man is here la valliere looked at the king with some uneasiness mademoiselle said the king if i have begged you to do me the honor of coming down here it was from an interested motive i have procured a most admirable portrait painter who is celebrated for the fidelity of his likenesses and i wish you to be kind enough to authorize him to paint yours besides if you positively wish it the portrait shall remain in your own possession la valliere blushed you see said the king to her we shall not be three as you wished but four instead and so long as we are not alone there can be as many present as you please la valliere gently pressed her royal lover's hand shall we pass into the next room sire said saint agno opening the door to let his guest precede him the king walked behind la valliere and fixed his eyes lingeringly and passionately upon that neck as white as snow upon which her long fair ringlets fell in heavy masses la valliere was dressed in a thick silk robe of pearl-gray color with a tinge of rose with jet ornaments which displayed to greater effect the dazzling purity of her skin holding in her slender and transparent hands a bouquet of heartsease bengal roses and clematis surrounded with leaves of the tenderest green above which uprose like a tiny goblet spilling magic influence a harlem tulip of gray and violet tints of a pure and beautiful species which had cost the gardener five years toil of combinations and the king five thousand francs louis had placed this bouquet in la valliere's hand as he saluted her in the room the door of which saint agno had just opened a young man was standing dressed in a purple velvet jacket with beautiful black eyes and long brown hair it was the painter his canvas was quite ready and his palette prepared for use he bowed to la valliere with the great curiosity of an artist who is studying his model saluted the king discreetly as if he did not recognize him and as he would consequently have saluted any other gentleman then leading mademoiselle de la valliere to the seat he had arranged for her he begged her to sit down the young girl assumed an attitude graceful and unrestrained her hands occupied and her limbs reclining on cushions and in order that her gaze might not assume a vague or affected expression the painter begged her to choose some kind of occupation so as to engage her attention whereupon louis the fourteenth smiling sat down on the cushions at la valliere's feet so that she in the reclining posture she had assumed leaning back in the armchair holding her flowers in her hand and he with his eyes raised towards her and fixed devouringly on her face 
they both together formed so charming a group that the artist contemplated painting it with professional delight while on his side saint agno regarded them with feelings of envy the painter sketched rapidly and very soon beneath the earliest touches of the brush there started into life out of the gray background the gentle poetry breathing face with its soft calm eyes and delicately tinted cheeks and framed in the masses of hair which fell about her neck the lovers however spoke but little and looked at each other a great deal sometimes their eyes became so languishing in their gaze that the painter was obliged to interrupt his work in order to avoid representing an aracena instead of la valliera it was on such occasions that saint agno came to the rescue and recited verses or repeated one of those little tales such as patru related and talaman de rue wrote so cleverly or it might be that la valliera was fatigued and the sitting was therefore suspended for a while and immediately a tray of precious porcelain laden with the most beautiful fruits which could be obtained and rich wines distilling their bright colors in silver goblets beautifully chased served as accessories to the picture of which the painter could but retrace the most ephemeral resemblance louis was intoxicated with love la valliera with happiness saint agno with ambition and the painter was storing up recollections for his old age two hours passed away in this manner and four o'clock having struck la valliere rose and made a sign to the king louis also rose approached the picture and addressed a few flattering remarks to the painter saint agnol also praised the picture which as he pretended was already beginning to assume an accurate resemblance la valliere in her turn blushingly thanked the painter and passed into the next room where the king followed her after having previously summoned saint agno will you not come to-morrow he said to la valliere oh sire pray think that some one will be sure to come to my room and will not find me there well what will become of me in that case you are very apprehensive louisa but at all events suppose madame were to send for me oh replied the king will the day never come when you yourself will tell me to brave everything so that i may not have to leave you again on that day sire i shall be quite out of my mind and you must not believe me to-morrow louisa la valliere sighed but without the courage to oppose her royal lover's wish she repeated to-morrow then since you desire it sire and with these words she ran lightly up the stairs and disappeared from her lover's gaze well sire inquired saint agno when she had left well saint agno yesterday i thought myself the happiest of men and does your majesty then regard yourself to-day said the comte smiling as the unhappiest of men no but my love for her is an unquenchable thirst in vain do i drink in vain do i swallow the drops of water which your industry procures for me the more i drink the more unquenchable it becomes sire that is in some degree your own fault and your majesty alone has made the position such as it is you are right in that case therefore the means to be happy is to fancy yourself satisfied and to wait wait you know that word then there there sire do not despair i have already been at work on your behalf i have still other resources in store the king shook his head in a despairing manner what sire have you not been satisfied hitherto oh yes indeed yes my dear saint agno but invent for heaven's sake invent some further project yet sire i undertake to do my best and that is all that any one can do the king wished to see the portrait again as he was unable to see the original he pointed out several alterations to the painter and left the room 
and then saint Agnew dismissed the artist the easel paints and painter himself had scarcely gone when mollycorne showed his head in the doorway he was received by saint Agnew with open arms but still with a little sadness for the cloud which had passed across the royal sun veiled in its turn the faithful satellite and mollycorne at a glance perceived the melancholy that brooded on saint Agnew's face oh monsieur le comte he said how sad you seem and good reason too my dear monsieur mollycorne will you believe that the king is still dissatisfied with his staircase do you mean oh no on the contrary he is delighted with the staircase the decorations of the apartments i suppose don't please him oh he has not even thought of that no indeed it seems that what has dissatisfied the king i will tell you monsieur le comte he is dissatisfied at finding himself the fourth person at a rendezvous of this kind how is it possible you could not have guessed that why how is it likely i could have done so dear monsieur malicorne when i followed the king's instructions to the very letter did his majesty really insist on your being present positively and also required that the painter whom i met downstairs just now should be here too he insisted upon it in that case i can easily understand why his majesty is dissatisfied what dissatisfied that i have so punctually and so literally obeyed his orders i don't understand you malicorne began to scratch his ear as he asked what time did the king fix for the rendezvous in your apartments two o'clock and you were waiting for the king ever since half-past one it would have been a fine thing indeed to have been unpunctual with his majesty malicorne notwithstanding his respect for saint Agno, could not help smiling and the painter he said did the king wish him to be here at two o'clock also no but i had him waiting here from midday far better you know for a painter to be kept waiting a couple of hours than the king a single minute malicorne began to laugh aloud come dear monsieur malicorne said saint Agno, laugh less at me and speak a little more freely i beg well then monsieur le comte if you wish the king to be a little more satisfied the next time he comes ventre saint gris as his grandfather used to say of course i wish it well all you have to do is when the king comes to-morrow to be obliged to go away on a most pressing matter of business which cannot possibly be postponed and stay away for twenty minutes what leave the king alone for twenty minutes cried saint Agno in alarm very well do as you like don't pay any attention to what i say said malicorne moving towards the door nay nay dear monsieur malicorne on the contrary go on i begin to understand you but the painter oh the painter must be half an hour late half an hour do you really think so yes i do decidedly very well then i will do as you tell me and my opinion is that you will be doing perfectly right will you allow me to call upon you for the latest news to-morrow of course i have the honour to be your most respectful servant monsieur de saint Agno, said malicorne bowing profoundly and retiring from the room backwards there is no doubt that fellow has more invention than i have said saint Agno, as if Chapter thirty seven of Louisa de la Valliera. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines. Louisa de la Valliera by Alexander Dumas. Chapter thirty seven. Hampton Court. 
the revelation we have witnessed that montalais made to la valliere in a preceding chapter very naturally makes us return to the principal hero of this tale a poor wandering knight roving about at the king's caprice if our readers will be good enough to follow us we will in his company cross that strait more stormy than the Euripus, which separates calais from dover we will speed across that green and fertile country with its numerous little streams through maidstone and many other villages and towns each prettier than the other and finally arrive at london from thence like bloodhounds following a track after having ascertained that raoul had made his first stay at whitehall his second at st james and having learned that he had been warmly received by monk and introduced to the best society of charles the second's court we will follow him to one of charles the second's summer residences near the lively little village of kingston at hampton court situated on the thames the river is not at that spot the boastful highway which bears upon its broad bosom its thousands of travellers nor are its waters black and troubled as those of cophetes as it boastfully asserts i too am cousin of the old ocean no at hampton court it is a soft and murmuring stream with moss-fringed banks reflecting in its broad mirror the willows and beeches which ornament its sides and on which may occasionally be seen a light bark indolently reclining among the tall reeds in a little creek formed of alders and forget-me-nots the surrounding country on all sides smiled in happiness and wealth the brick cottages from whose chimneys the blue smoke was slowly ascending in wreaths peeped forth from the belts of green holly which environed them children dressed in red frocks appeared and disappeared amidst the high grass like poppies bowed by the gentler breath of the passing breeze the sheep ruminating with half-closed eyes lay lazily about under the shadow of the stunted aspens while far and near the kingfishers plumed with emerald and gold skimmed swiftly along the surface of the water like a magic ball heedlessly touching as he passed the line of his brother angler who sat watching in his boat the fish as they rose to the surface of the sparkling stream high above this paradise of dark shadows and soft light rose the palace of hampton court built by wolseley a residence the haughty cardinal had been obliged timid courtier that he was to offer to his master henry the eighth who had glowered with envy and cupidity at the magnificent new home hampton court with its brick walls its large windows its handsome iron gates as well as its curious bell turret its retired covered walk and interior fountains like those of the alhambra was a perfect bower of roses jasmine and clematis every sense sight and smell particularly was gratified and the reception rooms formed a very charming framework for the pictures of love which charles the second unrolled among the voluptuous paintings of tidian of pordenone and of van dyck the same charles whose father's portrait the martyr king was hanging in his gallery and who could show upon the wainscots of the various apartments the holes made by the balls of the puritanical followers of cromwell when on the twenty fourth of august sixteen forty eight at the time they had brought charles the first prisoner to hampton court there it was that the king intoxicated with pleasure and adventure held his court he who a poet in feeling thought himself justified in redeeming by a whole day of voluptuousness every minute which had been formerly passed in anguish and misery it was not the soft green sward of hampton court so soft that it almost resembled the richest velvet in the thickness of its texture nor was it the beds of flowers with their variegated hues which encircled the foot of every tree with rose trees many feet in height embracing most lovingly their trunks 
nor even the enormous lime trees whose branches swept the earth like willows offering a ready concealment for love or reflection beneath the shade of their foliage it was none of these things for which charles the second loved his palace of hampton court perhaps it might have been that beautiful sheet of water which the cool breeze rippled like the wavy undulations of cleopatra's hair waters bedecked with cresses and white water lilies whose chaste bulbs coyly unfolding themselves beneath the sun's warm rays reveal the golden gems which lie concealed within their milky petals murmuring waters on the bosom of which black swans majestically floated and the graceful waterfowl with their tender broods covered with silken down darted restlessly in every direction in pursuit of the insects among the reeds or the frogs in their mossy retreats perhaps it might have been the enormous hollies with their dark and tender green foliage or the bridges uniting the banks of the canals in their embrace or the fawns browsing in the endless avenues of the park or the innumerable birds that hopped about the gardens or flew from branch to branch amidst the emerald foliage it might well have been any of these charms for hampton court had them all and possessed too almost forests of white roses which climbed and trailed along the lofty trellises showering down upon the ground their snowy leaves rich with soft perfumery but no what charles the second most loved in hampton court were the charming figures who when midday was past flitted to and fro along the broad terraces of the gardens like louis the fourteenth he had their wealth of beauties painted for his gallery by one of the great artists of the period an artist who well knew the secret of transferring to canvas the rays of light which escaped from beaming eyes heavy laden with love and love's delights the day of our arrival at hampton court is almost as clear and bright as a summer's day in france the atmosphere is heavy with the delicious perfume of geraniums sweet peas syringas and heliotrope scattered in profusion around it is past midday and the king having dined after his return from hunting paid a visit to lady castlemaine the lady who was reputed at the time to hold his heart in bondage and this proof of his devotion discharged he was readily permitted to pursue his infidelities until evening arrived love and amusement ruled the entire court it was the period when ladies would seriously interrogate their ruder companions as to their opinions upon a foot more or less captivating according to whether it wore a pink or a lilac silk stocking for it was the period when charles the second had declared that there was no hope of safety for a woman who wore green silk stockings because miss lucy stuart wore them of that color while the king is endeavoring in all directions to inculcate others with his preferences on this point we will ourselves bend our steps towards an avenue of beech trees opposite the terrace and listen to the conversation of a young girl in a dark-colored dress who is walking with another of about her own age dressed in blue they crossed a beautiful lawn from the centre of which sprang a fountain with the figure of a siren executed in bronze and strolled on talking as they went towards the terrace along which looking out upon the park and interspersed at frequent intervals were erected summer-houses diverse in form and ornament these summer-houses were nearly all occupied the two young women passed on the one blushing deeply while the other seemed dreamily silent at last having reached the end of the terrace which looks on the river and finding there a cool retreat they sat down close to each other where are we going said the younger to her companion my dear we are going where you yourself led the way i yes you to the extremity of the palace towards that seat yonder where the young frenchman is seated wasting his time in sighs and lamentations miss mary grafton hurriedly said no no i am not going there why not let us go back lucy 
Nay, on the contrary, let us go on, and have an explanation. What about? About how it happens that the Vicomte de Bragelonne always accompanies you in all your walks, as you invariably accompany him in his. And you conclude either that he loves me or that I love him? Why not? He is a most agreeable and charming companion. No one hears me, I hope, said Lucy Stewart, as she turned around with a smile, which indicated, moreover, that her uneasiness on the subject was not extreme. No, no, said Mary, the king is engaged in his summer-house with the Duke of Buckingham. Oh, apropos of the Duke, Mary, it seems he has shown you great attention since his return from France how is your own heart in that direction mary grafton shrugged her shoulders with seeming indifference well well i will ask bragelonne about it said stuart laughing let us go and find him at once what for i wish to speak to him not yet one word before you do come come you who know so many of the king's secrets tell me why monsieur de bragelonne is in england because he was sent as an envoy from one sovereign to another that may be but seriously although politics do not much concern us we know enough to be satisfied that m de bragelonne has no mission of serious import here well then listen said stuart with assumed gravity for your sake i am going to betray a state secret shall i tell you the nature of the letter which king louis the fourteenth gave monsieur de bragelonne for king charles the second i will these are the very words my brother the bearer of this is a gentleman attached to my court and the son of one whom you regard most warmly treat him kindly i beg and try and make him like england did it say that word for word or something very like it i will not answer for the form but the substance i am sure of well and what conclusion do you or rather what conclusion does the king draw from that that the king of france has his own reasons for removing m de bragelonne and for getting him married anywhere else than in france so that then in consequence of this letter king charles received m de bragelonne as you are aware in the most distinguished and friendly manner the handsomest apartments in whitehall were allotted to him and as you are the most valuable and precious person in his court inasmuch as you have rejected his heart nay do not blush he wished you to take a fancy to this frenchman and he was desirous to confer upon him so costly a prize and this is the reason why you the heiress of three hundred thousand pounds a future duchess so beautiful so good have been thrown in bragelonne's way in all the promenades and parties of pleasure to which he was invited in fact it was a plot a kind of conspiracy mary grafton smiled with that charming expression which was habitual to her and pressing her companion's arm said thank the king lucy yes yes but the duke of buckingham is jealous so take care hardly had she pronounced these words when the duke appeared from one of the pavilions on the terrace and approaching the two girls with a smile said you are mistaken miss lucy i am not jealous and the proof miss mary is yonder in the person of m de bragelonne himself who ought to be the cause of my jealousy but who is dreaming in pensive solitude poor fellow allow me to leave you for a few minutes while i avail myself of those few minutes to converse with miss lucy stuart to whom i have something to say and then bowing to lucy he added will you do me the honour to accept my hand in order that i may lead you to the king who is waiting for us with these words buckingham still smiling took miss stuart's hand and led her away when by herself mary grafton her head gently inclined towards her shoulder with that indolent gracefulness of action which distinguishes young english girls remained for a moment with her eyes fixed on raoul but as if uncertain what to do 
At last, after first blushing violently, and then turning deadly pale, thus revealing the internal combat which assailed her heart, she seemed to make up her mind to adopt a decided course, and with a tolerably firm step, advanced towards the seat on which Raoul was reclining, buried in the profoundest meditation, as we have already said. The sound of Miss Mary's steps, though they could hardly be heard upon the green sward, awakened Raoul from his musing attitude. He turned round, perceived the young girl, and walked forward to meet the companion whom his happy destiny had thrown in his way. "'I have been sent to you, monsieur,' said Mary Grafton. "'Will you take care of me?' "'To whom is my gratitude due for so great a happiness?' inquired Raoul to the duke of buckingham replied mary affecting a gaiety she did not really feel to the duke of buckingham do you say he who so passionately seeks your charming society am i really to believe you are serious mademoiselle the fact is monsieur you perceive that everything seems to conspire to make us pass the best or rather the longest part of our days together Yesterday it was the king who desired me to beg you to seat yourself next to me at dinner. Today it is the Duke of Buckingham who begs me to come and place myself near you on this seat. And he has gone away in order to leave us together? asked Raoul with some embarrassment. Look yonder at the turning of that path. He is just out of sight with Miss Stewart. Are these polite attentions usual in France, Monsieur le Vicomte? i cannot very precisely say what people do in france mademoiselle for i can hardly be called a frenchman i have resided in many countries and almost always as a soldier and then i have spent a long period of my life in the country i am almost a savage you do not like your residence in england i fear i scarcely know said raoul inattentively and sighing deeply at the same time what you do not know forgive me said raoul shaking his head and collecting his thoughts i did not hear you oh said the young girl sighing in her turn how wrong the duke was to send me here wrong said raoul perhaps so for i am but a rude uncouth companion and my society annoys you the duke did indeed very wrong to send you it is precisely replied mary grafton in a clear calm voice because your society does not annoy me that the duke was wrong to send me to you it was now raoul's turn to blush but he resumed how happens it that the duke of buckingham should send you to me and why did you come the duke loves you and you love him no replied mary seriously the duke does not love me because he is in love with the duchess d'orleans and as for myself i have no affection for the duke raoul looked at the young lady with astonishment are you a friend of the duke of buckingham she inquired the duke has honored me by calling me so ever since we met in france you are simple acquaintances then no for the duke is the most intimate friend of one whom i regard as a brother the duke de guiche yes he who is in love with madame la duchesse d'orleans oh and what is that you are saying and who loves him in return continued the young girl quietly raoul bent down his head and mary grafton sighing deeply continued they are very happy but leave me monsieur de bragelonne for the duke of buckingham has given you a very troublesome commission in offering me as a companion for your promenade your heart is elsewhere and it is with the greatest difficulty you can be charitable enough to lend me your attention confess truly it would be unfair on your part vicomte not to admit it madame i do confess it she looked at him steadily he was so noble and so handsome in his bearing his eyes revealed so much gentleness candor and resolution that the idea could not possibly enter her mind that he was either rudely discourteous or a mere simpleton she only perceived clearly enough that he loved another woman and not herself with the whole strength of his heart ah i now understand you she said 
you have left your heart behind you in france raoul bowed the duke is aware of your affection no one knows it replied raoul why therefore do you tell me nay answer me i cannot it is for me then to anticipate an explanation you do not wish to tell me anything because you are now convinced that i do not love the duke because you see that i possibly might have loved you because you are a gentleman of noble and delicate sentiments and because instead of accepting even were it for the mere amusement of the passing hour a hand which is almost pressed upon you and because instead of meeting my smiles with a smiling lip you who are young have preferred to tell me whom men have called beautiful my heart is over the sea it is in france for this i thank you monsieur de bragelonne you are indeed a noble-hearted noble-minded man and i regard you all the more for it as a friend only and now let us see speaking of myself and talk of your own affairs forget that i have ever spoken to you of myself tell me why you are sad and why you have become more than usually so during these past four days raoul was deeply and sensibly moved by these sweet and melancholy tones and as he could not at the moment find a word to say the young girl again came to his assistance pity me she said my mother was born in france and i can truly affirm that i too am french in blood as well as in feeling but the leaden atmosphere and characteristic gloom of england seem to weigh upon me sometimes my dreams are golden-hued and full of wonderful enjoyments when suddenly a mist rises and overspreads my fancy blotting them out forever such indeed is the case at the present moment forgive me i have now said enough on that subject give me your hand and relate your griefs to me as a friend you say you are french in heart and soul yes not only i repeat it that my mother was french but further as my father a friend of king charles i was exiled in france i during the trial of that prince as well as during the protector's life was brought up in paris at the restoration of king charles the second my poor father returned to england where he died almost immediately afterwards and then the king created me a duchess and has dowered me according to my rank have you any relations in france raoul inquired with the deepest interest i have a sister there my senior by seven or eight years who was married in france and was early left a widow her name is madame de billiere do you know her she added observing raoul start suddenly i have heard her name she too loves with her whole heart and her last letters inform me she is happy and her affection is i conclude returned i told you monsieur de bragelonne that although i possess half of her nature i do not share her happiness but let us speak now of yourself whom do you love in france a young girl as soft and pure as a lily but if she loves you why are you sad i have been told that she ceases to love me you do not believe it i trust he who wrote me so does he who wrote me so does not sign his letter an anonymous denunciation some treachery be assured said miss grafton stay said raoul showing the young girl a letter which he had read over a thousand times she took it from his hand and read as follows vicomte you are perfectly right to amuse yourself yonder with the lovely faces of charles the second's court for at louis the fourteenth's court the castle in which your affections are enshrined is being besieged stay in london altogether poor vicomte or return without delay to paris there is no signature said miss mary none believe it not then very good but here is a second letter from my friend de guiche which says i am lying here wounded and ill returned raoul oh return what do you intend doing inquired the young girl with a feeling of oppression at her heart 
My intention, as soon as I received this letter, was immediately to take my leave of the king. When did you receive it? The day before yesterday. It is dated Fontainebleau. A singular circumstance, do you not think, for the court is now at Paris. At all events, I would have set off, but when I mentioned my intention to the king, he began to laugh and said to me, how comes it, Monsieur la Ambassador, that you think of leaving? Has your sovereign recalled you? I colored naturally enough, for I was confused by the question. For the fact is, the king himself sent me here, and I have received no order to return. Mary frowned in deep thought and said, Do you remain then? I must, mademoiselle. Do you ever receive any letters from her to whom you are so devoted? never never do you say does she not love you then at least she has not written to me since my departure although she used occasionally to write to me before i trust she may have been prevented hush the duke is coming and buckingham at that moment was seen at the end of the walk approaching towards them alone and smiling he advanced slowly and held out his hands to them both have you arrived at an understanding he said about what about whatever might render you happy dear mary and make raoul less miserable i do not understand you my lord said raoul that is my view of the subject miss mary do you wish me to mention it before m de bragelonne he added with a smile if you mean replied the young girl haughtily that i was not indisposed to love m de bragelonne that is useless for i have told him so myself buckingham reflected for a moment and without seeming in any way discountenanced as she expected he said my reason for leaving you with m de bragelonne was that i thoroughly knew your refined delicacy of feeling no less than the perfect loyalty of your mind and heart and I hope that M. de Bragelonne's cure might be effected by the hands of a physician such as you are. But, my lord, before you spoke of M. de Bragelonne's heart, you spoke to me of your own. Do you mean to effect the cure of two hearts at the same time? Perfectly true, madame, but you will do me the justice to admit that I have long discontinued a useless pursuit, acknowledging that my own wound is incurable my lord said mary collecting herself for a moment before she spoke m de bragelonne is happy for he loves and is beloved he has no need of such a physician as i can be m de bragelonne said buckingham is on the very eve of experiencing a serious misfortune and he has greater need than ever of sympathy and affection explain yourself my lord inquired raoul anxiously no gradually i will explain myself but if you desire it i can tell miss grafton what you may not listen to yourself my lord you are putting me to the torture you know something you wish to conceal from me i know that miss mary grafton is the most charming object that a heart ill at ease could possibly meet with in its way through life i have already told you that the vicomte de bragelonne loves elsewhere said the young girl he is wrong then do you assume to know my lord that i am wrong yes whom is it that he loves then exclaimed the young girl he loves a lady who is unworthy of him said buckingham with that calm collected manner peculiar to englishmen miss grafton uttered a cry which together with the remark that buckingham had that moment made spread over de bragelonne's features a deadly paleness arising from the sudden surprise and also from a vague fear of impending misfortune my lord he exclaimed you have just pronounced words which compel me without a moment's delay to seek their explanation in paris you will remain here said buckingham because you have no right to leave and no one has the right to quit the service of the king for that of any woman even were she as worthy of being loved as mary grafton is you will tell me all then i will on condition that you will remain i will remain if you will promise to speak openly and without reserve 
thus far had their conversation proceeded and buckingham in all probability was on the point of revealing not indeed all that had taken place but at least all he was aware of when one of the king's attendants appeared at the end of the terrace and advanced towards the summer-house where the king was sitting with lucy stuart a courier followed him covered with dust from head to foot and who seemed as if he had but a few moments before dismounted from his horse the courier from france madame's courier exclaimed raoul recognizing the princess's livery and while the attendant and the courier advanced towards the king buckingham and miss grafton exchanged 